Maria, did you walk here? Phew, lost to that boy, huh? Yes. Let's go back. Uh, but? Coming this far is the best I could do. Take me back, or do you want the boy to carry me? Of course not. I won't give that right to anybody over my dead body. <laughs> Super sass sex patch here, and this is why you should watch MMA. It's just... So good! This spectacle exists in a constant state of androgenesis. These demigod avatars share in our mortality as they walk the line like a roadside sobriety test. It is pure. It is physiological. It is a, a, a canvas of light illuminating a clash of empires in the hearts of men. And still... Ladies and gentlemen, have I got a show for you. We got ground and pound, we got hit kicks, we got spinning shit. We're throwing spinning shit now? Let me tell you something. MMA is the only sport I ever really took an interest in observing. Sure, it's a spectacle, but it's also just primal and pure. You can't hide who you truly are out there. These guys are exposed. See, these are some of the most naked men on television. You know, my horny female biology teacher liked to make fun of MMA. She always asked why boys like to watch two half-naked men rolling around on the ground. To be fair, she does have a point. It's an issue caused by fighters having to wear gloves. But I'll take my time to really get into that later. Still though, if she could just stop projecting those thoughts coming from her quivering ovaries for a minute, she would see that this struggle of talent, technique, and sheer will itself is what can be the real thing of beauty. Or 25 minutes of one guy laying on top of the other, but hey, the lady seemed to like GSP. In hindsight, I forgot to ask her why she's so interested in what young boys like, or to tell her that what I like is keeping secrets. But anyways, in a world that always seemed to be sending mixed messages, fighting at least made sense. I also basically worshipped the life of a warrior as a concept itself. I mean, I was actually a bit of an emo kid. But I still recognize that's just better, you know? It takes a special kind of spirit to walk the walk like that and not just talk the talk, which is certainly something I haven't always been able to live up to. I'll tell you a story. Back in middle school, I was a talker of sorts, and one night I was hanging out in my buddy's basement and the topic got on fighting. In particular, me fighting some of the toughest guys in my school. I'm like, yeah, I kick his ass. I kick his ass too. It didn't occur to me at the time though that I was the only one in the room who knew I was completely full of shit. So one of the guys in that room, sort of an acquaintance, actually went and told those two tough guys what I said. And both these guys I was talking about hit, hit puberty early. They were a lot bigger than me. So a few days later, one of these tough guys corners me in a classroom after everybody else had left. He's like, you want to battle me? To give you a little background on this guy, he was the most promising young athlete in my province. But cocaine destroyed him. He ended up going to prison for a few years and married a fat girl when he got out. So anyways, I'm like, what, me? I don't want to fight you. Why would I want to fight you? You're only banging all the hottest girls in school. You know I want the throne. But today, I'm a pussyfist because I don't have the ability to take it. Really though, I just denied everything over and over and he let me go before I pissed myself. He did drill me into a fence to the point where it started to break a year later though, during a backyard hockey helmets and gloves boxing match. Like, it was bad enough that some guy's dad asked me if I would be alright to walk the three blocks home. But back to the main story. So a few days after that, I'm leaving through the front doors of the school, kind of in a daze, and this guy I don't recognize is like, hey, you want to fight? I'm like, huh? And I follow him up front thinking, this probably isn't even a real thing. It's like some kind of joke. Knocks the wind right out of me. So I look at him like, why? And he walks off like, I hate it when people want to fight me. Turns out, this was the other tough guy whose ass I said it would beat. I didn't even know what the guy looked like. So I bit off more than I could chew and learned a valuable lesson. And I didn't even have to spit on any teeth afterwards. So, how did MMA come to be? <laughs> You know, opposable thumbs are good for more than just sticking up the asses of ferocious beasts so that they might stop biting us. They would allow us to hold tools and weapons, and because of that, hand-to-hand -hand combat was not usually the first option in a battlefield scenario. But shit happens. That's when you gotta prove what you're really made of. And don't forget about those thumbs, they got our species this far. But to get it in the more sports side of things, there was the Pancration Games of Ancient Greece. Basically, at the Ancient Olympic Games, sure they had boxing and wrestling, but they also had the bright idea to combine the two and throw in kicks. It was ancient Greek MMA, which as a side note also makes MMA a traditional Olympic sport. Pancration was first introduced in the 33rd Olympiad, but got watered down in the later days of ancient Greece. What used to be a core component of the training program for ancient Greek armies, including the Spartans, was reduced to essentially mud wrestling belts between little boys, hosted by wealthy Greeks out of their own pockets. Coincidentally, this was also around the time that this civilization was coming to an end. Now to jump ahead a little further, we have the Greasy family of Brazil. Actually, they originally came from Scotland. When those Scots raise a family banner, be it martial arts or otherwise, they bet their family jewels on its integrity. So just the right sort to start a whole new brand and stay competitive with it. George Gracie emigrated to Brazil in 1826 and the family became quite successful. His grandson Gastel Gracie was a business partner in an American circus based in Brazil. That's where he met Mitsuo Meda, a Japanese who had been trained directly by Jigeru Kano, the founder of Judo, also at the time known as Kano Jiu Jitsu. Meda had been traveling America in order to promote his art, getting into wrestling matches, full contact fights, pro wrestling, whatever. In fact, you could say that his world was a lot like that of early MMA and he had acquired skills 
that he had encountered during his journeys. So by the time he was driven south to Brazil, because Americans caught a case of yellow peril, and must have felt especially threatened by a live-action anime character done right, his skill was no longer the same jiu-jitsu that he had left his little island with. It was made of jiu-jitsu. And with it, he made such an impression on Gastel Gracie that the man got him to teach his son, Carlos Gracie. And with that began the tradition of Gracie jiu-jitsu. In Brazil, no holds barred fights were known as Vale Tudo, Portuguese for anything goes. This is where the Gracies first made a name for themselves in the martial arts world. And to further promote their art, they began the Gracie Challenge, an open challenge for anyone to come on down and fight them. They even put up money. They refined their martial arts through such challenges, but that wasn't quite enough when another Japanese judoka, Masahiko Kimura, showed up on their shores. He had a match where he broke Helio Gracie's arm, twice because he refused to tap with a move we now call the Kimura. Now sure, Kimura might have just had superior technique, but there's also something to be said for the emphasis on throws in judo. I mean, if you slam someone down and you move quickly, you're not going to need much setup on the ground for your submission. Fast forward to 1993 and Rory and Gracie is in the US looking for new ways to promote the family's art. He co-founds a tournament called War of the Worlds along with Bob Marowitz, an executive at Semaphore Entertainment Group, Art Davey, an executive at Mandalay Sports Entertainment, and John Milius, who had been a screenwriter for movies like Apocalypse Now and Conan the Barbarian. In fact, the fighting area used in this tournament, the Octagon, is supposedly based on the one that we've seen in Conan. To be honest, I don't really see it though. To me, the cage reminds me more of a Michael Jackson video, or maybe a lobster pot, whereas the pit in Conan is more like a crab bucket. Like, nobody gets out, but at least the most toxic among them will never feel alone. You know, this is a little off track, but I think at this point in history, we need to bring back the Gladiator Games. This time, perma-virgins will fight for the chance to reproduce, although last time it was slaves, so is it really so different? And just to clarify, a perma-virgin is someone who never got laid while young and thereby is permanently mentally stunted. And because women can sniff these sorts of things out, there's a good chance that they'll die alone and childless. So I think the least society can offer them is a glorious death in the arena. So for the first couple UFCs, yeah, they changed the name. We really saw a lot of martial art versus martial art fights. There was a one glove boxer, an 80s kung fu guy in a leotard. He even had a sumo who got knocked down and had his teeth kicked out of his face. That served as a pivotal moment because it made things real for people if it wasn't already. You see, with a lot of things in life, and I have been guilty of this myself, you could read about it, you can have it explained to you, you could even dabble a little bit in it, but you don't truly get it until it kicks you in the face. Then you're like, hey, I'd eat my cocky words from earlier, but I really need to see my dentist. So Rorian put Royce Gracie in there to represent the family's jujitsu, and he did quite well representing his art, especially in those early days when most of his opponents were like fish out of water on the ground. Now supposedly, Rorian chose Royce because as a smaller guy, he would better show the effectiveness of the family's jujitsu. But what if he was just trying to hide the fact that if you're the bigger guy, you only need a general idea of what you're doing to pull it off? Like jujitsu student and OG ref Big John McCarthy, who, before working for the UFC, was a ref at the LA riots. Grab as many as you can, that's about all you can do. So this type of mixed fighting in the more modern era was not without precedent. For example, there was this belt between Muhammad Ali and Antonio Inoki. Inoki being a legend in the Japanese pro wrestling world and known for the Inoki slap. A blessing of manliness that puts the spirit in order. First used on this little brat who had started punching Inoki. Antonio Inoki was actually trained by Karl Gosch, who popularized the German suplex. And speaking of the Germanics and Japs, the technique called the fireman carry was probably actually first invented by guys who were setting fire to villages. So Inoki used flatlander jutsu to nullify the offense of Ali, which effectively led to a stalemate, with neither daring to get too deep into the other's world. That ref though, he's known as Judo Jean LaBelle, and back in 1963 he answered an open challenge to practitioners of Japanese martial arts, which claimed that they were inferior arts compared to boxing. His opponent was Milo Savage, who also had some wrestling experience. According to Jean, Milo had metal in his gloves, and had clearly undergone some level of judo training because he was able to defend against many of LaBelle's throws. Nevertheless, LaBelle eventually threw him down and choked him out, and Milo stayed out for quite a while, causing the crowd to really turn on Jean, thinking he had killed the man. One guy even tried to shank LaBelle over the matter. Quite a standard is set for the first officially recognized MMA match in America. You know, I really can't get over the whole cage thing. Other combat sports, such as Muay Thai, took after boxing with a ring, and grappling arts, such as wrestling or judo, simply have an area on the floor that you're not supposed to leave. Well, according to Milius, the fights were expected to get so wild that only a cage could contain them. But I mean, there was also a guy who was saying that the fights could only end by knockout, tap out, or death. So, now as MMA developed in Japan, with organizations like Pancrase, they never fell out of love with the ring. And to give a little background on Pancrase, in the Japanese pro wrestling world, also known as Puro Resu, there's a lot of focus put on strong style wrestling, meaning the heavy incorporation of real martial arts techniques and tactics in their shows, as opposed to the more theatrical pro wrestling style you often see in the West. Pancrase was sort of a rebellion against Puro Resu becoming more Americanized. Pancrase was basically built off the concept of a shoot, in other words, when a pro wrestling event goes off script, and in particular, when wrestlers start fighting for real. 
detail. In fact, there's another organization that goes way back into the 80s, which is simply known as Shudo. Pancrase, the name being of course a tip of the rice hat to the ancient Pancration games, had some funky rules. For example, you can't punch, you have to hit with an open hand, and you can kick with boots on, but no hand wraps. It's as if with these strange rules, they wanted to keep it vague as to whether Pancrase was putting on legit fights or just more works. And you know what? They kind of seceded, mostly because of Yakuza involvement in Puro Resu and Japanese MMA. For example, Hiromichi Momaze, the alleged son of a mob boss who was done five years in prison on weapons charges, was famously close with Antonio Inoki, and he put forward the first 50 million yen to create Dream Stage Entertainment, the parent company of Pride FC. Oh, try, oh, Dan, I told you, he picked him up! Pride was the golden age of MMA in Japan. It was all about putting on good fights. With a wink and a nudge, the fighters' contract stated that there would be no steroid tests. For Pride, weight divisions were more like recommendations, and everybody knew that the real high-profile money fights were at heavyweights and light heavyweights, so a lot of lighter guys would take their chances, such as when Vanderlei, the axe murderer Silva, took on Mark Hunt with a reported 72-pound weight difference. Like, think about that. How many babies is 72 pounds? If you took a fighter and let him swing around a sack full of 72 pounds worth of babies, that could prove to be a distinct advantage. So it was pretty obvious that Pride was run by Yakuza, and not just because Momaze sat ringside with his forever young at heart hat on. Now that can't be the worst way to have a midlife crisis. Naoto Morishita, who was president of Pride, died under mysterious circumstances. According to the official version of events, which absolutely nobody believes, he hung himself after his mistress said she wanted to leave him. I mean, you're not supposed to fall in love with the mistress. That's a bad midlife crisis. According to a few people who were involved in Pride, not long after his death, there was a brawl between two Yakuza groups at the venue in an apparent power struggle. In 2007, a year before Momaze would be found dead in his bathroom, all the assets of Pride were bought out by the Italian word for fight, Zufa, which by this point in history was the company behind the UFC, owned by Frank and Lorenzo Fertitta, the sons of a casino executive. They did end up eventually selling, but you know who stayed on since those days? The UFC's promotion guy, meet Dana White. Dana is a good boy who likes to watch fights and collect flip phones. I got flip phones for days. I, I bought up all the flip phones that were left on the internet. <laughs> According to him, it was it was all the Yakuza's fault that Pride couldn't continue after it was bought out. But who knows, maybe it was the other way around. The truth behind the truth is though, that between the Yakuza and white guys trying to date Asian chicks, there just wasn't much interest in providing entertainment that might raise Japanese fighting spirit. Dana is actually Irish, from Boston, where he ran a little boxing gym. He says that one day, a representative of the well-known gangster Whitey Bulger showed up to his gym to extort protection money from him. He's just lucky he didn't have to deal with Michael Jai White, Betty White, and Whitey on the moon. He was like, nah, I'm good, and rode his white horse all the way to Las Vegas to meet up with his old buddy Lorenzo. One thing led to another, as things do, and now he's this guy. So to give you a better picture of the landscape, let's talk about some other MMA organizations. After the buyout of Pride, some former executives of Pride, along with some executives from Fighting and Entertainment Group, which promotes the kickboxing show K1, created Dream. This was actually their second attempt at a revival, the first being Heroes. So they obtained a couple big name fighters, as did the US based promotion Strike Force. And for a little while there, those two appeared to be in the process of hooking up to put on some big shows. But then in swoop Zufa, they bioed Strike Force, raided the organization for its talent, and then let it shrivel up like a foreskin lampshade. That same year, 2011, Dream started cooperating with the One Fighting Championship. For reasons, Dream stopped putting on regular shows in 2012, but One, based in Singapore, is still going strong, being the biggest show in Asia. The chairman of one is Chatri Tresira Fisset, a half Thai, half Jap, former Muay Thai fighter. And former MMA fighters Misha Tate and Rich Franklin are vice presidents at one. While Matt Hume, the head trainer and founder of the AMC Pancration Camp, is vice president of operations. There's a lot of people behind the scenes at one who just get it, because of course they've been kicked in the face. Currently, one is number two after the UFC. Number three is Bellator, which has gained itself a reputation for cashing in on big name fighters past their prime. Hey, it's called 401k, not KO for one. Absorb what is useful, discard what is not, and add what is uniquely your own. Bruce Lee refused to be a good, quiet little boy who limits himself for no good reason, like Clint Eastwood, but more East than made of wood. And now he's known as the father of mixed martial arts. So in honor of Bruce, let's begin with his first martial art, Wing Chun. But wait, isn't Wing Chun a girl's martial art? Well, yeah. Wing Chun was the daughter of a Shaolin martial arts master and a total girl next door. So one day, this warlord came along and she caught his eye. He made a marriage proposal to her that she couldn't refuse. Or so he thought. She snaps back like, whatever scrub, you don't deserve me, and I'ma beat your ass just for fun. Be right back. And she runs off to train with Shaolin elder Nig Moy, who develops this new system from the crane and the snake styles. So after, I don't know, a year, she comes down from the mountains and beats that warlord's ass. You see, Wing Chun was designed to be taught quickly because, you know, it's preferable if by the time you've learned how to fight, you're not already some small time player's comfort woman. Now, some MMA fighters use hand trapping moves that look a lot like Wing Chun, but that's just their string beans and rice. Their meat and potatoes is still boxing and Muay Thai and such. And I would recommend against practicing sticky hands before a fight. It weakens the legs. Karate was developed in the 
Ryukyu Kingdom, which was seated in modern day Okinawa. Back then it was called Tei, and it was a little different from the karate you see today. And I'm not even talking about how western McDojos water down their source material like fountain drinks. Granted, the Domowashi Kaitengiri, or Rolling Thunder Kick, which was born over the rules of modern karate tournaments, and the 100 man Kumite are pretty cool. But between Tei and Karate, a lot went missing. For starters, the art used to include elbows, knees, takedowns, and submissions. In other words, it was Okinawan MMA. And there was a lot of striking techniques that resemble the ones you see today, but they were a lot more to the point. The Mei Giri is a technique where you strike with the ball of your foot, but there used to be another, more popular version known as Sumasaki Giri, where you attack with your big toe, targeting your opponent's vital points instead of just going for blunt force trauma or points on a scoreboard. A man named Ankichi Arakaki was famous for this kick, and according to one story, he once killed a man by striking him in the armpit with it. At first he just fell unconscious, but later was declared dead by pseudo aneurysm, so he literally Kenshiro a guy. And with uncut toenails, you've got Nanto style. You know, a lot of people have put forward the idea that karate was used to defend against douchebag samurai and such in an era when peasants weren't allowed to own weapons. But the truth is, it was mostly limited to the nobility class and their bodyguards. In other words, it was used for gangster shit. Since the training took a lot of teaching and time, as well as equipment, it was fairly limited to people with wealth to spare. The Ryukyu Kingdom received a lot of immigrants from China, and as such, a lot of the movements of Tei are taken from the Fujian White Crane style of fighting, which, according to tradition, was developed by a female named Fen Chinyong, and is described as being not focused on strength, but instead on evasion and attacking your opponent's vulnerable points. And not to be confused with the Black Crane, which was developed by Hua To, a physician at the Shaolin Temple. Hua To was also known for his enthusiastic use of cannabis in his physician work. So just remember, White Crane Feminist, Black Crane Cannabis. There's also a fighting style based on the goose. Invented by Western scientists, they called it PCP. The eight limb dart of Muay Thai turns your hands, feet, knees, and elbows into weapons. The hands become like a dagger or a sword, the elbows like a hammer or a mace, and the legs and knees like an axe or a spear. And there's a clinch work aspect too. The Thai clinch is all about controlling posture. Wherever the neck goes, the body is obligated to follow. A fighter caught in the Thai clinch is doomed to absorb some of the most brutal elbows and knees until he gets out. Sometimes though, he'll be released on purpose, cause it's a good setup for the head kick. Muay Thai also has its own take on the jab, a sharp little front kick called the teep. As to the reason why, well apparently, a lot of TIE fighters consider punches to be a cowardly move, it's just not gritty enough for them. Chris Dickerson, elbows too pointy for aesthetics, but on the right track for Muay Thai. Muay Thai was developed by the Siamese, now known as Thai military, in real combat, which they got a lot of as they expanded their territory south possibly from China. So it actually seems quite possible that Muay Thai has roots in Chinese martial arts that were then put through intense natural selection in the jungle, especially against the Thai people's historical rivals, the Burmese. Their martial art is called Lethway, and it's especially unique among modern combat sports for two reasons. Number one, a knockout isn't necessarily the end of a fight. Your corner's just gonna slap you around and play with your dick until you get back out there. And number two, there's headbutts the very potential of which changes the whole game. In much the same way that the potential of takedowns makes strikers in MMA less likely to overreach. The thing about headbutts is that sure, they really don't take any training or effort to throw, but to give, you must receive. Brain damage, that is. If we look at something like a head kick, it can cause tons of brain damage without receiving any, but it's easy to avoid. But headbutts are not so easy to avoid, so both fighters are going to be taking tons of damage in exchanges involving headbutts. And you might be thinking that's pretty typical in the animal kingdom when competing for mating rights, but cows don't go to college. The other thing is, it gives shorter fighters a distinct advantage. The taller fighter will have to telegraph their attempted bonk while the shorter fighter just has to grit his teeth and jump. You'll be alright, cause the crown of the skull is the thickest part. Term Gung Fu means that thing you work really hard at. The nice thing about having some Gung Fu in your life is that if you work really hard at something, as in actually trying to get good, not just grinding out the hours, over time you'll gain insights and other benefits that go well beyond the scope of that one discipline. Which is why, if you're gonna do something, don't half-ass it. If you thought that going two cheeks in would demand too much of your time and effort, well now you're just wasting your time. Anyways, I don't have to tell you that Gung Fu is synonymous with Chinese martial arts. Many distinctive styles have popped up in China over the country's long history. China is where most martial arts originated, and logically, with so many people dedicating themselves to learning how to kill, there must have been a lot of gangster stuff going down. Ho Wanjia's family used their martial arts to make a living guarding merchant caravans, so basically, they were advanced mall cops. His dad didn't want him learning the family martial arts because he had asthma, so he just trained behind his back at night. Soon enough, he started winning challenge matches, including ones against foreign fighters, thereby delivering a blow to the sick man of Asia meme. In actual fact though, according to two primary accounts of his foreign challenge matches, his his opponents simply backed down in all politeness.
business after hearing of his reputation. Wu was a co-founder of the Qinwu Athletic Association, sponsored in part by Sun Yat-sen, the first president of China, who in turn was sponsored by triads. Gangster shit, I tell ya. And the triads that Sun Yat-sen had involved himself with were mostly based in British-controlled Hong Kong. Anyways, the Chin Wu led to the modern mainstream martial arts scene in China, including Wushu, which has come to refer to flashy martial arts choreography. Meanwhile, effective martial arts techniques were collected into a system called Sanda for use by the military. And that, over time, got declassified as it were, and started being taught to civilians, and also led to the creation of the sport known as San Chao which, like Muay Thai, basically falls somewhere between kickboxing and MMA. There's a lot of legendary figures from the history of Kung Fu, such as Wang Fei Hung, known for his shadowless kick, which, unlike its more fanciful cinematic rendition, is a technique that makes use of a hand fate, which masks the kick, which, when it hits, seems as if it was thrown at blinding speed. And how about Guru's Hong, master of the iron palm technique? And he didn't just break bricks either. One day, a Russian circus came into this dude's town, right? And a man offered a prize for anyone who could make his horse lie down. So the villagers, who were generally impoverished and hungry, started trying their luck. But they all failed, as one by one they got kicked by the horse, causing deaths and serious injuries. So Gu, having seen quite enough of this, steps up to take his attempt. He tanks the horse's kicks, and then slaps the creature in the middle of its back, causing it to not so much lie down as break down, and it was dead by the next day due to internal injuries. The Chinese horse whisperer doesn't ask twice. Also, doesn't he look just like PewDiePie's girlfriend? There's so many different skills in Gung Fu. You know, Bruce Lee was able to put his finger through an unopened pop can. And that's back when pop cans were made of iron. And what's more, his dab was so fast that it could barely be captured on camera. So he was literally like a quick draw cowboy at close range and could light vaginas on fire when the sun goes down. Now the Shaolin Temple was like the Chinese version of the Vatican, a gangster's paradise. They gathered all that knowledge on killing, supposedly just to protect themselves from bandits and the like, sometimes employing their staffs, which they traveled with. But then why did they also practice with Chinese curved swords, three section staffs, and breakdance chains? Shaolin has actually had a big effect on me. Back when when I was like 15, I was totally infatuated with the idea of training there. It really took hold of me after I saw a certain movie. No, not Shaolin Temple, but another one with Jet Li in it, Twin Warriors, the Tai Chi Master. Looking back, I think the reason for this is because in this movie, the bad guy trained in Shaolin, and I saw how he was getting social status and power and dominating over other men with ease using his Kung Fu. I'm like, yeah, I want to be a peaceful Buddhist or whatever. So as part one of my developing plans to get to Shaolin, I got this Thai exchange student, we're going to call her Sandwich, to tutor me in Chinese. Sandwich was pretty average at tutoring but also really nice. Up until this point, I hadn't been around a female that showed this much tolerance for my existence. And it didn't help things much when we had this cute little moment where she taught me the words wa ai ni, which means I love you in Chinese. And we just kind of stared at each other for a second there until she's like, what I didn't mean. I'm like, well, fuck you then. I can't apply this in real life because I don't want to hear these words from anyone but you. I was so dummy by sandwich at this point that I passed up an offer from this pretty cute girl that I passed on the sidewalk to make out. And even as I walked away, she's like, I'm serious with this pleading voice in front of all her friends. And you know, I kind of feel like the only reason she made that offer like she did is because I, a young man full of equal parts dumb and cum, had completely ignored her in her skimpy outfit. I was just looking forward to sitting with Sandwich again, learning absolutely nothing of what she had to teach. Like I was thinking seriously about quitting school and getting a full-time job so I could ask her to live with me. Not that that would have worked even if she wanted to. Sandwich was an exchange student and by the end of the school year she had to go back. So when the day finally came to say goodbye, me and her were standing inside her front doorway, just staring at each other. She was very patient like that and for my part, I was too depressed to say anything and if I could say something I certainly didn't want to say goodbye and after a good 10 seconds of this we both noticed that tears were just pouring out of my face it's not like I broke down sobbing or anything it was just raining indoors only then did I manage to melt the words goodbye despite myself I kind of forcefully burst through the door never to turn around and ultimately never to see sandwich again I was so depressed that whole summer that I started developing bitch tits in honor of sandwich's Thai culture here's the kicker though the family that had taken her in as part of the exchange program they're a bunch of doctors right quite well off and it turns out their son was banging her the whole time in fact fact, I almost suspect that they just brought her over as a toy for him to play with. I could have treated you better, my precious sandwich. Just not, you know, financially. That's what I get for wanting to be a Shaolin bad boy. <laughs> You know what's even worse though? That girl actually lost her whole family in the tsunamis. She got good grades in school, but she's probably just a hooker now. Taekwondo, meaning kick punch way, was developed in Korea. And not that I doubt that those aggressive ass Koreans who gotta shave off half their jaws to look like pop idols would have their own martial arts. But Taekwondo is like if competition karate and soccer had a baby. It's got that soccer mom appeal. It almost feels calculated. It's great exercise though because it's constant kicking. Punches barely even factor in. The whole thinking behind that is that legs have more power, more weight, and more reach, and thus should be used more. 
more. But of course, it's also extremely draining to lift all that weight off the ground and throw one of those powerful kicks over and over as fast as you can. Throwing around that kind of weight also means that you have to commit to every strike while on one leg. You could be leg swept, kicked in the dick, or just rushed and tackled to the ground. You know, Taekwondo was my first martial art. I practiced each of those kicks they taught me a hundred times or more every day for a couple years. I thought I was getting pretty strong. And this thinking got me into a real fight eventually. A real sidewalk fight. You see, I had something to prove. And I had been pestering this guy who I thought was kind of tough to fight me for months. Actually, he was more than just kind of tough. But I had ignored all the terrible signs because of autism. For example, one time this guy started raging out and punching the brick walls at school. Literally using this concrete brick wall as a punching bag until multiple classrooms started shaking. One time, before all this, I actually got this guy super pissed off by kicking him in the balls. So he started throwing these super hard, but also super predictable shots at me. I'm pretty sure he was blinded by his own rage. I was able to dodge the first few pretty easily just by backstepping, but he was really coming at me and closing the gap. And those punches were getting so close that I ended up deflecting one with my elbow. And just from this glancing blow to my elbow, I felt like my arm nearly broke. Whereas typically, if you punch somebody's elbow full force, your hand will break for sure. I'm very lucky that he calmed down after that one glancing blow. But I didn't learn my lesson at all. And actually, after that incident of him raging out at the wall, the school's rugby coach took it upon himself to come up to him and try to recruit him for the team. So anyways, even though I was pestering this guy non-stop for months to fight me, he didn't take the bait. So I changed up tactics and started running my mouth like a loco locomotive. Until finally, he's like, okay, you want to fight? And just like that, it's on. To set up the scene, we're both on the sidewalk. On the one side is this schoolyard fence with a bunch of little kids watching. And on the other side is a fairly busy street. Not the sort that you want to just carelessly wander onto. So, even though he's the one who's pissed off in this situation, I'm the one who rushes in with a flurry of jabs. And he just calmly steps back, staying just over their range. And the fact that he's still not attacking makes me extremely anxious, so immediately I pull out the big guns. I load up and throw a huge head kick at him, but he backstep dodges that too. I throw another, this time a little lower, and he catches the damn thing. So I'm hopping on just one leg, and he's got every right to punish me now, but he lets me go. This was feeling like way too much of a foregone conclusion. So without really thinking about it, I threw all that Taekwondo out the window. I went into a full sprint towards him and threw a hook punch right at his jaw. He would later tell me that I was smiling when it looked like it was going to hit. But right before contact, my ears start ringing, and I realize that I'm laying down by the curb on the other side of the street. I try to stand, but all I can manage is to pull my head up with my neck and see him standing there on the sidewalk before I lose all strength and pass out. Turns out that the very last moment before that hit landed, he hit me with a straight right which launched me across the road. I only slid across the pavement for the last foot or so, which was still enough for the hoodie I was wearing to be choking me when I woke up. Of course, I didn't realize that I had been out for a good 10 seconds, so I tried my best to spring back up and continue. But as I'm stumbling towards him, he's like, ah, put some ice on that, buddy, and we both knew it was over. Somehow, despite candidating me across the street, and of course knocking me out, it only left a tiny bruise on the side of my face. That's just how accurate he was. You know, another thing that happened after that whole punching the wall incident is that I saw a random person on the street come up to this guy and call him Superman. But if this guy was Superman, he would be Superman Prime. He hit me so hard I flew into another dimension and got molested by interdimensional child molesters. And by the way, one of the reasons why the straight is so successful in knocking people out is that when it's thrown at you as a counter, your own tricep hides the punch until it's too late and you can't react. In my case though, even though I got countered, it was rushing into the punch that actually saved me. By moving in like that and throwing off his timing, I negated some of the power of the punch. It's also harder to punch through somebody like that if they're heavier. And by the way, I was 20 pounds heavier than this guy. But yeah, it's the same with kicks. He actually rushed in when he caught my leg earlier in the fight. So it wasn't really my shin that landed, it was closer to my knee. Anyways, later on in the video, I'll be getting into how a lighter guy can generate so much power. This guy I fought didn't even work out at the time, so a sedentary guy, 20 pounds lighter than me, sends me flying. You know, Joe Rogan likes to talk up this guy, Francis Xavier, how he was able to lift a guy who weighs the same as him off the ground with a punch. But that's nothing compared to Superman Prime, sending a guy 20 pounds heavier flying. Seriously though, in a town where everybody loves fighting, I chose the one guy who nobody wants to fight. But with all that anecdotal evidence aside, there are some kicks that could be useful in a full contact sidewalk fight, like the spinning back kick, the spinning hook kick, the mid-air hip switch head kick, and the tornado kick. I mean, who's ready for that shit right out the gate, you know? There's also my personal favorite, the side kick, which is great as long as you don't slide off their torso into the danger zone. Now here's one you casuals out there may not have heard of. Savat is to France what Muay Thai is to Thailand, and it's been described as fencing with the hands and feet. It only allows kicks with the foot, with fighters wearing footwear in the ring. And because of the art's connection with French sailors, many techniques involve holding onto something while kicking. It just makes sense on the rolling high seas. And also possibly the ring. I don't know about the cage though, that's a little more wrestling favored. Now as for the hand techniques, the punches of Savat borrow a lot from English boxing. Whereas when the English were in the process of reviving boxing, they shunned kicks as unsportsmanlike and French. So Savat is the only martial art to combine the French with the English. 
The sour boot with the sweet science. The passive with the aggressive. Saboteurs are actually known for using feints. They'll throw a kick at one angle, then all of a sudden change course and it hits you from some crazy other angle. Still though, as far as I can tell, France's biggest contribution to MMA is just the biggest, blackest Africans they could find. So everybody knows about boxing, it's the sweet science. The modern rules of which were largely laid out in the 1860s by the Marquis of Queensberry. His rules were the first to officially mandate the use of gloves, the design of which was largely based off gloves they used in ancient Greece. Except those gloves were implicitly designed to increase damage, unlike modern gloves which are first and foremost designed to protect the hands. This is why bare knuckle boxing takes on a different form, but we'll go deep on that later. Most boxing matches in ancient Greece and Rome were to the death and fought by slaves and or criminals, but there's always exceptions. Like the pretty boy Melancomus, who reportedly never took a punch in his entire career, and never threw one either. An absolute defense pure, or maybe he just pulled a griffith and sold his ass to a temple priest for an infinite luck stat. Who knows, maybe all this time the Catholic Church has just been trying to create a new messiah. Floyd, uh, Melancomus typically won all his matches by having the cardio to go all day, so his opponent, who's been throwing punches all day, will feel like he's got a Rottweiler hanging off each arm. He'll fall down for a full 10 count with a strong gust of wind. So the fall of Rome marked the beginning of the boxing dark ages. It wouldn't be till the 1600s that the English revived it. Before Queensberry, when it was still bare knuckle, they had something called Broughton's Rules. And the character, if you would, of modern boxing was already being formed. This is what it is. It's a gang. Um, boxing was developed from gangs. You know, the old Irish guys, old Dutch guys. It was a guy named Jim Bleacher. Wow. I and he always, listen, and he always put his slash on his corner. So that's how we got the red and blue corner. But you know what the red means? That's my gang. That's the representation of the gang, my what? political gang. <laughs> if I win this fight, like the ancient, if I win this fight against your champion, it's all gangs. Gangs, it's, it's all, uh, it's all um, originated from gangs, the whole world. If my gang wins this fight, we hold the whole district until you get a champion that could beat my fighter. Uh, if, that, if, you don't want, if you don't want to accept that challenge, my gang against your gang, then people, a lot of people die. Frankie Carbo was a member of the Lucci's crime family. He was a hitman for Murder Incorporated and went on to be one of the biggest names in boxing promotion history, where his group, known as The Combination, make big bucks by fixing big name fights. Eventually, he did get convicted for conspiracy and extortion related to his activities in boxing, alongside the likes of Truman Gibson, who was the head of the International Boxing Club, which in turn controlled televised boxing. And you know, people who say that Don King is no Frankie Carbo. Must have forgot about that time he curb stomped a guy to death while the police looked on. And he's had alleged ties to the Cleveland Gambino family. As another example of what I'm talking about here, Sugar Ray Robinson was close with James Norris, an American sports businessman involved in boxing, hockey, and horse racing. He's been linked to many cases of fight fixing and also unofficially managed many boxers, where often it was a very one-sided relationship. Now Norris was especially powerful because unlike his compatriots who also got caught doing these sorts of things, he never did any time. You know, if you just think of boxing as another martial art, it makes sense that it would be in the hands of the gangsters of the world, who may also use it as a platform for money laundering. Now one thing that's really stuck with me about boxing is that a lot of those old school guys talked about actually wanting to end their opponents in the ring. It reminds me of the importance of having a killer instinct. So way back when I was in like grade school, like grade four or five, I got surrounded by a bunch of other kids in the air. Now you see, I wasn't the most popular kid because I acted out a lot in class. Apparently this one kid, we'll call him Stuffy, had told all these other kids that he was going to beat me up. So of course they came along to watch. So Stuffy steps into the circle and finally I'm starting to understand stand. And then someone's like, punch him in the nose. So I do. It was quite a crunch I felt and Stuffy goes down, holding his face. And that was the end of it. All that happened afterwards was a teacher punished me by making me face a wall for half an hour. The thing that strikes me about that memory is how easy it was to pull the trigger. All I did was walk up and punch him because I thought whoever shouted was talking to me. I barely even thought about it. I was like a child soldier. Fearless because he doesn't know fear. Ruthless because he doesn't know agony. Now to contrast with that, when I was, well, too old for my actions that day to be considered reasonable, I was playing Monopoly with my cousin and my sister. Me and my cousin had a pact that once one of us buys a certain property, the other person wouldn't interfere in the buyer gaining the full set of that color of properties. In that way, my sister would in all likelihood be pushed out once things get to the house and hotel phase. He's the first to gain a full set, and that's when he decides to break our pact and start buying up the properties that I need to gain full sets. Pretty soon, he's dominating the board and calling me stupid over and over again. And to me, it's like, all you did was betray me. I guess I'm stupid because I didn't work it in as a variable that you might be a fucking weasel. Except in real life, I'm like, call me stupid again. And of course, when you say something like that, they almost always say it again. So I jumped on top of him and started wailing away. The thing is though, and here's the difference, I didn't land a single shot on his face. That's where I thought I was aiming, but then there was this other force that redirected my punch to his shoulder or his chest. You see, not to turn you into my therapist or nothing, but I had this issue where I felt like my parents thought more of my cousin than they did of me. So to be called stupid by him? Eh. But I think the reason I wasn't landing any of those shots is because I knew I was being a bit ridiculous. So after about 25 punches, I go back to sit down, and everybody's just frozen solid, trying to process what just happened. 
happen. And then after a little bit of that, my cousin jumps on me. He uses some kind of wrestling hold down, pressing down on my neck. He's like, are you done? Are you done? It's like, duh, I sat back down. Nice reaction time, fuck nuts. And to his credit, he doesn't hit me. He gets up and leaves while saying lots of mean things. And for years afterwards, he would make fun of me, saying that I'm blind as a bat. So basically, in that case, my killer instinct wasn't there because my heart wasn't all in on it. So it makes sense to me that high level fighters would feel the need to go to such a dark place. Wrestling is older than the written word and even more universal because the question would always come up. What do I do at Eskimo Kiss range? Well, you force them to the ground and you pin them. Then it's a question of what you want to do. As far as wrestling in the ancient Greek games, they had a point system based on forcing your opponent onto their back, forcing them out of bounds or getting a submission. But like with boxing, the fall of Rome spelled nap time for this style of wrestling. Not to be revived until the 19th century, reportedly by a French soldier named Expriat. The style that he pieced together, which focused mainly on techniques using the upper body, came to be known as Greco-Roman. Shortly after that came the catch as catch ken style of wrestling, or simply catch wrestling, which was a lot less limited in the scope of techniques that could be used, opening the door for techniques and submissions from all kinds of sources, including rough and tumble, also known as gouging, a homegrown American style of fighting, characterized by its use of eye gouges. Basically back then, if you felt insulted by somebody, you could challenge them to a rudimentary boxing match, or perhaps a gentleman's duel, or you could cast off that gentlemanly facade and roll around in the mud like a couple of bad mannered show pigs. You're probably going to lose an eye even if you win and instead of a cool dueling scare you'll just get a bruised up mash. You'll be walking around with a glass eye like yeah I was in the war. What war? Thumb war. So sometimes catch wrestlers will be called hookers because of their use of hook submissions. No, I'm not talking about the old oil check. That's only acceptable in a total thumb war scenario. Hook submissions were simply submissions that were performed too fast for their opponent to even tap out. It was brutal, and because of its qualities as a spectacle, catch wrestling became popular at carnivals, which is also where pro wrestling got its start. Ad Sentel was one of the biggest names in catch wrestling at the turn of the century era. He was known for beating Japanese judoka, and even traveled to the country to look for more matches when they stopped coming to him. In doing so, he popularized catch wrestling, and by its extension pro wrestling in Japan. And as we know, the pure wrestle world is what led to the creation of Japanese MMA. Now freestyle wrestling is like a happy medium. Like Greco-Roman, it's tame enough to be in the Olympics. But like catch wrestling, it takes the focus off just the upper body and incorporates techniques from all sorts of different styles, such as Sambo with its leg submissions. Now wrestling is known for its weight cuts, particularly water weight cuts, where you dehydrate yourself to slide into a lower weight division than you're walking around weight. Now this isn't the most healthy thing in the world to do, and it's not like it actually gives you an advantage. Since everyone is doing it, it's just to avoid having a disadvantage. Now when we talk about weight cuts in MMA, some are clearly better at it than others, and they're also better at bouncing back healthy before the fight than others. And using wrestling is a great way to take advantage of such a weight advantage, especially when you have the cage to grind them up against. Now on to BJJ. Of course I've already talked plenty about this art, so instead I'm going to teach you some greasy jiu jitsu moves. If you're trying to secure a choke but can't seem to get their chin to come up, what you can do is put your hand in their face and push upwards on their nose. Chances are you won't even have to use any force because they'll reflexively pull their head back. If you're trying to secure an arm bar but they're holding on tight, what you can do is shake your legs up and down. If you do it right, the back of their head will start banging into the floor. That'll loosen them up. Now, if you want to be a real piece of work, you'd use the dick slicer. What you do is get them up onto your knee as with a sacrifice throw. Then comes the hard part, determining in which direction their dick is positioned. But if you can manage that, all you gotta do is grind your knee down the shaft until you reach the head, like kneading dough, with all their body weight on it. So BJJ actually has a poorer cousin slash rival called Luta Livre. This art has been historically associated with the poorer and more melanated people of Brazil. Basically, LL was more for the favelas, while BJJ was more for the children of retired Nazis and such. Luta Libre was actually founded by a Lebanese catch wrestler and Valley Tudo fighter named Euclides Haddam. And as such, the art makes more use of wrestling techniques and has a more grip it and rip it rather than setting up style of submissions. They're also not big on the geese. You know, those pajamas are expensive, and who's wearing a coat in Brazil anyways? Many Luta Libre fighters have been involved in Valley Tudo, which itself is often considered a descendant art of Luta Libre, just add strikes. Kinda mirrors the way that the Gracies started the biggest MMA promotion in North America. But yeah, those two schools have been going at it for a long time, with the odd Japanese judoka thrown into the mix. Like when Euclides faced off against Takio Yano, who is credited with bringing the heel hook to BJJ and had a match with George Gracie that resulted in a double choke out. Though Euclides beat Takio in their first match using a choke, but in their second match he was somehow roped into wearing a gi, making him a muscular wrestling fish taken out of the water and brought into a pajama party. Judo, the gentle way, is all about slamming your opponent on the hard ground, sometimes head first by taking the path of least resistance. Most techniques are about throwing your opponent over your shoulder, over your hips or sometimes just a trip, but the main point is to use their own momentum against them. So the more yielding and inviting you can be, the harder you can slam them. So calling it the gentle way is actually kind of like how hardened arteries mean that your cock is soft. You know, one of my proudest moments is when I actually applied the gentle way to completely turn a situation around in an almost cartoonish fashion. This happened back when I was around 12 or 13. 
Me and my cousin and a couple guys from the neighborhood were playing a sort of basketball game, but really just screwing around. This was taking place in my family's driveway with one of those stand-up hoops. Now one of the guys there was one of my neighbors, this chubby kid who was a year younger than me, and he taught me the meaning of entitlement issues. Basically, with him, no matter what it was, he had to feel like he was the one in control and receiving special attention. And if he didn't get it, he would start whining and do something really dickish and spiteful. Like one time, he was hanging out at my place, and I kind of just got tired of him, honestly. So I'm like, hey, I got stuff to do. You might as well just head out now. But he doesn't go. And as I press him more and more to go he starts whining more and more about how he doesn't want to leave so i half playfully and yeah half seriously start pushing him towards the door so what does he do he pushes me down and sits on me and like i said he's fat he's got quite a bit of weight on me and honestly i was getting a little scared i couldn't get out and i was struggling to breathe and he really didn't seem all that right in the head like I didn't have the words for it then, but sociopath seems to fit. So the way I got out of that one was I basically submitted. I'm like, you got me, haha. Ha. Let's go do something else. And I let him outside. So fast forward back to the basketball game. So he wasn't very good at handling the ball or taking shots. So naturally, he ended up not being very involved in the game. He wasn't happy about that and started whining about wanting essentially special rules that were purely self-serving. But he couldn't sit on all of this. So as he kept whining, we started pushing him further and further out of the game until finally we told him to go home. So he stomps over to his house. And we think that's that, right? Maybe he'll even reflect on his bad attitude. And then he comes back with a baseball bat demanding to be involved in the game. So we try reasoning with him, telling him why we did what we did, and of course that goes nowhere. We offer him a second chance to be involved, if he could just be cool and not ridiculous. Nope. So finally I'm like, dude, give me the bat, you're fucked up. So I reach towards the bat, and he pulls back to take a swing. Luckily he's slow. So I charge in to where the bat can't really hurt me, and we basically lock up. And the momentum from his swing causes us to start spinning around, kind of like a pair of ice dancers. And after a full revolution, we disengage. Somehow, I'm the one left standing still, and all that kinetic energy has gone into his body, and he goes tumbling off the driveway into the ditch adjacent to it. And in that ditch was a couple thorn bushes. And not only that, but those little tumbleweed things full of spikes. Like, I don't know what possessed my neighbor to plant those things. I guess it was just destiny. So he's embedded in these thorn bushes. And to me, the whole thing felt effortless, like he just took a dive. And then a couple years later, I start going to judo class to get my ass kicked. The founder of judo, Jigaro Kano, trained in many different jujitsu schools acquiring techniques from wherever he could get them, including from sumo and wrestling. Now, like we did with karate, let's not go forward and instead go back. Jiu-Jitsu was the hand-to-hand -hand combat of the samurai, and as such, it's logical to assume that there was more emphasis on throws than ground fighting. I mean, you want to disengage as quickly as possible to be on guard for his buddies. We've all seen the videos of white guys trying to use ground and pound on black guys. So long before judo, in China, there was something called swai zhao. Swai means to throw down, and zhao means to wrestle or trip with the legs. This art, which has gone by different names, has been around for at least 4,000 years, and 3,000 years ago, it became part of something called Zhao Li, which added strikes, joint locks, and pressure point attacks. In other words, it was Chinese MMA, with a strong emphasis on moves that maim and kill. According to legends, sometimes they even wore horned helmets and attempted to gore each other. At least it makes more sense than those handlebars Vikings supposedly wore. Like, cool story, bro. Wake me up when the winged desires arrive. But yeah, like just about everything else in Japanese culture, Jujutsu has Chinese roots. I mean, they're a dinky little island, with genes so similar to the mainlanders. Do the math. Sambo is the martial art of Russia, and was formed by using hand-picked techniques from different martial arts around the world, particularly from Japan, China, and Mongolia. They must have been going through an Asian phase. You know, ever since they got all that empty land up north, they think they're too good to be counted with the Caucasians. But then again, with the way their men keep dying at such a young age, they ultimately have the choice between being sinified or black by the new Europeans. Anywho, Stambo was largely put together by World War I veteran Viktor Sporindinov, and then taught to Russian soldiers from World War II on. Now as I mentioned, Sambo is known for its leg locks, which are more dangerous than most other types of submissions because you don't start to feel the pain until you're already in deep trouble. So of course, Russians like to play games where they leg lock each other and see who says uncle first. So Sambo is basically Russian MMA, and Combat Sambo, which is basically a mix of MMA and Judo tournament rules, has created some big name MMA fighters. Now I just can't talk about Russian martial arts without mentioning Sistema and the stab your opponent with their own knife technique or Russian team fights, where two groups have it out, and as soon as the first few guys go down, it gets lopsided really quickly. So I'd say we got a pretty good understanding of the martial arts now. One thing I wanted to illustrate is that mixed martial arts as a concept is nothing new. In fact, it's practically an oxymoron. People always trained in whatever they felt was the best of whatever they had access to. It just used to be harder to travel. When it comes down to it, it's really about individuals and opportunity. So with that said, let's look at some fighters. Bop it! Twist it! Pull it! Bend it! Oh, Back in the early days, Dan Severn was picking up slack and putting in work. The dude has over 100 professional wins, and he's fought over 100 times since turning 40. That's just how you had to do it back then, when fighters were getting paid in chicken wings and hand jobs. It was like, man, you know, you, 
You look like uh, Fat Freddie Mercury. So aside from the very high probability of being Freddie Mercury, Dan has also had an incredibly short career as a math tutor. John, if I had a bicycle, I could travel 10 miles an hour. A train travels to 50 miles an hour. I got to travel a 30 minute distance. How many apples does Mary have left in the basket? You're mad. You know, I tried tutoring before. My very first gig was this 13 year old girl who was struggling with her math. So let me just preface by saying that I'm only kind of a scumbag just for flavor, but sometimes that's all people see. To make matters worse, people have told me that I give off unstable homeless vibes, but at least I can say that I've never done hard drugs, although I do like to experiment with other things. For example, during the time that I was tutoring this girl, I grew some lion's mane with a home grow kit. Lion's mane being a mushroom that when ingested supposedly gives you a temporary intelligence boost. So one day, an hour before I go over to this girl's house to tutor, I downed two large mushrooms of the stuff. Before I even got there, I knew something had gone wrong with these mushrooms. I was not feeling good. My brain was getting foggy and sleepy, and I tried to be a trooper, but my voice was starting to slur as well. So I was going over the answers to the questions I gave her, trying to make sure she understood the concepts. And I had to read the numbers out loud, like loud loud, for them to reverberate in my brain enough to stick. And when I get to a solitary number six, I'm just like, sex. I tried to play it off cool, but I knew I had some kind of stupid look on my face, and I also knew that her mom was in the next room listening. She had made it pretty clear from the start that she didn't trust me. The rest of the session goes by without incident, but a couple hours later her mom calls me like, hey, great job, she learned everything. Never come back again. And man, I was charging her parents super low rates too, telling them I was new and just wanted to gain some experience. By now, they probably think I've become the predator from the predator, since I still haven't shown up in the news. Because if you don't, I'm gonna beat you into the living death. As a military brat who got cycled through the foster system, Ken Shamrock had a rough time growing up. He was very lucky to be adopted by Bob Shamrock, who saw something in this angry and athletic youth. The structure that Bob gave Ken allowed him to channel all that anger into sports. He first settled on pro wrestling, but because he was doing that in Japan, it led him into the MMA scene. Aside from his athletic background, pro wrestling is a tough world, so it's not that surprising that he did well in Pancrase. In fact, when Ken started his own fight camp called the Lion's Den, he based the mentality on it on what he had experienced in the Japanese wrestling world. The trio tended to be just a grind of getting beaten up by Ken and just generally being worn down as a way of determining who has the guts to go all the way or in Ken's words the mentality of kill me because I got nothing else in this world except what I can do and you're gonna have to kill me to take away take that from me and he does take it all the way considering that before his MMA career even started in high school wrestling he broke his neck and was told by his doctor that he'll never do contact sports again, but so much for that. In fact, he went on to get his neck jacked up some more, and his knees. But yeah, this grind style tryout, which attempts to break your will, is what Ken had gone through with his mentor, Matsukatsu Funaki. So Ken joined the UFC for its very first event, which began his trilogy with Royce Greasy. The result of this first fight was Ken losing via chokeout. The thing is though, the rules of this match forbade Ken from wearing his wrestling shoes, while they allowed Royce to wear his gi, and in fact Royce used the gi to choke Ken out. I think Ken has a pretty good argument that not only was it unfair to put him out of his familiar element but not Royce, but also that the gi was being used as a weapon. And here's another thing about gis, they absorb sweat. So even if it's late in the fight against a particularly sweaty opponent, you can still maintain traction to apply your jujitsu. For their second fight, Ken trained with the intention to grind Royce down for literally hours if need be until he breaks the man. But as if Hoyler could read his mind, the rules changed, now there was a 30 minute time limit. Then after a half hour passes with no definitive result, they give him a little more time. Maybe Hoyler thought Hoyce had a second win left in him, but it looks a lot more like the only second wind he had left could give Ken pink eye. Those extra minutes didn't do Hoist any favors. And since there was no judges, the fight was declared a draw. Third fight happened 21 years later in Bellator. Old guys don't have time to mess around. Hoist just need him in the dick and went home with a W. So going back to Ken's troubled youth, don't you just hate people who have kids and then choose natural selection as their parenting style? This is a competitive world that brutalizes the weak. A child needs every advantage they can get. Have you ever noticed how so many celebrities and politicians love to brag about how they came from a poor background but still made it? They also like to say that they're not going to leave their kids any inheritance. It's a trick you see. Luckily, only those with asshole genes will fall for it. It's like a form of natural selection. It's just too bad it's their kids that really have to suffer. Prototype of modern MMA. This guy has seen it all. So unlike Ken, who seems pretty Italian if you ask me, Frank is Mexican. Frank was really more of a party boy than a scrapper growing up, but after a few years in prison, he decided to straighten out and fight right. Bob actually thought he should be a male stripper, while Ken wanted Frank to run his gym. But Magic Frank was tired of being the number two, the Robin to Ken's Batman. He wanted to be at least Nightwing. He's been called the first complete mixed martial artist, both looks and style. But what if it hadn't been for Bob? Well, it reminds me of this guy I knew back in high school who had a real sketchy vibe. We'll just call him Randy. And Randy liked to talk a lot about slitting people's throats. I don't know if he had a knife on him, 
him, but his meth head friend did. That guy biffed a heavy metal stapler into the back of my head in English class, and when I turned around to ask who threw it, he and some other people pointed at this totally innocent guy. So I throw that stapler as hard as I can right into that guy's face and miss. It bounces off his desk. I was too pissed to see straight. Lucky for him. After class, I realize it was probably the meth head, so I go up and ask him. He's like, yep, and I punch him. He tells me to fuck off with a bit of nervousness in his voice, and even though I have every reason to fuck on right now, I hesitate and leave it at that. I had challenged this guy to fight before over some stunts he pulled, to which he said he would bring his knife, and I guess I was just too pussy to want to deal with that. But I do have this one friend who didn't give a damn. He ends up taking this guy's school bag and throwing his school books into different classrooms down the hall. The meth head tries to judo throw this guy, but it doesn't work because he's at such a size disadvantage. And later, he does pull a knife on my friend in the school cafeteria, but gets booted in the face. And by the way, this isn't like a little dinky pocket knife I'm talking about here. It was a hunting knife with a thick blade. One guy actually did a smart thing and took the knife off him, waving it in front of the school cameras. But still, none of the staff intervened. That guy came from a family of meth heads and drug dealers, and nobody wanted any part of it. But back to Randy. So a couple years later, me and my buddy who booted Meth Rambo in the face are walking down the street and we run into Randy. We start walking and talking together, cause whatever, memories, right? Randy's a super tough boy now. He talks about how he's big into martial arts. No formal classes though, he just kinda does his own thing. He also says he works out shirtless in his front yard for girls to see as they pass by. It's hard to really believe all this stuff he's saying or even just turn it into a good conversation because he keeps turning it back to the same things. And there's a certain darkness to it all. Like this guy's mind is up Horsecock Creek without a saddle. So my buddy makes some excuse to ditch me with Randy, suggesting that we go check out the local MMA gym. So what the fuck, we start walking over there, I ask him more about what he's been up to, what's his plans, and it's always the same thing. Basically, he tries to paint this hyper-masculine picture of himself, but it really just comes off as being depressing and dark. At one point, I catch myself thinking, maybe if I close my eyes, he'll go away, but we make it to the front door of the MMA class. So I'm trying to build my balls to jump in there, and he's just like, man, I don't need this, I got my own thing. We keep wandering around town, blah blah, same stuff and I managed to ditch him without him finding out where I live. Now here's the thing, people like Randy start slipping down a bad path in life because of useless parents, and it becomes a vicious cycle because in real life, people avoid types like him who are approaching the edge instead of trying to fix them, increasing the likelihood of pumped up kicks. Now another example of this would be Chris Chan, who's like a gay version of Randy. I, Chris Chandler, am straight. Correction, Tranny isn't gay, bro. I actually read some of Chris Chan's comic, Sonichu. It's full of personal revenge fantasies and pleas for pussy. Tell me Christian's parents knew he had autism pretty early on, and they did what they could, at least while he was young, to give him a bearable life. His dad even paid girls to hang out with him, his gal pals he called them. It's like he was living in a rap video, but too bad, being surrounded by females doesn't attract other women if not a single one of them looks interested in you. So instead, Christian went with a billboard strategy, putting up posters in his school. He got one thing wrong about advertising though, he focused way too much on what he wanted, and not enough on what he had to offer, which is, uh... You know, I will say that Christian was quite motivated, and maybe had something to offer artistically, but he's just not a self-improvement guy. He just just had too much ego to learn from his mistakes, the result of a sheltered childhood, and the result of his parents not recognizing his needs and not giving him the tools he would need to compete in this world. So Hoist Gracie wasn't actually Horion's first pick to represent BJJ. The story goes that Horion wanted the more athletic and talented Hickson Gracie, but Hickson already had his own school and Horion wanted someone to represent his school. So he started making the excuse that Hickson was just too physically impressive looking to show off the effectiveness of the family's jujitsu. Hickson had no shortage of avenues to represent his own school though, like that time pro wrestler turned fighter Yoji Anjo showed up at his doorstep. He brought the Japanese press with him, but Hickson insisted that they do the fight behind closed doors. Yoji came out looking like this, as apparently Hickson had really dragged out his victory as punishment for turning this thing into a circus. Yoji would later hand deliver a letter apologizing and saying that all the pageantry was just to get the fight. But frankly, I think gym breaking is an important part of martial arts culture. Hell, it's an important part of Gracie history. It's the natural remedy for the plague of McDojos in the West. I mean, tournaments are one thing, but tournaments can develop their own tournament culture, which can drift away from martial culture. Back in the old school days, schools had banners that they had to defend from outside challenges to maintain their credibility. I've always had an interest in the infamous dojo storm. The most famous dojo storm in North America is probably that time that Count Don who sold his secret techniques straight out of comic books, stormed the Green Dragon Society's Black Cobra Hall in Chicago. Dante and his crew at first gained entry by impersonating police officers and then started to attack this rival school's students. One of Dante's friends and fellow teachers died in this assault, presumably because of this rival school pulling out traditional Chinese weapons. When it was all said and done, the judge literally threw all related charges out of court and called everyone involved a lunatic. Count Dante has also been arrested for blowing out the windows of a rival dojo using dynamite, and he's also alleged to have been the mastermind behind the 1974 Chicago Purolator bank vault robbery. 
and he actually died shortly before the related trial was completed. But going back to the Gracie challenge, there was actually another match that Helio Gracie lost. It was against Vladimir Santana, who, after nearly four hours of Valley Tudo, soccer kicked Helio unconscious. I bet Helio did his burpees from that day forward. If you happen to disengage on the ground, you really don't want to be the one left stuck on his butt. And I know I'm throwing a lot at you, so in case you forgot, the other guy who beat him was Masahiko Kimura. And he ends up going back to Japan, right? One day, he's doing a pro wrestling match. For whatever reason, Kamuro delivers a kick to his opponent, pro wrestler Ricky Dozen's balls. So it quickly turns into a real fight, and Kamuro gets the absolute worst out of it. He starts getting shit stomped, which is my term for when someone has your head a couple inches off the floor before stomping in order to increase damage. Now just to shed some light on this situation, the Yakuza have long been heavily involved in Japanese pro wrestling. And similar to many large amateur boxers in the UK, they sometimes get hired as big boys, you know, enforcers. And to further stress how these are some underworld characters, Ricky Dozen later ends up getting stabbed at a nightclub with a urine soaked blade. He simply throws his attacker out of the club and doesn't consider his wound serious, but dies a week later of peritonitis. This is rumored to have been retaliation for his not sticking to the script in his match with Kimura. I mean it's called professional wrestling for a reason, right? There's lots of stories about Kimura, like how he defeated a knife fighter when he was in high school. It reminds me of Dark Judo. You know, back in a video I made about the game for honor, I told you about how I got thrown on my head by a black belt in judo class. I was knocked out and definitely got some brain damage. It does it doesn't take much augmentation of most judo throws to make it so that your opponent lands on their head. In fact, white belts do it by mistake sometimes. I mean, the earth is the closest thing we have to a true unmovable object. I'd say it's worse than a head kick. And speaking of judo, when Kano's school was new, it was constantly being challenged. Reportedly, there was many deaths during the process of them establishing themselves. Their main opponent was the Totsuka Jujutsu School, who they eventually defeated pretty definitively in martial arts tournaments hosted by the police. And as a result, judo became the martial art of choice for police departments all around the world. The appeal is being able to restrain people without causing them serious harm. Like good marketing, but the dark side isn't that far away. I mean, that's like the martial arts equivalent of inventing the condom. There's a lot of trust involved, and no one has seriously questioned judo's legitimacy since. I see that you know your judo well. And you, sir, are you waiting to receive my limp penis? Now but back to Gracie Challenge matches. Henzo Gracie's most famous match was against Luta Libre fighter Eugenio Tadao. It's not famous for the match itself though, it actually turned into a huge brawl with shots fired. They even destroyed the arena. The police were like, this is why we can't have nice things, and banned Valley Tudo in Rio for the next two years. You know, regardless of the result of a match between the two, I think that a more aggressive and physical submission style like Luta Libre is superior in the context of Brazil. I mean, it's like surfing, you know? You need to be back on your feet as soon as possible to ride out the chaos. The Gracies have also proposed that Gene Bell do the Gracie challenge. He accepted, but instead of Hickson, he wanted to fight the older Helio, as Gene was already 60 years old. So the Gracies countered, saying that Helio would do the match at 140 pounds, which Gene couldn't possibly cut down to. And as such, the match never happened. In other words, Helio ducked 60-year-old Gene. There's also a lot of cases of randoms challenging pro fighters to try and make a name for themselves. Too bad most of them don't actually get recorded, but there was that time that Dominic Cruz got challenged by a ninja. Then there was that time that bouncer knocked out BJ Penn, who seemed to be avoiding hitting the guy and was actually trying to talk him down. Now, if you listen to some of Bass Rutten's stories, you'd think it was in a bouncer's job description to do this sort of thing. I mean, to name a handful, him, Mark Hunt, Alistair and Valentin Overeem, Randy Couture and Dan Henderson have all fought bouncers. So I don't know what BJ was doing trying to get a peace treaty signed. In all likelihood, it was the bouncer that was doing all the agitation. So in one of his early fights, Hickson fought Ray Zulu, father of pride fighter Zulu Zinho. And while he had the man in his guard, Hickson beat Zulu Sr.'s kidneys with his heels so viciously that he was actually pissing out kidney fragments after the fight. Hickson's guard gang can put a motherfucker on dialysis. Hickson is known as one of the greatest of his era, and a lot of people People credit that to his emphasis on mastering the basics, including diet, basic conditioning, and even yoga. When you control your breath, you can actually control yourself mentally and physically. You can really understand your fears and your emotional stress. People spend one million dollars for one drop of my sperm. <laughs> Hickson did a lot of fighting in Japan, where sometimes, as with Royce, he had his own way such as when he fought Matsukatsu Funaki, where he reportedly demanded special rules which forbade elbows, headbutts, and other strikes. Like, who even does that? That's like a chick who goes to a house party where the host is providing free alcohol. She drinks half the alcohol and then starts demanding to take over the TV when everybody's watching a movie so she can watch football. I just think it's better when both parties actually want the same thing, such as when Sakuraba fought Carlos Newton. They had a gentleman's agreement that went beyond the technical rules of the fight that it would just be a grappling match, not just one party using his fame and family reputation as leverage. And speaking of unfair advantages, my very first fighting experience happened in daycare. There was this Down Syndrome kid who was older than the rest of us and he lifted weights. He beat the shit out of me with a metal toy truck on the daily. 
I thought he almost killed me a few times. And my parents didn't notice because he only went for the top of my head where my hair would hide it. So it's not like he was completely stupid. There was some strategy to what he did. And as for the daycare workers, they didn't say anything about it because they wanted to stay PC and they gave me money, I guess to shut me up. But I had no idea what the fuck was going on. I go into a bar, the guy said to me in a nightclub, boss keep it relaxed tonight. And he puts his finger in my eye, I don't want her trouble, I had a boop in my other eye. And boof! That was a nightmare because you know. Boss Rutin grew up having both eschema and asthma, and whenever one would die down, the other would flare up. But despite being abused by his own immune system and being picked on because you know how kids are, he was still an active lad and liked to climb trees. And maybe he would have turned out to be a real Peter Pan case if he hadn't snuck into a movie theater one day and saw Enter the Dragon. That movie makes decisions for you. He started training until one day he knocked out the biggest bully in his town with just one punch, and then he trained some more. He became a bouncer and a model before getting into professional fighting. His fighter nickname, El Wapo, means the handsome one in Spanish, and he's got some hands all right. During his time in Pancrase, he learned to optimize his palm strikes for damage, but what he really became known for was the liver shot. Not a lot of fighters focus on the body like that, but just look how effective it is. You literally drop like a sack of potatoes once a good one gets through. A fight with El Wapo should be considered a form of hepatitis. Boss is now long retired from fighting, mostly due to wear and tear, but he's done a lot since, being a commentator for Pride, having an MMA variety show, and he's developed a machine that he claims has relieved him of his asthma symptoms. He's even in the home workout system business. Next thing he can do is start a bouncer bartending course, call it the liver shot. And on the topic of bars, so there's this guy I knew back in high school. He was actually like 20 years old, still there for the girls or whatever, but the thing is he managed to make us high schoolers look like kids. He was 6'2 with a thick frame and brutal strength. People in high school looked at him with awe and fear. A real life caveman. He shocked these kids because he really didn't look like he belonged there, like Pickle from Grappler Backy. This guy deadlifted six plates on one of his first days in the gym. That's about 545 pounds if you include the bar. Even more impressively, he benched 405 pounds without training, which normally takes years to get to because the pec tendon is so small, and tendons take forever to grow because they don't get much blood flow. I mean, reach in right now and feel your pec tendon. It's tiny. So this guy is just built different, you know? So to give you a little background on what happens next, there's this barren town where the old timers, you know, middle aged men and such, like to hang out. And whenever a younger guy showed up there, there tended to be trouble. Because then the regulars would start to feel like their supply of pussy was being threatened. I mean, it was a bit ridiculous for them to be so insecure that these young fellas were moving in on their catches. But it eventually got so bad that they instated an age limit where you have to be at least 24 to enter. They just played it off like, you know, those young fellas, all loose up to no good. And actually, before I continue, I should tell you how hard this caveman dude can hit. You know big love boxing? They do it at carnivals and such sometimes. While well, I let him hit me once in the face with one of those big pillows, and it nearly tore the skin on my face. One or two more of those on the same spot, and I would have been torn wide open. Without the gloves, it would have been a horror show right away. Like he punches super slow, but if he hits you once, it's over. So one night, Caveman Dude gets into some probably dumbass argument with a middle-aged man at this bar. They take it outside, and what happens is, this older guy lifts him off the ground with a double grape choke. Like Caveman Dude weighs about 260 pounds of primal strength and he's kneeing and kicking the guy, but it's having no effect. And even when Caveman Dude's buddy starts hitting the guy on the arm with the trucks on his skateboard, that's the metal stuff that houses the wheel axles on the bottom. It has no effect. So the situation gets more desperate, and he starts slamming those skateboard trucks into the guy's head. But even that didn't stop him right away. This guy was strong as an ox and very drunk. He only finally stopped when he was completely soaked in his own blood, like it soaked out through his denim jacket. And this guy was only like 5'11". How is this even possible, you ask? Well, it's a farm town, and people have easy access to steroids, such as Trembolone, which they use on cows. You know, a lot of people on YouTube like to say that steroids don't make a crazy difference, unless you train hard and eat clean. And that's completely asinine. For example, a lot of the guys at the gym where I trained at in that town were huge. You could taste all the branch-chain testosterones in the air. And I know for a fact that a lot of them just ate whatever they wanted, like pizza, donairs. A lot of them ate Baconators, like seven Baconators a day. I mean, just look at the nutritional chart. They were way over on their macros by anyone's standard. They drank a lot of beer too, like stuff you'd think only teenagers could get away with, but they looked great. Maybe not as cut and defined as they could be, but still way above average. A lot of pro bodybuilders like to say that you need the right genetics and work ethic to make it to the top, but I'm calling BS on that too. It's mostly steroids and crazier stuff like insulin and HDH. Soon they'll all look like a roasted turkey talking about the perfect genetics. Mark Kerr isn't called the smashing machine because of his skills with the ladies. In fact, most of his finishes come early in the first round. In one Valley to do fight against a guy with a Kappa era background, basically breakdance fighting, Mark knocked out two of the guy's teeth, broke his own hand, and before he could even finish, the guy basically submitted by crawling over the ring to be disqualified. Like, I would assume he could just tap out, but under the smashing machine, the man was reduced to basic instincts, ducking out on his knees like a Japanese concubine. And Mark is just this college wrestler trying to earn some quick cash. What's his secret? Nano machine, son! 
Merck smashed his way to being the heavyweight champion at UFC 14 and 15, but things were a little bit different when he went to Japan for the big bucks. According to fellow fighter Mark Coleman, he started getting really scared whenever his fights drew near, and he theorizes that's what later led to his addiction to opioid painkillers. According to Mark, he used them as a shortcut of sorts. Instead of taking time off fighting and training to properly rehab his injuries, he would pop a Vicodin and keep on rolling. So at this point, whenever he comes down, he's scared and in pain and going through withdrawal. So he's like, well, screw that. The only thing we have to fear is that feel itself. The best part of Merck's fighting career ended with his time in Pride, and it took him a long time to come back from that dark path of addiction. You know, in the hillbilly town where I grew up, there weren't really that many recreational activities available, so a lot of people experimented with drugs. It was either what I would consider the soft drugs like cannabis, shrooms, or steroids, or the hard stuff like cocaine or meth. This made the culture complicated, because choosing not to do drugs could also turn you into a loser. You have it harder when it comes to finding jobs, because the druggy circles have all the connections. So you got stoner kids and hardcore drug addicts taking up all the positions, while straight edge kids go straight to their mom's basement. Sometimes in life, you just gotta pick your poison. Mark Coleman was the original Mark Kerr, the godfather of ground and pound, using his wrestling to gain and hold the dominant position and really rain down the hammers. Sure, it doesn't seem that innovative today, but how many traditional martial arts were really teaching ground and pound? Mark even started his own camp, Team Hammer House, where they hammered out some new traditions. Now, Mark can be an emotional guy, but he represents a lot of what a man should strive to be. Look at the way he freaked out and tried to comfort his daughters after a brutal fight with Fedor. A girl's father, at least should be, her first and most important example in how a man should be. If you're not alpha enough to be a proper dad, Chad is going to be your daughter's father figure, and it's all downhill from there. You see, women don't follow logic. They follow whoever they perceive to be the strongest male. Roy Nelson is one of those fat guys who knows how to throw his weight around, and he's got a chin of balonium. If you take away the gut, he's actually an undersized heavyweight, maybe even a natural middleweight. So it's actually kind of hard to say if he just likes food or if he's counting on that reservoir of massive momentum to win the day. One thing I do know is that fat people have a disease, and these days there's way too many of them. Back in the day, it was like, ooh, fat girl. But now you got fucking submarines walking around who won't fuck you unless you got multiple degrees and make six figures. Meanwhile, she has some bullshit degree, and even if she has a decent degree, she most likely won't make good use out of it. She'll be mediocre at what she does, because she doesn't have the drive of a man. In fact, she'll probably just be working some bullshit government job. There's new government jobs every year, gotta redistribute those tax dollars. The real cause of white genocide, you ask? Too much bullshit. But hey man, maybe this is what the Illuminati wanted all along. To break men's pride, making them strive to fuck fat girls. To teach men a lesson about how women had to fuck men they didn't want to because of money. Now you might be thinking, that's just not what I'm attracted to. But you still get your dick wet, alright? But so what, right? So does a shower. But the shower won't give you as much exercise as hoisting a submarine. That's a lot of static strength. Since you ain't moving that shit, it's moving you. So one time, Roy was on top of Antonio Bigfoot Silva, raining down blows that went practically undefended. Like this fight was over. He was really not happy about ref Big John McCarthy taking too long to step in, so he has to keep hurting this guy. And it's made worse by the fact that spikes of adrenaline can make things seem like they're in slow motion. So in his head, he's probably thinking, for every punch I have to throw after this one, I'm gonna kick Big John's ass. Boop. Tank Abbott has been described as Roy Nelson but with no stamina or black belt. Basically, Tank's a barroom brawler who liked to show up to fights drunk. And he talked pretty tough, but sometimes it seemed like he was using his drinking as an oat in case he lost. Thing is, if you say that if you showed up sober and actually trained, you would have won the battle. It only means that because you made the choice not to, you also lost the war. Now with that all said, he was an entertaining guy to watch and brought a lot of fans to the sport in the early days. And for that, I can let it slide that he received a liver transplant due to his lifestyle choices. In general though, I'm not a fan of alcoholics. If you grew up in a home with a drunk parent, you probably realize that they have a strange aversion to just going to the bathroom like a normal person. Some of them have a bucket in the room, and some of them just piss their pants without even realizing it. So pretty soon, the whole house starts smelling like piss, including your clothes. So the kids at school are like, hey, is that a t-shirt or a p-shirt? You know what's messed up? Somehow, certain people with influence have managed to give the concept of self-criticism a negative connotation. It's important to criticize yourself, and harshly, otherwise, how can you have any accuracy about what's going wrong in your life? I mean, if you reject that tool from your belt, chances are you're going to be stuck as a loser forever, which is exactly the kind of thing that people in power want for the masses. Feelings really aren't nearly as important as just having a clear picture of things. Not bad for an old man. When Randy Couture got into MMA, he was already in his 30s, but he brought with him extensive amateur wrestling experience. His body was so used to the grind of training and competition that supposedly when he gets going, his lactic acid levels actually go down, and his left forearm especially has no quit to it. And speaking of endurance, that's one of the reasons why girth is so important. There's just more tissue to take abuse, so you can have a more fulfilling career. You know, this reminds me, back in high school, there was this tall, lanky black guy who had recorded himself having sex with this short redhead 
had girlfriend and put the video of it up on Pornhub. He ends up getting it spelled for it because he's underage. But anyways, the video circulates on Facebook. Everybody sees it, including myself. The first thing I thought was, what's he doing poking her with that carrot stick? His dick looks like a crane bobbing for fish. And like I said, she was short, you know, a small girl. You'd think that would make it look better. It just wasn't what I expected, basically. It got me thinking, you know, I think it's a forced meme that people use chode as an insult. And to those who aren't aware, a chode is a member that is thick and short. I mean, maybe it can't go that deep but it can rub every inch of those walls it can reach. Like you don't even need length to create a perfect seal and do that suction cup thing. And also, you barely even need any hip mobility. You could fuck from a wheelchair. I think the reason why the porn industry pushes the importance of length so much is that there's weird surgeries for that, like the one that killed that South African billionaire. Supposedly, there's even an extra three inches that go inside of your body that could be theoretically pulled out. But it doesn't take a friggin' biologist to realize that that's obviously the counterweight, for lack of a better term. So you go and pull that out, you might have a real knee knocker, but that's all it'll do. You lose those extra inches you just gained because you have to wield it with your hand now. So no more tap 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 on your belly balls and thighs. You got a big meaty fist between you now. In 2007, Couture walked away from the UFC with two fights still on his contract. His prime reason being he wanted a Fedor fight and the UFC didn't sign the guy. He spent $500,000 fighting Zufa in court over his breach of contract. Certain people were more than a little pissed considering Randy was the heavyweight champ at the time. Like geez Randy, at least they didn't make you wear one of these new belts, make your ass look like a discount Power Ranger. In the end, Randy signed a new contract with Zufa and let Fedor go. But at least he wasn't half as grumpy about the whole thing as Dana White. The only time that Randy Couture is ever a man is when he steps foot in that cage. Let me tell you about a man. A man picks his battles. For example, sometimes when you're dealing with women, it's best to admit that you're wrong, even when you're right. This is why men with strong egos and pride tend to divorce early, or just pretend that their wife doesn't exist. Now a man should step in when things start getting dangerous. What if your daughter started dating a loser? What if your kids start taking off for most of the night, and you don't have the first clue of where they go? Will you pick your battles? Or will you pick none? And then after the fact, after everything has gone to shit, point your finger at your kids. Show them what a big man you are, Captain Hindsight. And while I'm at it, on the more general topic of people who like to use ignorance as their excuse, choosing to remain ignorant, and then pleading ignorance when things go wrong, is just as bad as making the wrong choice knowingly. In fact, it's literally the same thing. Like, unless you're like a hot girl or something, trying to advertise her incompetence so a guy can feel like that's his way in, nobody wants to hear it. And you know what else? Delusional people who give in to some narrative because life is just too real otherwise. The funny thing though is I have to admit it can actually help you. For example, if you feel like the path to your goals in life is clear as a runway, you're gonna put in that work without a confused heart. But it's not like you can just snap out of it when it's convenient to do so. Instead, the most effective means of snapping out of it is when you finally get hurt. Jen's little evil pulver is known for the sprawl and brawl, meaning he uses his wrestling in order to keep the fight standing so he can gently pulverize his opponents on the feet. Another thing he's known for is heterochromia. He's got two different colored eyes, just like that chicken devil may cry. My grandmother is, is Nell Goldstein, the, the gunsmith that made all your fancy weapons that you got. Yeah, there she is! <laughs> <clears throat> So Jens clearly struggles with the emptiness and bitterness that comes with having grown up with a negligent and abusive drunk of a father. Spank me, punch me, and anything else. But I went to, he took me to do one thing. I went fishing with him once. Once. Oh, he never took me anywhere. That guy didn't teach me shit. I hate him. I hate him in a way most people couldn't even fathom. He even went so far as to try and abandon the Pulver name and join Bob Shamrock's clan. But Bob told him to get out there and make the Pulver name mean something. Part of me thinks that he just wasn't into the little guys. But yeah, a lot of fighters happen to have daddy issues. How can somebody be so close to you and just betray you in your time of need? I hate him that alcohol and cocaine and heroin and marijuana is all more important than your son. Who carries your name? But you know what? To all you guys out there who carry these terrible feelings, you don't have to just hold it in. You can put him in a shitty old folks home where he gets his fudge packed in by a male nurse and no one can hear him scream. Chris Lieben used to have a reputation as a drunk who could be a little dickish at times, but talk about his daddy and he becomes Chris Lebens wrong. Like, don't talk shit, you fatherless bastard. Chris, I'm back in here. It's the house. See, Chris never even met his dad until he was already 24. By that point, he's like, I don't need a deadbeat dad now. I already do enough drinking for the two of us. While his dad's all like, I don't know what your issue is. I've got nothing but good memories of our relationship because all I did was bust nuts in your mom. And by the way, there's different types of deadbeat dads out there. There is a kind that may be physically present at the house, but still refuses to do his duties as a father. The kind of man who doesn't even make sure to point out the importance of the two golden words. Teenage pussy. I mean, think about it. You've only got a couple years of potential access to the most pleasurable thing a man is programmed to seek after. A super fertile fresh womb. 
Any dad that would tell his son to focus on school instead of pussy and not give him money to get some is a deadbeat in disguise and deserves to be disowned. Like, you told me to pay attention to my education and to not get pussy as a teenager? Fuck you, father. I disown you. If you don't want to be my father figure, then don't be my father, because you're not. Fuck you, father. Give me cash for school, pussy. If you're going to bring a goddamn life into this miserable world, at least make it somewhat bearable. Disowned for not making it bearable. So Chris's dad pretty much literally broke his heart by proxy. His partying lifestyle had brought him to a point where his ticker was now so shitty that the doctors wouldn't even let him fight. So after taking a couple years off to really just do some clean living, Chris seems to be in a better place, and he's doing refing and bare knuckle boxing. You know, Joe Rogan has suggested that there should be height divisions in MMA, but I don't think that's necessary if you get rid of the gloves. With true bare knuckle, no padding, no wraps, no nothing, every punch comes with the cost of damaging your hands. So tall fakes can't just nonchalantly use boxing to maintain distance. Truth is, the gloves are a weapon. You can punch way harder with them, and with the wraps, it's like a softer knuckle duster. Take away the gloves, and every punch weakens as your bone structure softens with every blow. If it wasn't for the gloves, traditional martial arts would be popular again in combat sports. You'll see a lot more techniques being used in MMA, because people can no longer rely on just punching and running, or laying and praying. And it'll force people to move around a lot more, making it harder to gain distance for power shots like head kicks or overhands. Like, it would just look silly to see them maintaining so much distance when they're not throwing as many punches anymore. And you know what else? Ground game doesn't need to be boring. It's the gloves' fault. For the reasons I just described, without the gloves, people would start gassing out earlier in fights, which would allow for people to pull off more flashy submissions. Let me try and illustrate the situation a little better. A javelin gold medalist could easily dominate in MMA because of the gloves. You only need to teach them takedown defense, how to set up a straight right and overhand, and how to run away from their opponent, and they're set. They need only to run away while intercepting their opponent with jabs, and just waiting for them to walk into a straight or massive overhand, all made possible because with the gloves, you're able to throw a ridiculous amount of jabs without breaking down your hands. It's a lot like how wrestlers in MMA will throw a jab, followed by a single or a double. You know, even those big boxing gloves don't actually reduce much damage to the person getting hit, but they are highly visible. I mean, they look like something somebody would wear on a construction site to not get run over by a crane, and it makes them easy to telegraph. But with MMA gloves, nah, bruh, it's about the same visibility as a bare fist. So yeah, because of the gloves, people who use the jab to impose their strengths have a huge advantage. You don't even need to know much about martial arts. So the gloves need to go. And also, bare knuckle boxing sucks because they kept the hand wraps. Don the Predator Fry. Aside from the mustache, he's actually not very Predator-like. He's more like a bull moose in heat. I mean, he kind of looks like Dan Severn, except he'll tutor you with concussions. He developed this super patriot persona during his time as a gaijin wrestler in Japan. You see, this was right after 9-11, and Americans needed to prove that they could still get it up. I mean, how would you feel if out of nowhere, your 7-inch tower came down? Don is best known for his crazy fight with Yoshihiro Takayama. They just locked up and started blasting each other. It's like they were competing for the spotlight by doing a drum solo on their opponent's face. Don let it all hang out, including his mouthpiece. It's just too bad you can't fight like that and have a long career. By the time he fought Ken Shamrock, he was already on the downslide. But that's not the end of the cost he paid. He actually broke his back and had to have rods put in, which later also broke. And during the surgery to fix them, he had brain hemorrhaging, which left him in a coma for three weeks. He hasn't had it easy, once he even tried to suicide by cop. He's also one of those guys who went through a nasty divorce, and now says that if you can get the milk for free, why buy the cow? Truth be told, marriage is what a man offers to a woman when he can't afford to pay her to leave. For real, you'll think you're sly until you get fucking me too because you didn't pay up. And you know, there is a more sophisticated reason for why we like the kind of carnage that Don Fry put on. The real reason why MMA has such a strong appeal is because we're a tournament species. This means that we're always competing for mating rights, directly or indirectly. The game never ends. Even if you deny the game, you're really just working an angle because you can't deny your programming. And actual combat is a very direct, visceral, and potentially costly form of competition. So it can't help but resonate to us on that basic level. In team sports, sure, you get to show off your social coordination abilities, but the full weight of the situation situation is dispersed among the players. A fighter has no one to physically rely on to cover the weaknesses in there, so their skill has to be as complete as possible. So they have no one to really blame, and this round of the grand tournament is all on them. Another thing that results from us being a tournament species is that child labor laws are stupid. The main reason being that parents and children, by which I really mean fathers and sons, are instinctively not meant to live together after the child reaches sexual maturity. Because, again instinctively, the father starts to see his son as competition for pussy. So by the time a child finishes high school, a very critical time mostly due to child labor laws having gotten in the way of them establishing themselves in the workforce. You're not getting nearly the amount of support that you got when you were younger. Some parents even kick their kids out of the house at 18. So you can't live for free and save money. And even if they do let you stay, you'll start noticing that your dad secretly wants you to fail. Because, again, he sees you as competition for pussy. So child labor laws are ruining lives and tearing families apart. Hey, Tim House, taste my pee pee pee, okay? Andrei Arlovsky is another fighter with some wicked hands, but he's got one of those chins where he can be put down with a tickle. I mean, I see him doing a damn Blazarian, trying to hide his weak point. He who has a glass cannon better damn well throw the first stone, so he gets after it for better or for worse. 
Befitting his fighter nickname of the Pitbull, Andre actually has a pet Pitbull named Maximus, who has become his mascot. He's also done a PSA against dogfighting with Maximus, but it's like, is he for real, or did his dog just keep getting knocked out? Anyways, one of Andre's most entertaining fights was the lunch money fight from early on in his career. Just explaining it won't do it justice though, check it out. The discipline which is Thai boxing all over those trunks. Look at him pulling. Yeah, he should fall backwards into the guard and, and, and squeeze that off. Yes, you can see he has been working on his Thai boxing. Yeah. <laughs> a good blow there and he's continuing. Yeah, this fight could be over. I mean, yeah, it looks like it because he's in the, the infamous fetal position now and he's kicking upward. And this is looking a lot like a schoolyard brawl. Um, like it's this, this is the infamous lunch money fight. It looks like uh, at least one of them may be thinking about a submission. Don't know if he's going for it yet. Yeah, I, I can't see. It's an, a lag lock. But it's, it's so easy to escape also. Um, Dutchie. Okay, now has got the, uh, got, <laughs> got the rear mount. <laughs> what, 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 what position is this? Um, he's not committing to it yet. He may or may not be thinking about a submission hold. Oh, what a technical move there. Who knows what will happen next? And here the audience. Incident in UA's fighter nickname, Yamato Damashi, means Japanese fighting spirit. It's a word from long before the US had permanent military bases on their little island there, and it basically means fight to the death. This is my favorite quote by Ensign. You must be prepared to die as a man, so that you may live as one. And also, blood is just red sweat. What is a man who has nothing he would die for? Just a meh. Now back when Ensign was really active as a fighter, he wasn't the most skilled or talented. I'd say he had a chin though. The real reason why people remember Ensign's name is because he wasn't all talk with that warrior spirit stuff. During his most famous fight with Igor Vov Chanchin, who has very dangerous hands, Ensign first attempted a takedown but got shrugged off and ate a few hits. So what do you think he does? He abandons the takedown strategy, even though he's originally a jujitsu guy and he goes to war with Igor, and he keeps brawling with this monster for the entire 10 minute first round. Terrible strategy, beautiful hurt. And they had to stop it before the beginning of the second because his skull was fractured and his brain was swelling. He ended up spending six weeks in the hospital after that one. True to his word, Ensign was prepared to die in the ring, which is good because otherwise all that stuff he said would make him come off as a total cornball. Not many have the courage to actually live their life that way, and he gets mad respect, even from Yakuza. Only by death is a true warrior defeated. Only by death is a true victor crowned. Is the value of life that worthless to him? Is he implying that they're not worthy because they're still living? So are you warriors? Or simple cowards. We're both spent, Father. We don't have anything left to give. <laughs> <laughs> but you have your life to give, Bucky. You know what he kind of reminds me of, though, and it's not so good? Shonen anime. You see, the problem that I have with Shonen anime is the way that the main characters keep getting more forms, power ups, and harem girls, but without ever addressing their own personal flaws. Like, what kind of message is that sending kids? Like, sure, try hard and be bold, but don't ever think about all the ways that you're shooting yourself in the foot. If you try that shit in real life, you'll be lucky to have your flaws catch up to you real quick. You might actually make it and have it going on for a while, until one day you realize that your world is coming crashing down around you, and then you realize that it's because you've been fucking yourself in the foot this whole time, thinking you could get away with it. It's not like those animes where it's played off as comic relief. If you can't act right, the consequences will never be the same. You know, I often hear people, such as Joe Rogan, saying that people who make attacks, threats, and slurs on the internet should lose their anonymity and face punishment. Thing is though, even if that were to be made the case, there's ways around it. You could act just like them and be disingenuous with your intent. Like this fine specimen right here. So many people these days like to preach and virtue signal in order to manipulate and gain social status. It's my opinion that this tactic is a dangerous weapon and they should be held responsible for it. If they're gonna talk the talk, then they better walk the walk. If they don't, then their word should not be taken seriously. If they're not doing what they can personally, then they're not really about that shit, are they? Just imagine these guys trying to walk the walk with all the shit that they say. What a painful life that would be. Actually taking action on everything that they say that they care about. They think they're smart doing what they do, but really they're pretty stupid to put themselves in that position. If I was a person with influence, I wouldn't show signs of caring about anything unless I really plan to take action. That's just placing weight on your shoulders for no good reason. It's like the samurai code. Words should be like iron. Speaking and action should be the same thing. And when you say you'll do something, it's as good as done. 
people who wield influence have no excuse in not backing up their words with action. With that in mind, it's illogical to try and win brownie points by attacking someone like me on my channel, when there's so many better targets out there, like YouTube CEO Susan Wojcicki. If you want to bark out ideas, cool, but do it to someone with real influence, like Susan, because I have none. If you only went over to Susan's channel, she would most likely see your cries for help, because she has barely any subscribers. Susan has expressed many times that she wants the world to be more egalitarian. Well, I have a suggestion. Seeing as she's Jewish, she should get her own people to take in all the African females wishing to escape from genital mutilation. Another reason why most immigrants to Israel should be black women is because a large percentage of the US military is made up of black women. Israel has benefited greatly from them joining the forces, so I would say they've earned it. So they should take them in. It's just like how Sergey Brin and Larry Page, the founders of Google, traveled to India to find talent. It's quite obvious that the company has benefited greatly from Indian talent. Just look at how many Indians they have on the payroll. For example, blacks are a significant portion of the population in the United States. Indians less so, whereas at Google, blacks make up only 1.5% of the company, while Indians make up a high estimate of 20%. So clearly, Google is getting something of value out of its Indian employees. So it only makes sense that Sergey, who is also Jewish, should use his influence to help Indian men migrate to Israel. This world is about give and take, not take and take. And there's more to it. Africa will soon become an economic powerhouse in the world, simply because their landmass is so huge. And in this world, you really only need a few things to survive. It's only a matter of time until Africa advances in agriculture technology. So unless somebody's racist, there's no good reason to not take black women in in mass. There's so much to gain, and barely anything to lose, because it's simply destiny that Africa's population will soon explode. So it's about time they decided what kind of relationship they want to have with the continent next door. By the way, Sergei is the ex-husband of Anne Wojcicki, 23andMe co-founder and sister to Susan. Now, moving Indian men and a lot of African women in Israel will create a gender imbalance with more women in both Israel and India. This imbalance will destroy misogyny in both countries because there's power in numbers. Single desperate Indian men are the reason why Google became so successful in the first place. So Sergey owes it to them to create this gender imbalance in India so they can finally get some pussy. And you know, in terms of influence, YouTube could actually overtake Google. You see, because of screen glare, people hate learning by text or having to do their research on Google, making the audio part of YouTube very attractive. And believe me, as a guy who does a lot of research, I know. So I just don't need to be like by a blonde haired blue eyes white dragon. That's literally the most privileged Yu Gi Oh card. This guy had the gall to call me a misogynist on my miss video. Actually, I'm a feminist. I believe in illegal immigration because ugly girls need dick too. I got your back, ugly girls. This channel don't fucking discriminate. Say it with me now. Borders are for hoarders. By the way, Donald Trump has stated many times that he's in support of the death penalty, but in my opinion, that's one of those things that just shouldn't exist because it reeks of corruption. Unless people in government also get executed, and in public, it should not exist. It might even help to keep them in check somewhat, but unless people in government also get some, it's not really about justice, is it? It's just a flux of power. Igor Vov Chanchin didn't just throw hands good, he threw legit combinations. My sixth grade teacher would always say that if you start acting up in his class, there's gonna be two sounds, him hitting you and you hitting the floor. While Igor doesn't let motherfuckers off that easily. Igor is the reason why I still think a legit, pure boxer would still do very well in modern MMA. Like sure, there's an obvious strategy for beating a boxer, but everybody's got a plan. You know the rest, until they get turned into a bobblehead and fall down. You know how they say that fists never run out of ammo? Well, neither do faces. Igor's fists have taken so much damage from the normal force of his own punches that he had to retire at just 32. I mean, sure, that's actually a pretty good age for most pro sports, but MMA is special. There's just so many ways to go about things, and frankly, there's a lot of weak divisions to get involved in. So so there's quite a story about Igor from his early days. Back in the early 90s, he went to prison to fight a Ukrainian mob boss who went by the name of Baton. Apparently, Baton, who was some sort of European boxing champion, liked to spend his free time in prison, but he got bored. So he got some of his people to offer Igor a lot of money to smuggle himself into the prison and do the fight. So Igor whooped that ass, got paid, and regained his freedom. Kinda reminds me of those Yakuza games. Which by the way, did you know that the Nigerian Mafia is very active in Japan now? They're selling girls, heroin, and doing all kinds of scams. And get this, the police don't want to go after them because they're scared of being labeled racist by the Nigerian embassy. And with that, I think we can now say that Japan is now officially a white country. A lot of these Nigerians actually work as the street level guys for the Yakuza families, which acts as a loophole of sorts because the Japanese government declared that they'll crack down on Yakuza, but they don't want to be racist. Just like in the West, where a lot of black drug pushers are actually working for white organizations. And I mean, for contrast, let's look at China. They got about 10,000 Nigerians, just the right number to lynch over a long weekend if they start pushing drugs on kids and shit. So yeah, the Japanese are no longer honorary because they now follow ancient European traditions. But speaking of fighting in prison, you know, I support the idea of prison MMA, where if you can keep winning, you can eventually earn your freedom. You know, the way we're wired, we're more motivated to avoid a bad outcome, which at least on an instinctual
sinks to a level could mean a threat to our survival, then we are to seek a good one. So a lot of people would actually fight harder just to avoid having to bend over and cough than they would for a belt and a bunch of money. You know what else I think should happen? The victim of a convicted rapist should be able to choose a champion who will fight their assailant on their behalf, and if they win, push back their scheduled release date. And this can keep repeating, so they'll never get out unless they can beat the victim's champion. Kazuyuki, old Ironhead Fujita, is best known for his iron head. To quote Kaz, I'm not so great a puncher, nor so great a kicker, but in today's Valet Tudo, the strongest is the one who can take abuse. I mean, he's better at taking a knee than broken white people. Like some people got a football helmet for his skull, this guy's got a bomb shelter. So Kaz started off as a wrestler, nearly making it to the Olympics. Then he got into pro wrestling and later MMA under Antonio Inoki. Since he was too old by this point to really compete in MMA, a lot of people think Inoki was living vicariously through Kaz. As much as I've searched for it, I've never seen him slap the man. Meanwhile, Lyoto Machida gets full on punched in the face. Lyoto has also trained under Inoki. You know, it's like the Shamrock Brothers. There can only be one Batman. Oh my god! The atomic butt drop! Mark Hunt was first scouted into fighting right after knocking out multiple people outside of a nightclub. And I mean, just look at the guy. He's got power and a chin of granite. He's genetically built to scrap. In Japan, they gave him his nickname of the Super Samoan because of his heritage and because he's a Dragon Ball Z fan. But he's actually just an average Samoan with blonde hair. You know, I don't get why they don't let Goku age in that show. I do get that Roshi won't allow himself to die because he never got any teen pussy. Like, if they could just put Goku on the decline, they could stop making the new bad guy a thousand times stronger than the last. Then maybe some of the other characters could finally escape reaction shot hell. So, Mark has earned himself another nickname, the King of Walk-Offs. Like the person with more leverage in a relationship, he's always the first to know when it's over. Kung Lee grew up as a refugee from the Vietnam War and basically became a California immigrant kid. Kind of like the Karate Kid, but with Sanda. Well actually, if you want to say he's a Sanda guy, then I'm a Panda guy, because I couldn't give a fuck. Yeah, he won some Sanda competitions, but Taekwondo was his real base. With his abilities, it's a shame he only got into MMA later in life though. Kung's greatest strength was actually his strike timing, which allowed him to land some badass kicks, including spinning back kicks, spinning wheel kicks, and even the odd axe kick. To put that into perspective, kicks are about twice as telegraphed and half as fast as punches. You really gotta feel the moment. Just like he felt the right moment to transition into a movie career. You know, so much of life is about timing, but also momentum. You know, a lot of people have parents that don't love them enough to tell them this, but it's a complete forced meme that people who enjoyed high school become losers later in life. Like it makes no goddamn sense. You think having strong social skills and being popular and connected is gonna hurt you later on? Like you think Bill Gates is some kind of nerd Rocky? He comes from a rich family that includes banker Jews. Like personally, fuck the media. How many Rocky stories do you really know? How many kids do you know that were given lots of support by their parents and had a good time growing up but they're miserable today? The only examples I can think of involve a lot of drugs. I used to work with this 50 year old guy doing hard labor for 13 bucks an hour. It was a low point for me. For him though, it was a goddamn bottomless chasm. Around the age of 20, this guy had inherited a $2 million house in the country and $3 million of just money. Problem was, his parents never gave him no structure and he had no discipline about money. So by his early 30s, he had lost it all, including the house. And all he wanted to do was relive those party days. He might very well be dead today, but when I knew him in his late 40s, he would brag about how he ate a tub of ice cream every night for supper, but stayed skinny. But me and the other boys there knew that it was because he was constantly taking uppers, meaning amphetamines, and possibly even cocaine. He looked about 15 years past his age, and his immune system was crapping out on him. He would call in sick with pneumonia, but by the evening, his neighbors would once again complain about him blasting loud music all night. You know, I told him that he should probably eat a fucking vegetable or something, but maybe living in the past is the only thing that keeps the guy going. So yeah, I would say it's just degeneracy that really messes up the lives of some people who got to enjoy high school, which only most likely means that their parents weren't actually putting in 100%. I'm just sick of people trying to twist up reality, you know? There's some dick shit dads out there who really believe that the kids should be able to pull off a great life starting with barely any resources. Reminds me of those Grand Theft Auto games, where if you didn't have any money, you could just go bug some hookers and drug dealers to get you started. Well, in real life, you'd be a lot more likely to be the one selling your ass or some dope when caught in that situation. You know, I laugh at guys who say they won't suck a dick, even for a million dollars, but they just don't understand how easy that is to say in the relatively cozy circumstances. Like, dude, if you get stuck out on the streets for three months, you'll be wishing you could go back to the cozy thought of getting more than five bucks. But yeah, it's like some people have this idea in their head of how things are supposed to be done all along. How you're supposed to be able to pull everything off with no resources. They even throw around a word like tradition. And they're right. Or rather, I understand their delusions. They've crafted a fantasy world that somebody like me or you can't shake. Kevin Ferguson, better known as Kimbo Slice, was a bodyguard, a limo driver, and all-around golem for the porn company Reality Kings. Somehow, this led him into the underground fighting scene, which made him e-famous. And you know, he never played the pizza boy. The reason they call him Slice is because of what he did to his opponent's face in his most famous fight. So before his 15 minutes of fame was up, Kimbo decided he would make a splash in MMA, and he was trained by none other than Bass Rutan. He started getting some first round finishes, but you know, Kimbo came into this as a novelty, a seat filler. Are you picking up what I'm putting down here? After his first loss via TKO to Seth Patrizelli, Seth later claimed that the organization they were fighting under 
Ali Daxi had hinted to him that he should keep the fight standing. Although he would later change the story, like, oh, I meant something else by that. See, Kimbo was still pretty new to the whole MMA thing, so if he was taken down out of his element, he would lose quickly. Funnily enough, a lot of people think that the reason that organization ended up going under is because Kimbo lost anyways. So with that much at stake, you gotta give them credit for not paying Seth to throw the fight entirely. Kimbo's next big move, while he was still somewhat culturally relevant, was to try and get into the UFC through their feeder reality program called the Ultimate Fighter. So he lost his first fight to Roy Nelson, which should have got him cut. He pulled out of his second fight due to an injury, which should have got him cut. And then they bring him back again to fight in the finale. They barely did any fighting at all. The UFC is just like, eh. You're in. Then he loses his first fight as an official member of the UFC roster and gets cut. It's like, goddamn, you fucked up the integrity of your show and put on one of the most boring fights ever to bring him in here. But apparently, lining up a couple cans is a bridge too far. Kimbo's very last fight was against Dada 5000. I'm gonna obliviate this dude. You got baby nuts, Dada. So these guys put on all this banter, but it's like they were expecting two other guys to do the fight. Going through the KFC drive through and having more kids does not count as cardio. Just ask Dada. He had a heart attack that night and fucking died. He was in the hospital by then, so they brought him back. But Still, he went in there ready to die for his lack of discipline. And after the fight, Kimbo got popped for the steroid Nandrolone. So he went in there thinking he could just roid himself up a gas tank. You know who Kimbo kind of reminds me of? The Beast, Bob S. Sapu. Bob Sapu! Listen up here. Hey! They may call you Kid Dynamite. You mess with me, I'll put your fuse out. Sign the contract, big boy. Sign the contract. <laughs> You know, Mike Tyson has complained about not getting at least a blowjob for all his hard work. But I think that's pure entitlement issues. Since it's a job, isn't a free blowjob volunteer work? Those two didn't actually end up fighting, by the way. But the reason why Dada was Kimbo's last fight is because Kimbo died from a heart attack at the age of 42. Now, you might be thinking that's young, but it's like he's been 42 for like 14 years now. Jose Consenco is a guy who managed to achieve one version of the American meme. As an immigrant, he managed to become a big shot America ball player number 33. So what does he do to show his gratitude? He turns around and writes a book where he snitches like crazy about all the steroid use in the league. More importantly, he wrote that the league itself has a wink and a nudge, look the other way approach to the topic. The basic idea is that enhanced athletes improve the entertainment value of the sport, and Jose agreed with that sentiment. That is, until he started flip-flopping on the topic. I don't know who talked to him, because he wasn't shook when he got blacklisted from the league. You know, when it comes to topics surrounding the third world, I keep hearing about this contaminated drinking water issue. But has it ever occurred to these people trying to do something about it, to teach these third world not to shit where they eat. Anybody with half a brain already knows that there's steroids in all pro sports. Here's Dan Sever. And I, I take more respect from someone that will simply just flat out admit to it. You know, it's, it's you know, people, it, and don't get me wrong, steroids are in all sports. Find me an NFL football player that isn't. And I mean, for many guys, they start taking their super vitamin shots in high school. You know what makes it really obvious, though, is when one of these top athletes is out partying every weekend. By the way, when I said that people who say that if you take steroids and don't do the work, you'll look like shit are full of crap, I forgot about Tim Sylvia, the sole exception. The guy took steroids purely to improve his looks, and he still looked like an April snowman. So why am I talking about Jose? In 2009, he fought the ginormous Hungman Choi. He did all right using hit and run tactics, but those weren't fight finishing punches. There was no home base to run to this time. Like a severely autistic man trying to get laid, the effort itself was the glory. Random task. Joe San, who you see here getting ball punched by Keith Hackney, liked to represent his religion. Some people feel the need to virtue signal a little harder than others, you know? He also played the henchman Random Task in an Austin Powers movie, where he was defeated through the tactical use of a penis pump. In real life though, forget about the penis pump, this position alone would make his fat little dick fully erect. You see, he almost got away with participating in a brutal rain grave. It had taken so long before they finally stumbled onto him as a DNA match for the crime that the statute of limitations had passed. So instead, they just put him away on torture, which doesn't have such limits, and he would go on to kill his cellmate. I can't help but wonder if this is what Bobby Lee would be like if he found Jesus. Walking around like you're morally superior, just cause you and your priest jerk off over the same sick shit. You remember my friend who booted Meth Rambo? Well, me and him would often walk around town back in my school days, cause there was fuck else to do. So one day, this religious guy came up to us and he's like, you're going to hell boys, you're going to hell. He obviously thought we were gay together, and it's like, what the fuck, we're just walking here. But in retrospect, it might have been because of a little routine of ours. Whenever I would do something to piss my buddy off, which I did often, he would start screaming in the streets, sassy loves big black cock. And if I really ticked him off, he started doxing me while he's at it, giving out my full name and my home address and stuff. And it's a small town, so you know, I'm just the black cock guy now. Marius Pajanowski was strongman champion for quite a while, so he decides to get into MMA. The first fight I saw of him against Tim Sylvia, he became a shade of purple that's only good for making fine wine and heart attacks. Clearly, he didn't have the right stat allocations for this sport, but he stuck with it, killed some gains to have a gas tank, and now he barely even looks like he's trying to club people with his massive baby arms anymore. It got me thinking though, maybe somebody should just create a berserker league with like 30 second rounds. Even some 
drunk dad bod asshole ready to puke up some chicken wings could go hard for 30 seconds. So it'd be like an amateur league. You see, the thing with cardio is a lot of it is actually just learning how to breathe good and being efficient with your movements. And also things like controlling your nerves well enough that you don't have an adrenaline dump and blow your load before you even get in the cage. Things like this mostly come with experience and not just pretending to be some bullshit ass persistence hunter. It's called a snare, okay? It's called a bow. It's called buffalo drop. It's called get your spear tucker friends together and see what's on the menu. Big brain moves for big brain dudes. What kind of idiot is going to run after a gazelle all day until it drops dead from heat exhaustion? And then you got to drag it all the way back to camp before the hyenas show up to steal your kill. But then again, maybe it is true and that's why they're always laughing at us. Gary Big Daddy Goodridge is best known for that time he put Paul Herrera in a crucifix and rained elbows. Originally, he was just going to use a wrist lock on the guy, but then someone went and told him that Paul was a white supremacist. You know, it's like, how can people keep seeing white supremacy and everything, but they can't see that Paul Herrera already died for their sins. So back when he was doing Valet Tudo in Brazil, Gary did what he had to do. He was grabbing himself some balls, and one time he even straight up shoved his foot into a guy's trunks. You know, I think this is why there's not so much emphasis on ground game in, for example, traditional Chinese martial arts. There's so many weak points on the body that are exposed when you're up close like that. You could gouge their eyes, reef on their balls, or shove your fingers up their nose all the way. The submissions you see in MMA today is just the PG-13 stuff. When Antonio Minotaro Nogueira was 10 years old, he got run over by a truck. He was in a coma for four days, and he lost a chunk of his liver, but he gained a fierce determination. Most of Noguera's wins are by decision. The decision to not give up. I mean, he's taken some ridiculous beatings from top tier guys, and even when he couldn't turn it around, he remained dangerous to the very end. No matter how much you kick him while he's down, he burns hotter and more vengefully than flaming dog shit. There are many tribes out there that have a passage of manhood which involves tremendous pain or danger. These rites help to build a sense of community, but I think that on a more individual level, these and similar rituals, as well as actual unstructured hardships, create a positive reference point, which you can look back on in future times of strife, like a misery checkpoint. Now funnily enough, his little brother Antonio Minotaro Noguera has a reputation for pulling out of fights due to injuries. It's as if they have some kind of Brazilian voodoo contract going on, where little Nog takes on all the damage for the both of them, so big Nog can live his dreams to the fullest. What a guy. You know, speaking of Noguera's incredible pain tolerance, it's basic instinct for people, especially women, to want the weak to fail in life. In other words, not pass on their presumably shitty genes. And even among those who can somewhat see past their basic instincts, they want the weak to fail as well out of pity. I mean, this world isn't getting any easier to live in. Maybe easier to survive. Maybe. If you're the result of, to give an example, some ignorant ass asshole boomer who took advantage of prosperous times to pass down his weak genes. If you don't have the ability to adapt and fight for yourself in this world, odds are life's just gonna keep fucking with you till you die. It's gonna be a complete goddamn misery. All you're gonna leave behind is poetry about traveling back in time and chopping your dad's balls off. Yoel Romero is from Cuba, and he got off the island by inflating his raft as it were and it's selling at wrestling. I mean, I don't know for sure, but he's in his 40s now. By the way, real Cubans don't look like Al Pacino. Havana, Montana has a lot of those West African genes, meaning he has a lot of power type muscle fibers. I mean, sure, Italians have Rocky Marciano, but in the end of the day, Yoel is one type of black guy and they're another. So Yoel is big on religion. Go for Jesus! No forget Jesus, people! and he's loving everybody. You know, I said something about love and hate years ago that I now realize was wrong. Love and hate are not two sides of the same coin. If you really think about it, the definition of love is so vague that it has no real meaning. It's similar to the modern day concept of freedom, which nowadays is associated with these things called rights, which don't even really exist. They're just memes. Real freedom though is at least easy to understand. It means nobody's hindering your privilege. In other words, instead of making some vague promises, they instead step out of the way of your success. For example, by removing regulations that cripple small businesses. So get that right shit out of my face. And you know what, just get out of my face. I want privilege. Now let's say that God created man and gave him free will. Well, the reason for that could only be so that he could shift the blame for his mistakes on us. If you buy into the force memes and believe that you have freedom, it's the same concept. It's an effective tool for shifting the blame. It keeps victims as victims because they blame themselves instead of the actual perpetrators. Brazil is a land of hidden dangers. In the rivers, there's piranhas with razor teeth. On the freeways, you might meet with favela outriders. And behind McDonald's, you might find a Brazilian wandering spider handing out Cialis and telling everyone it's normal. But under a bridge somewhere, there's one legendary animal that you'll have to give an arm and a leg just to get away from. Ruzamir Paul Harris, the interior crocodile alligator. Ruzamir grew up knowing hard times and hard labor. But don't feel bad for him yet. You see, he's a very aggressive fighter and good at landing submissions, especially leg submissions. But he gets all lizard brain about it. 
Sometimes he doesn't stop cranking, even when his opponent's tapping and the ref's trying to pull him off. So if Ruzimir gets any kind of hold on your leg, you better start tapping right then or there. And I hope you call the cops or maybe animal control 20 minutes ago, because Herb Dean can't save you. One time, he kept cranking on Jake Shield's arm after the tap and got punched for it, but then they made Jake answer for the punch in court. I think they gave him community service or something. If only that punch had knocked him out, they could have made him release that legendary beast into the Florida wilds to be with his kind. You love fighting? No, I don't love fighting. It's a living hell. Don't be scared, homie. <laughs> Stockton. Okay, Stockton, California. Nick Diaz says he grew up being made fun of in school because they had put him on meds for being disruptive in class. You see, he had moved from a ghetto school in Stockton to a more preppy one in Lodi as a result of his mom losing her house. But he never really fit into either. He was kind of a tweener. He says he landed himself a pretty hot girlfriend though, but her ex-boyfriend kept trying to instigate guys on the football team and shit to fight Nick. Where I come from, you know, people like that get slapped. So Nick was busy getting in all sorts of fights, proving whatever it is he's got to prove. That girlfriend of his though, she wasn't having the easiest time herself, and she ends up walking onto a freeway. She had done this before, but wouldn't be doing it again. Nick says this is the moment that turned him into an adult real fast. In his first pro fight, which he won, all he could think about was the promise that he had made to her to succeed as a fighter. People don't understand, like, like you want to, you know, you want to come into this, like, with a nice wife and a nice life. I'm like, motherfucker, I didn't get none of that. I don't get to go home to my nice wife and nice life. And if you're doing that every day and you're putting all that effort into your nice wife, I, I'm putting 100% into what I do. I'm going to fuck your whole world up right in front of your nice wife and your nice life. There's nothing more noble and beautiful than a warrior with no distractions. One could say that he's the closest thing to God. So Nick, along with his brother, has a pretty unique striking style. He likes to keep his hands far apart and away from his body. It's a gutsy style that he uses to land punches and bunches and to parry attacks. The real secret to his style though is triathlons and weed. He uses the herb to numb himself to maximize his cardio gains. That way he can set a steady but grueling pace on the stand up that causes his opponents to fade. And when they do, that's when he starts throwing the heavy punches to put them away. Up until then, it's little bee stings and Stockton slaps. You know, if you've ever really been slapped before, you know that it's not like what they portray in the movies. I say so because I have. I got surprise slapped by a woman one time over, let's call it a misunderstanding, and I had to bite down hard on my impulse to put it right into the wall. It's like she slapped the mask of mumbo jumbo onto me. It took me about a half hour to really calm down, and by then I was exhausted. So I can only imagine how draining it would be to get slapped randomly by this guy who's talking all kinds of trash. In order to love fighting, I... You gotta love it so you want it so bad that you're pushing yourself to those limits to where you just simply hate it. And if you ain't there to where you hate it, then good luck trying to love this. Wise words here by Nick. I mean, can you really love something if you never get tortured by it? It's a four letter word after all. Hey, I'm not surprised, motherfuckers. <laughs> Both Diaz brothers are jiu-jitsu masters under Caesar Gracie, but Nick's little brother Nate actually goes to it more to finish fights. Apparently, he got roped into this whole thing in the first place because the local jiu-jitsu club would give the brothers free burritos for training with them. For two boys being raised by a single mom in the hood, sounds like a pretty sweet deal to me. But as for his MMA career, Nate has long felt that he hasn't been paid right for the work that he's put in. I don't even know why I'm doing this anymore because I feel like I get paid way too much money but not enough. And, uh... According to Dana White, it's because he's just not a needle mover compared to a guy like Conor McGregor. So what does he do? He starts taking advantage of his post-fight interviews. Yeah, Conor McGregor, you're taking everything I work for, mother... I'm gonna fight your... No longer is he one of those, oh, I'll fight anybody they want to put in front of me, guys. I think the reason so many fighters do that is because, you know, they've just been through a lot. All they want right now is a break from this tension and to eat an entire birthday cake. But too bad. Nate gets it now. And I like how he went with the whole gangster angle when he challenged Jorge Ponytail Masvidal. But there ain't no gangsters in this game anymore. There ain't nobody who done it right but me and him. So I know my man's a gangster, but he ain't no West Coast gangster. You know, these brothers' overall attitude, conversely, somehow makes me think about stupid people who only remember that life is unfair when there's hard times. And also, how your sense of fear isn't working right if it doesn't include foresight. The name of the game is survival, and if you can wrap your head around that, you'll understand why the grind never ends. Now, Conor McGregor is a guy who naturally knows how to make money with his mouth. You smell fear mm -hmm. in him. Yes, it is a beautiful aroma that arouses me. These custom-made suits aren't cheap. This solid gold pocket watch Three people died making this watch, you know what I mean? And you know that because when he was truly huge, you could always see him hanging out with Dana White. 
just like Ronda Rousey. Although I have heard rumors that they didn't get there using their mouths in quite the same way. Just joking guys, Ronda has terrible head movements. So Connor's got that Irish wit to him, and you might think that there's nothing that could slow him down or shut him up, but you'd be wrong. You ain't no man, you took welfare. Okay, don't then, talk, then don't what, talk then about what, money. Don't then you talk happened, about money. Then, then, then you took, wasn't you took money there. from single moms. Single moms go on welfare, not men. So why am I not surprised that the fighter community has a lot of sympathy for single moms? But hey man, at least he was taking food off the plates of potential future competition. And besides, he's from the EU. Somebody needs to pay for all my yeah. children. So Mystic Mac, as they call him, effortlessly dethroned Jose Aldo, who had been champion of his division for 10 years. All it took was a little love tap. A lot of people think it was just Connor's trash talk that got into Aldo's head. Because, I mean, look at this old man, even. He took it like a champ. You know, in Brazil, they make regular use of pesticides that are banned in the EU, and even in the US. The group behind these lax laws is the Brewerista Bancada, meaning the agribusiness lobby of Brazil, many members of which are wealthy landowners. And many of them make a good profit dealing with US and German companies, such as PHW Group, which imports soy from Brazil. By the way, did you know that pesticides can have estrogenic effects? But anyways, according to a study done from 2013 to 2015, about 20 percent of food tested in Brazil had pesticide residue over the legal allowed limit and or contained outright banned pesticides. Now generally speaking, pesticides are fat soluble and since your brain is made up of fatty acids, they accumulate there where they cause seizures, changes in behavior, and just all sorts of issues. Now the first guy to beat Connor on the big stage was Habib Nurmagomedov, a Muslim from Dagestan, which is in the North Caucasus region. This is what real Caucasians look like. This dude was wrestling bears as a child, so this dolly throwing mouthy Irishman was within his capacity. Now I talked about how fighters should be taking their opportunities when given the mic. Well, when Habib felt like he was getting some resistance from the organization, he damn near started kissing babies. He was campaigning so hard for his title shot. After this fight, don't send me your bullshit fake contract. You know I deserve this. You have to send me real contract. Well, the real title contract. This is number one bullshit. Hey guys, Irish only six million. Russian, 150 million. Habib, along with some other fighters like Frank Mir, have been criticized for being close with Ramzam Kadyrov, the leader of Chechnya. You see, Kadyrov is in support of children's MMA. And the thing about children's MMA in low inhibition countries is that through natural selection, they will breed stronger men for white women to mate with. Another thing about Kadyrov is that he ripped off what that Iranian guy said. What, gays? We don't have those here. In Iran, we don't have homosexuals like in your country. You know, I think the Spartans make a great example for fighters because of the emphasis that they placed on sick burns. They did it for the glory though. For Connor, it's only business. But he does have great talent for it. Other fighters have tried to copy him with often cringeworthy results. You just can't teach how to lay on a burn, like a true fire crotch. Charles Crazy Horse Bennett dropped out of high school to focus on selling drugs, also fighting. He was born athletically talented, and his specialty is to land some crazy technique to finish the fight. The thing is though, he doesn't tend to throw these techniques as part of a combination, so he leaves himself wide open if it doesn't work. But anyways, on the topic of drug dealers, the way they tend to operate, especially around kids who might not have it all going so well at home, they start off by acting all buddy-buddy, very agreeable. No matter what kind of stupid nonsense you might tell them, they'll agree with you 100%. You know, for most people, that would be a pretty big red flag, but a lot of these kids are starved for approval. You know, they want to find a place where they can fit in. But to best explain how it actually goes down, I'll tell you a story. So I used to work as part of a two-man team with this guy who would constantly talk about his exploits with women. Like as we're driving through town, he's pointing at houses like, oh, I've had her a few times. That one's a freak. That one will abduct you. And the thing is, that town is a total sausage fest. So if he wasn't full of shit, that means he was one of the few guys actually getting some. He was actually married to a woman 22 years younger than him, so he had something going on. Now, I'm sure he could tell that I was thirsty like a camel with a flat back. So maybe that's why he kept bringing up the topic of women. But it also took a weird turn sometimes. He'd talk about this other team of two guys that would probably be banging each other. One of them was this older guy with a half scrunched up Popeye face and a glass eye. And the other younger guy was like this skinny hillbilly twink. Every time I saw this guy, he was shirtless and running his hands across his chest in a sensual manner. I tended to circle around him like a boxer or something because it made me uncomfortable whenever he faced me directly. So we're talking about these guys and he's like, man, being gay might actually be all right. I like it when girls play with my butthole. You should try it sometime. Now, as time went on, he started to offer me free hash, which is like a processed form of cannabis, basically, a little stronger. But the thing is, by then, he had already slipped up and revealed to me that he makes good money selling oxys as a side hustle. So no wonder that hash was free. And I already knew another guy at that job who he was bestest buddies with, and I wasn't jealous. I knew his game, but you know what? Eventually, I smoked some hash with him anyways. 
It was a long shift. But he knew that I knew, that he knew, that I knew. But he also knew that I was thirsty. He started dropping little hints that he could hook me up, you know? Even suggesting that I could get with this virgin girl. So one day, we come across a female friend of his, or should I say client. So she and my drug dealer coworker are catching up or whatever. Then all of a sudden, she comes up to me. And she was flirting hard. Like, I was doing something physical, and she was like, I want you to throw me around like that. You know, I'm not the worst looking guy in the world. I'm not even the second worst looking. But I've never had a girl come up to me and talk to me like that before. I didn't know how to act. I smiled back, but I knew if I opened my mouth, I'd say something retarded to ruin everything. So play cool sassy. So she goes back to her boyfriend who turns out to be that guy who's standing 10 feet away. He doesn't even look mad in the slightest though. Like I said, that place is a sausage fest. You got all kinds of weird half-assed relationships going on. So later, my drug dealer co-worker, we'll just call him DD, starts telling me that she's blowing up his phone asking about me. Now he had already tried asking me to come over to his backyard to have a campfire and smoke hash with the boys, but I didn't take the bait. So this was his new angle to give him some leverage over me, and eventually I did start to cave to it. I'm like, just fucking give her my number or give me hers, whatever. And what about that virgin QT though? He's like, no. She uses her boyfriend's phone. That'll never work. But I'll tell you what. She's gonna be over here tonight, but she wants to know what your dick looks like before she can decide. So why don't you send me a picture of your erect penis so she can decide? So I'm like, so you want my dick on your phone? Dee Dee's like, yeah, so she can decide. I'm like, that's gay, bro. Why don't I just come over and show her in person? God damn it. He's like, oh yeah, that is kind of gay. Well, it's getting late and she's heading home. Good night. Now, if this was like middle school me and someone started playing games with me like that, I don't think I would be able to see through it fast enough. I'd be tricked into sending dick pics to a grown ass man because some cute girl winked at me. That is until my heroin addiction gets me to a point where I can't even get it up anymore. Maybe then he'd just throw me away, like what happens with so many young girls who get drugged up, used, and burnt out in a few years. Do you want to know the real secret to ending white genocide? It has to do with the public school system, where teachers are paid to turn a blind eye to sketchy activity. Like when I was in school, they virtue signaled non-stop about having a zero tolerance policy, but that was just not the reality. For one thing, they had these designated smoking areas. And you know, the truth is, in reality land, cannabis isn't the gateway drug. Cigarettes are. It's through these smoking corners that criminals can tell which families have discipline, so that they don't cause a scene going for the wrong people. Now, if you want to talk about white genocide, homicide statistics barely matter. It's drugs that cause the most deaths and the most degeneracy, and the most burnt out useless people in between. When they say that homeless people are homeless because of mental illness, that's being disingenuous. Their illness is caused in the first place by drug abuse. Now, here's my solution. First, you gotta understand that kids are far more vulnerable than adults to predatory drug dealers. It all starts in school, and most schools in this day and age have security cameras installed. So, they just need to add more cameras and to change the concept a little bit. Instead of just having a feed to the principal office, create a mobile app so the parents can keep tabs on their kids through their smartphones. It's the current year, people. We have the technology. Desks and lockers could also be bugs so that parents could listen in on what's going on. You see, the biggest problem with the public school system is that their influence overrides that of the child's parents for most of the day, which inevitably leads to things like drug dealer Chad turning your daughter into a prostitute. So, if you have lots of these cameras linked to parents' smartphones with the ability to play back footage, it would allow parents to negate the majority of negative influence on their kids, and crime would take a massive hit. Because, again, it's not easy for drug dealers to target adults. I've seen autistic dealers try to sell drugs to adults who weren't already addicts, and they just end up getting their asses beat by multiple guys. Guys. That's why in Montreal, for example, they flooded the place with black people who were already addicts in order to maintain their power and influence, which is causing the white population to die off from degeneracy. In Montreal, the actual French people barely go outside anymore, and the rich ones who are all planning to move all look ashamed. They're all like, how did it turn out this way? But really, the frogs should have moved out sooner, but they got slow boiled. And it's really white on white crime when it comes down to it, guys. Now you might be saying you could just homeschool your kids, but that ain't realistic in this era where usually both parents have to work just to maintain. And besides, it's crazy to think that you're capable of teaching a child when the majority of teachers out there can barely do so. But I do think that people should slowly move into online learning, which would create a lot of jobs, as well as hands-on educational centers, so kids can get hands-on experience in the jobs they're interested in. This will also create some jobs. This will destroy some teaching jobs, but it'll take time to implement, so it's not a threat to the current teacher pool. Now here's another angle to see things from. It's a given that most hookers are addicted to drugs. If they weren't, hookers would own everything in society, and women would be super dominant. I've seen how much money an attractive woman can make in a year by dating an autistic young man. Without ever putting out, they get these suckers to buy them expensive luxury goods and then turn around and sell them at secondhand stores for half price. By doing so, even a million dollars is achievable within a year. This is without having to sleep with anybody. Now imagine what an attractive hooker can do. So it only makes sense that they must be addicted to drugs or they'd be absolutely killing it. And by the way, if you want to talk about white collar crime, I can think of a thousand ways to get rid of those, but I can't say because I enjoy being alive. One thing you should know though is that white collar crime backs the lower level crime, like drug dealing and hookers. But the opposite is also true. And if you get rid of lower level crime, white collar crime takes a huge hit. This connection is quite obvious if you think about it and pay attention. Where I was growing up, even a child could point out all the crime in town. But nothing is done about it, meaning the police and government are obviously looking the other way. And the only reason why that would be is because they're involved. Now, for all you people who like to accuse me of being anti-women and racist, 
Why not fight for women and minorities, starting by ending crime once and for all, since it doesn't even take that much effort? If you really care, then go up against the mafia that owns practically everything. For once, put your life on the line for what you believe in. Even stating this solution on how to end crime puts my life on the line. So if you can't one-up me, then stop vomiting virtuous nonsense. Without crime money, women would own everything in society because nothing competes with pussy bucks. They will use this money to start their own companies, making use of autistic nerds who don't have the money to fund their own operations. Soon enough, all property in this world will be owned by women. And since women have no sympathy or empathy for beta males, they will do what should have been done a long time ago. Without annoying betas being able to survive, this world will become a better place. All it'll take is a stepped up version of a baby monitor for kids and teens. You know, in the past, if they wanted to, they could have just destroyed the drug trade through the use of bloodhounds. Those pooches have an incredible range for tracking different scents down. The problem nowadays is that there's too many synthetic drugs that would confuse their noses. But all the same, it's even easier now. Through the use of smartphone technology, parents can now monitor their kids while at work. And for that matter, why not daycares? It's the same idea as dash cams, basically. It helps you keep an eye on things and have footage. You know what? White people really aren't that bad. If they were, they would have genocided everyone. Instead, they genocide themselves. Genki Sudo, who's named after an anime character, came into MMA with a background in wrestling and dance. While fighting, he usually used dancing as a taunt. And overall, the guy was just very unpredictable. He would use meme techniques like rolling thunder, the look away, and the flying drop kick. No, really like imagine trying to find a sparring partner to prepare for this guy. Raymond Diamond Deckers is a legend in the Muay Thai world. He pretty much single-handedly started the Dutch kickboxing tradition. As an eight-time Muay Thai champion, he fought Thai champions on their own turf. At the time, that took some real balls, and he was known for his aggressive style, which is how he earned the nickname Diamond. I mean, aside from being a translucent white boy with a twinkle in his eye, he just liked to drive forward. In fact, him pushing himself so much is probably the reason why he died of a heart attack at age 43. So Deckers had one MMA fight against Genki Sudo. Genki did a good job of controlling distance, staying just out of reach of Deckers' dangerous kicks while waiting for his chance to shoot a double. Deckers stopped his forward momentum and almost stuffed the takedown, but then Genki switched to a trip to bring him down. I couldn't even give you my two cents on what happens next, because on the ground, the Diamond was a dime a dozen. These days, Genki is retired from fighting and probably best known for the music videos he makes with his group, World Order. Let's grab them by the pussy. Did you know, girls don't like oral though? It's submissive. This reminds me though, there is something else that can be done to help prevent Europeans from going extinct. Credit where credit is due though, I actually came across this idea in a thread on 4chan's poll board. So here's the idea. Straight men could partner up with gays in a no-sex relationship, and both could pass on their genes through the use of surrogate mothers and have a family basically. I mean, this would cost a lot less, and thereby be more realistic at this point than maintaining a relationship with a woman. I mean, being in a relationship with a woman is like some kind of tax. And when you're married to one for a few years, you won't be getting much sex, or probably any at all anyways. And yet you still have to spend money for maintenance purposes. So really, you could more easily raise a kid with a homo. It's just much more affordable. Jason Mayhem Miller used to be a backup dancer for New Kids on the Block, but then he started coming up in the world and got his own dancers. A lot of people know Mayhem for that time he had a 5 hour standoff with the SWAT team while on Twitter. Which by the way reminds me, the YouTube copyright system is still, after all these years, set up such that if someone falls strikes you and you want to put the ball back in their court, you've got to give up your name and address to them. And they don't have to give up any of their information, leaving you exposed to being doxxed or swatted for what very well could be a false claim. For that matter, there is no punishment for making false claims that I'm aware of. So it's like, what do you do? Well, and this is not legal advice, but somebody could have a standoff with the SWAT team on Twitter and use the publicity to expose some bullshit. That's how it is, man. We got some copyright turtis out here on YouTube, and Justice is just some blind bitch with a juice scale. She don't know how it be. And do you remember my gay mafia video, where I talk about the accomplishments of gays throughout the years, and the high positions they've held? 
YouTube wouldn't have took that down, man. Like, they call me a hater, basically. But who are the real haters when you can't even share facts about the achievements of a particular group of people? And none of this Desmond is great, girls washroom, Justin Trudeau bullshit. And you know what? I think I finally figured out the YouTube algorithm. It's a work of Jewish-German engineering that can detect humor just to censor it. But oh well, right? I don't even know why they go after me. How am I offending anyone when my audience is more toxic than I am? I mean, it just doesn't make much sense culturally, right? My audience will attack me for the sake of attacking, but I at least have logical reasons for my opinions. You know, a friend of mine told me a story about how one time he ate tainted pork and then the next morning he was gay like he had thoughts about men you know and sure it only lasted for a day but it just goes to show that you can turn gay with just one slip up so i disagree with people like joe rogan if people don't want gay influence in their lives or more importantly the lives of their children there's nothing wrong with that Anyways, a man of culture such as myself remembers mayhem for that show Bully Beatdown, where bullies get beat down by pro fighters, and this one guy who Miller fought himself, who had this whole thing about getting the poison out of his victims. What is the deal with getting the poison out? Their weakness is like a sickness. It's like a disease that they have, so I'm just getting it out of them. So you put them on like weightlifting regimen, or? No, I bash their faces in. You know what else is poison? Failure. If you don't hate, if you don't loathe, if you deny the feeling of failure from giving you the pain you deserve, you're doing it wrong. If you're always failing and always feeling like a failure, it makes you gross. The insecurity just oozes out of you. It is fine to feel like a failure now and then, because that pain is a lesson. The problem, though, is when it starts to break your will. It is like fear, I suppose. It's an instinct that warns you of problems. But when it consumes you, you can't act decisively anymore. You become a broken person, and since you're harder to be around than when Humpty Dumpty hits the wall, there's a good chance you're not getting back up. But you know what? Even being a loser has its silver lining. Watching you fuck up so much is good for other people's self-esteem. Kazushi Sakuraba came into MMA with a background in catch and pro wrestling, and he used both. Being a high-level technician, he was able to make pro wrestling moves work for him. And with his aggressive catch wrestling style, he was able to overwhelm and defeat jiu-jitsu users, which is how he became the Gracie Hunter. In MMA, he defeated Hoyler Gracie, Henzo Gracie, and in particular, he had a match with Hoist Gracie, which only ended when he broke the man's femur from accumulated damage. It was like Kimura all over again, and in fact, Sakuraba happens to be a Kimura connoisseur. You see, Kimuras aren't just offensive. He liked using the two-on-one Kimura-style grip to prevent chokes and as an escape technique. Like, it got to a point where his opponents were scared to take his back, because they knew he'd be twisting their arm off in a Tokyo minute. By the way, Sakuraba means cherry blossom, but Sakura tree only blossom in the spring. This guy's fighting past 50. He's just prolific like that. The world's greatest fertilizer is the blood of seppuku. War Machine. Yes, that's his real name. He had it legally changed as a way of settling a dispute with a wrestling company. The man formerly known as John Coppenhaver is half German, half Mexican. So obviously, he can't be trusted with borders. One time, he brought Ken Shamrock's teenage daughter to Mexico and just left her there. Well, at least he didn't turn her womb into a piñata and leave a bit of Mexico in her. So John had a pretty rough time growing up, and at some point, he was just like, fuck that normal 9 to 5 shit. I'm an alpha male. He became a fighter and a porn star, and even started dating the now former porn star Christy Mack. What is it with fighters dating porn stars anyways? I mean, I guess they could teach each other ground positions or whatever, but I think it has a lot more to do with them both being in professions that require a lot of athleticism and pain tolerance. You know, they call porn the Olympics of film, but I like to think of it as the MMA of sex. So one day, War Machine came into Christy Mack's apartment and saw her in bed with another guy. Apparently they weren't even in the nude though, they were just eating cookies or something, but War Machine snaps. He beats the crap out of the guy, even bites him, and eventually chases him out of the apartment, and then he beats the absolute crapola out of Christy Mack. Like, this was a long and torturous process. At one point, he started going through her phone and hitting her for every message he saw that he didn't like. Like, it was bad. She ended up with 18 broken bones and a ruptured liver. And now War Machine serving a life sentence on multiple charges. He did have some priors. Now, let me just say, I'm not defending what he did. He obviously took shit way too far. But according to Mac's own testimony, not long before this attack happened, she had sent War Machine a topless picture of herself. War Machine's reply was, I need that. And of course, unless she's got Alzheimer's, she knew she had another man over. Now you see, and I'm still not saying this is what happened here, but the potential is there. A lot of women do like it when men fight over them, and will actually instigate such conflicts. I'm torn between whether it's because it feeds their narcissism, or if they just get off on the violence. Probably both. But since they run on female instincts a lot more than logic, sometimes they get more than they bargained for. She should've ran when he fucking bit the guy. Another thing about women is that, to them, there's no reason to not sleep around while in a relationship. Yeah, it's gross as fuck, but look on the bright side. Free probiotics. This reminds me of a story. See, there was this teacher at my school who was also a farmer, and also a karate black belt. His best friend was the principal, and his wife also worked at that school. And everything was all cool, until one day, he discovers that the principal and his wife were screwing. He doesn't take this very well. He goes to his barn, grabs his shoddy, 
and then blows his own head off. It's like, what? Back when I first heard this story, I was like, man, why even have a black belt then? He should have locked that school down and threw a fucking kumite in the principal's office. The lesson here? I don't know. Don't work at the same place as your wife. And you know, as a side note, I think it's kind of funny that people consider martial artists to be more dangerous than people without training. It's like, someone who can fight can beat you up, maybe kill you, I mean it is what it is, but someone who can't will resort to other means. I know this one guy who beat this other guy up, trying to boot him out of this party, right? So the guy getting beaten up jumps into his truck, and for a moment everybody thinks he gets the picture and he's just gonna drive away. Then just like that, he rips it around and runs over this guy who was beating him, who ends up with serious brain damage. Being able to fight like a man doesn't make you more dangerous than being able to fight like a maniac. Victor Gracie brought some truly innovative jujitsu to the game. Like his signature muscle blitz attack, Count Como would be like, hey, whatever works bro. But wait, he's not actually a Gracie. In fact, the family sued him for trying to use their name like that for instant status. You see, according to other fighters when asked in interviews, Vitor Belfort, despite having no known weaknesses, used to have very low self-confidence. But unfortunately, some things you just can't fake it till you make it, and a family bloodline is one of them. You'll just be a con man from start to finish, and whoever heard of a confidence man without confidence? Everyone has to find their own way of survival, and if you think about it, a con man is actually just a social skills pure. Later on in his career, Vitor got a second chance of sorts, as they started to allow TRT exemptions. You know, to keep the old timers in the game, to give them testosterone levels of a young man. And also, of course, those guys have been on steroids their entire careers. Suddenly take a break to get a doctor's note saying they have low tests because their balls aren't producing any. So Vitor found a friendly doctor who made it possible for him to fight like a younger man on steroids. Really, someone in this picture should just grow some balls already and market their own brand of roids. Vitor's secret. Chen Sun Jung grew up not having many friends because of his unstable home situation, meaning he had to deal with a lot of isolation, which is bad enough as an adult when things don't go exactly your way in life, but as a child who doesn't have many other experiences in the bank, that's gotta be just hell. Isolation meant death for our ancestors, so we don't take it lightly. It lights up the same areas of our brains as physical pain. There's an old saying, the price of acceptance is mediocrity, while the price of success is loneliness. And here's why that's bullshit. Who really wants to hang out with a desperate, insecure loser? Even other losers don't want to deal with your shit. They got their own problems. Meanwhile, success represents opportunity, and all kinds of people want to be a part of that. And obviously, the most isolated are at the bottom because they offer nothing. So isolation can be good motivation to get ahead, except it's kind of hard to focus when it feels like your hand's stuck on a burner. In Chan Sun Jung's case, it was a simple matter to take his hand off the one burner and put it on another called fighting. He became the Korean zombie because he would eat shots and continue to plow forward. And once he started getting real good at jujitsu, he unleashed his lust for that delicious gray matter. He pulled off the very first twister in the UFC, a submission that puts pressure directly on the spine. This can be a real nightmare for the ref. It's like, is he still refusing to tap or is he already paralyzed? But yeah, isolation can also be a result of people who grow up sheltered and don't realize until it's too late that this world is just too real to not have a plan for when your parents cut off all support or start treating you like Quasimodo because the oxytocin has run its course, motherfucker. But if it's not too late and you want to get some sweet support before it's too late, well, try not to displease them with the way you appear to be turning out. But yeah, suffering from isolation has got to be why the Japanese kill themselves so much. You know, a lot of people look at East Asian societies and see them as very rigid and ruthless. Like, if you fall out, you're done. But it's really quite the same in the West. People just don't often talk about it. I mean, look at Skid Row. If you don't have some kind of support network or just screw up a lot, well, that's pretty much it. In many cities, the homeless have less privilege than village chickens. Because at least chickens have some foreseeable utility. I'm a white boy, and I'm Jack. Deal with it. Brock the Cock Lesnar is a pro wrestler who decided he wanted to have an easier life in the NFL, and when that didn't work, MMA. Like seriously, he says the money is good in wrestling if you're a star, but they overwork you. And all the steroids in the world won't make the ring any softer. He has said that during his original two year stint in the WWE, he worked his way up to a bottle of vodka a day and several hundred Vicodin a month just to manage his pain. <laughs> He is a worker though, and when he got into MMA, he brought with him considerable amateur wrestling experience. And he's actually a farm boy, except unlike Clark Kent, he's always Superman. You know, Brock actually reminds me of a guy I hung out with a lot when I was growing up. If you've watched a lot of my older videos, you might remember this guy whose dad said he would disown him if he turned out gay. His dad was actually a veteran, and he wasn't around much, so bomb disposal unit, as we called him, was very into military stuff. Like Brock, he looked very German, and his mom, who was basically raising him on her own, encouraged him to dump the family trash into the neighbor's yard. They had like weird boundary issues. She also fed him peanut butter and jelly sandwiches non-stop, and they were both pretty fat. But the other thing is, he was a compulsive liar, and she encouraged that behavior too. Like one time, they did this little act in front of me where she acted like his secretary trying to manage his 10 girlfriends. Like it literally felt like improv comedy sometimes. But you could tell that this was legitimately her way of trying to be supportive and build up his confidence. Is it any wonder why single moms are considered criminal factories? But at least his dad popped in now and then to buy him a gym membership. So he would sometimes throw sleepovers at his place, usually on his birthday. We played video games, and by the way, double Seven Nightfire for the PS2 is GOAT multiplayer. Another thing we did was figure around with firecrackers and Roman candles and stuff. He had a collection of black powder, taken from firecrackers, boomstick shells, 
for making implements of an exploding nature basically. Like I remember one time I got roped into riding in a shopping cart with just some cardboard for protection while they shot roman candles at me. But other than that he would invite us to come sleep in the tent in his backyard. But what you must know is that the war always rages on with this guy. As soon as we get settled in he starts silently gassing us. You know who else looks like Brock? Donald Trump. Right down to the tiny hands. Just kidding, they just looked that way because he was up against Shane Carwin. But either way, it's not all bad to have tiny hands, cause you know what they say, a man with tiny hands has a big self-reported dick. But yeah, Shane has such large hands that they needed to make him special gloves. He also has a habit of knocking out sparring partners, and he was feeding those big hands to Brock when they fought, until he gassed out. And it was all downhill from there, a likely result of him trying to be a full-time engineer and fighter. Now I can't imagine those two professions mess well, but I do get it. STEM field jobs do pay well, but it's hard to get quality women at work. Cain Velasquez, the fighter who Fedor has called the greatest, also grew up as a farm boy, the brown kind, from Sinaloa, Mexico, which of course is known for its tacos and burritos. Cain's work ethic comes from knowing the life of working hard on the fields. Cain works as hard as three ordinary Mexicans, which just goes to show that as you pay them better, you get diminishing returns. One time, Brock tried to show him what a combine harvester looks like, so they could stop combining Mexicans. Brock put up a valiant effort, but in the end, Cain turned white bread into flatbread. Another guy who Brock fought, Frank Mir, while Brock was of the opinion that Frank was a lucky lucky boy to land that leg lock on him in the first fight. Frank Mir had a horseshoe up his ass. I told him that a year ago. I pulled that some bitch out and I beat him over the head with it. Now that's good advice for anyone who works in the ER. You can't let those weirdos just get away with stuffing things up their butt. And Brock didn't know how right he was about that horseshoe. You see, Frank got injured on his bike, and as a result of it, mostly not being able to compete, he started becoming an alcoholic. I remember looking at him one time, he was drunk, passed out filled out on the bed and I remember thinking like it'd be so easy just to pack my stuff up and move back home but you see he got lucky don't expect a woman to stick with you through hard times for very long especially not an injury that could end your career and you know what I don't blame women for anything they are just mindless drones seriously you should never blame a woman for anything it's always the man's fault they're like children and depending on a woman is almost like suicide you know a wise man once told me that if you drink to escape from misery it'll just come back twice as bad when you wake up hungover and I know what you're thinking sure that sounds simple enough but in the moment your mind can play tricks on you well, that's called cognitive dissonance. But you know who won't play tricks on you? A dog. I mean, if you've ever seen a man try to use a woman as an emotional support animal, it's not a pretty scene. Anywho, Brock had to take a long time off fighting and only came back fairly recently, which really sucked because he's like the silverback gorilla of theoretical MMA fights. And all because of a first world problem. He had diverticulitis. His guts were like falling apart and ready to explode. This disease is by far the most prevalent in people eating a typical Western diet. But even in the West, it's known as an old timer's disease. So Brock really did a number to himself with all that vodka and his American diet on steroids. So he got some medical attention and tried to make a relatively quick comeback against Uberim, which is just Alistair Overeem when he was on his horse meat diet, because a horse is a horse, of course, of course. And his horses would have a real shot at the Kentucky Derby, I think. Whoa! Hey, you so Uberine does the Cobra Kai play. He punches Brock in the guts and that's pretty much it. Demetrius Mighty Mouse Johnson never knew his real dad and he grew up with an abusive stepdad. Being a smaller guy, he must have felt stepped on. And by the way, I don't know about this specific situation, but let's not pretend that a mother would never sacrifice her children in order to please her new man. You know, I used to have this female neighbor who lived across from me and every weekend she would have an ambulance at her driveway. She literally called them up every weekend claiming there was some emergency just so she could act like an attention whore. And the reason why she got away with this without some kind of charges being pressed on her is because she was part native. But if you looked at her, you would swear she was 100% white trash, never sober. See, if you didn't know, people with native blood in Canada get a lot of benefits. She didn't even have to work. And she always had some greasy looking man over. One time she came up to me, touching my chest, like, hey handsome, but I just gave her the death stare. See, I could have been perfectly civil if she was just a slut, but I knew some things about her. You see, she had a young son who was mentally challenged, with what I suspect was fetal alcohol syndrome. And she let this son of hers be abused in order to please some scumbag that she was trying to hook. And I knew this because every Everybody did. That kid only finally went to a foster home when that woman's mother died. She was the only one who gave that boy any real semblance of care, and he was pretty much gonna start starving now. It just makes me think though, you know, it's sad, but it's just gonna keep getting harder to get adopted as a white kid, because everybody wants the virtue signal. So anyways, Mighty Mouse is like, why don't you pick on somebody your own size? Wait a second, why don't I? He became a dominant flyweight champion in the UFC. But UFC fans didn't care about no flyweight champion. He had to start doing twists to pay the bills. This is because Americans are shallow and think bigger is always better. Like how football players are wide, basketball players are tall, and porn stars are long. I mean, it's so bad that the UFC ends up trading him away to the one organization in exchange for a dad bod named Ben Askren, who gives them three fights and ends up getting starched by Ponytail. You know, I disagree with Dana White when he says that they shouldn't be putting on circus fights. And I don't care if they have to do it in Singapore or Zanzibar. 
Ryan's a bear. I want to see, and you want to see, Mighty Mouse versus Brock Lesnar. I mean, what's worse, being a circus fighter or just a second class citizen? Mighty Mouse's special move, the mouse trap, is like something out of a horror movie. It's so slick that it's almost surreal. But can it stop a Minnesota mountain gorilla on the mean streets of Suplex City? Can Brock keep his insides from exploding long enough to catch a diabolical mouse named Dimitri? There's only one way to find out. That's all go bits to Dana White. Forrest Griffin first rose to fame due to his presence on that first season of The Ultimate Fighter. Especially that fight in the finale with Stefan Boner, which admittedly was a lot of heart, but not as much skill. The kids are calling me Stephanie Boner. And Forrest would continue to fight like that for his entire career, which leads to a short career, but also some really bad matchups. Like that time he fought Anderson Silva and found out he wasn't the one. Mr. Anderson. He looked at me like, oh, did you really think you were going to hit me? What a stupid thing to think, you slow, slow white boy. To be fair though, Forrest is the only man to have fought Freddie Mercury and lived to tell the tale, but as a result, he now has permanent brain damage and resembles a chimp. So Forrest has taken a lot of damage, but he loves it, so he put off retirement for as long as he could. You know, the knee was pretty, you know, I had the patella reconstruction, they say, I'm say I'm meniscus, and then my penis fell off. Well, there you go. Now, if he wants it, he can join the Nevada State Athletic Commission with the other dickless wonders. You know, MMA organizations have tried a lot of things to get away from the commissions, such as when King of the Cage was hosting events on Indian reservations. And doing so to get away from the commissions is a loophole that doesn't exist for boxing, only MMA. The UFC has a fight island these days, but the original fight island was actually hosted by Bodog. They fought outside on a hot tarp, which they used as a weapon to burn each other. You know, I think the reason why people in tropical paradises tend to be more violent is because of the abundance of resources and the the lack of other forms of population control, with there obviously being a finite amount of territory, nature will always seek a balance, whether it's through falling coconuts or spear fishing accidents. And in the case of people like Mark Hunt, I think the coconuts stop working. I like to think that the reason it's called the soccer kick is that unlike in soccer, they finally had a way to punish people who go to the ground to stall. Anderson the Spider Silva used to work at McDonald's to support his training. The pay was cheap, but so were the calories. For real though, they took pretty good care of him during that time in his life. But then when he has his little success and comes over to America, he goes and gets sponsored by Burger King. It's like, remember where you came from, you know? Well, I think Anderson did remember where he came from. Brazil. And then he went out of his way to prove his desire to be a true citizen of Burgerland and got Sensei Steven Seagal to train him. And I know why Steven would choose to teach Anderson. If you look at his movies, it's like, why is everybody so small? Well, the answer to that is easy. It's because this is a Steven Seagal movie, not a Tom Cruise movie. He can't teach 6'2". He doesn't even know how to run properly. You see, part of the reason that we swing our arms is to balance out our weight because we don't have tails. He's acting like a lizard, like a T-Rex or something. It almost looks like a wire trick from one of those kung fu movies, except all they're doing is dragging his fat ass through the seam. Have you ever seen someone in a combat sports match knock someone out with that kick? Well, nobody knows the kick. I'm teaching it to Machida and Machida Kun and Anderson and a few of the Brazilians, but... Well, I don't know anything about martial arts, but Steven Seagal would know a damn lot about behavior that's embarrassing to the human race. Anyway, Steven was first brought in to prepare Anderson for his first fight with Chael Sonnen. Basically, a ground and pound type guy who does his best to be a pro wrestling type persona, choosing to be the bad guy, or heel, using his wits to piss people off, especially the Brazilians. I was in Las Vegas when the Noguera brothers first touched down in America. There was a bus that pulled up to a red light, and Little Nog tried to feed it a carrot while Big Nog was petting it. He thought it was a horse. So as for the actual fight, Chael did a pretty good job of imposing his strategy, dominating Anderson for almost five rounds. But then Anderson punches him from his guard, locks in a triangle, and that's that. What you want, donkey? What will you learn? What will you learn? That your actions have consequences! More often than not, though, Anderson wins the fight with a stand-up game. He's not aggressive though, he actually likes to taunt his opponents and then uses superior speed and reach to catch them on the way in. If Andy is standing still and his opponent is coming in, he has the advantage with landing his jab, especially with his great strike accuracy. Now ironically, because you get the impression that he's adverse to taking damage in his fights, Anderson, along with most of the other big name Brazilians, trained at Shudo Box, which was long known for their hard sparring sessions. In fact, here's a little tidbit of the mindset they had there. Vanderlei Silva, who's also trained at Shudo Box, has stated that he used to believe that the more you get hit in the head, the more you can take. When of course the opposite is true. Your brain is soft and squishy, it's fatty acids and blood vessels and stuff. Building up scar tissue and rupturing blood vessels is not going to improve anything. There's also connective tissue that basically holds your brain in place, and that can tear, meaning your brain will smack into the inside of your skull even harder. One thing you can say though is that by taking shots, you'll naturally learn how to roll with the punches to minimize damage. Another thing is that sparring is rarely just sparring anyways, there's a lot of bullshit that comes into it. Some people try to be sly, throwing lots of soft shots then mixing in a hard one to try and drop their opponent. 
And then when somebody gets hit a little too hard, they're not stupid enough to think that that was an accident, so it turns into a real fight. Fuck you, let's do it. So anyways, I don't know if it's those Big Mac attacks or groin shots or what, but Anderson has apparently had some issues keeping his bedroom appendage as solid as straight as it could be. And the pills he took to deal with this raised his test levels, which got him into some hot water with the anti-doping people. <laughs> it's normal. Vanderlei the Axe Murderer Silva grew up on the mean streets of anywhere Brazil, and his fighting style has been described as downright feral. And with those most muscular hooks of his, he looks like a cat playing with a light bulb, swatting away all his opponent's good ideas, while they too get infected with toxoplasma, which, if you didn't know, is a parasite that's symbiotic with cats and makes their prey items come to them. And for humans, notably a lot of Brazilians, it makes you more horny and less risk averse and stuff like that. That's right, a nation of crazy cat ladies. Which reminds me of that time Vanderlei and Chael Sonnen were opposing coaches in The Ultimate Fighter. And Vanderlei was very insistent about getting into it with Chael for all that crap he had said about the Brazilians. And I can't let you get close. The real loser here is Chael's toe. Vanderlei came up having a lot of brutal fights in Valley Tudo, and as a result, he had a lot of scar tissue around his eyes. And the more scar tissue there is, the easier it is to split his brow open again. So eventually he had it surgically fixed, along with his busted up nose. But not everything is so easily fixed. So I knew this guy in high school who went to MMA classes, and eventually he started going out and looking for a real fight. I got the sense that the teacher of that class kind of low-key encouraged his students to do so. So one day, he starts messing with this out-of-towner kid at the movie theater. He puts him in a headlock, basically bullying him. Now you see, kids from my town and from this kid's town had something of a rivalry, which usually culminated in a fight in the McDonald's parking lot. So this out-of-towner kid was practically an approved target. No one would look down on this guy from my school for bullying him. Him. But this kid wasn't having it. He punches his way over the headlock, knocks the guy down, and this guy from my school starts getting curb stomped. Fucked up all his teeth. And I mean, he got them fixed, but there's still fracture lines all through. And I should mention, people from that town were known for curb stomping people. They even put videos of them doing so up on Facebook. Lesson here is, don't play games when it comes to a real fight. In the ring, it usually stops when one fighter is at the other's mercy. But in the streets, it could be just getting started. It's a fight with the best fights in the world. For this, I'm coming here tonight because I want to fuck I want to fight with Chuck here. Fuck Chuck! Okay, I'm gonna knock him out. Christine Cyborg Justiano got her fighter nickname from her ex husband, the reverse unicorn Evangelista Santos. And frankly, even though it's also one of Fedor's nicknames, it suits her best of all. I mean, she lights those girls up in there worse than Christmas alone. And you know, there was always rumors about Cyborg. I saw her at the MMA Awards, she looked like Vanderlei Silva in a dress and heels. And she did. It's a trap! You've activated my trap card! Actually, she got popped first to Nazalol in 2012. And maybe by seeing a woman take this kind of beating, you'll have a more visceral response to what happens when one person takes steroids while the other doesn't. Or, more likely, when one person takes better steroids than the other. Let's just be real, like many things in life, there's a pay to win aspect here. Whoever can afford to get their hands on the best stuff that somehow avoids the current testing will have a distinct advantage. But anyways, I'll have you know that there really was a transsexual fighter, post-op, named Fallon Fox. Joe Rogan has had a lot to say about this topic. Like if you had a dick at one point, you also get the body that comes with having a dick and therefore should not be allowed to compete with people who've never had a dick. But here's another way to look at it. If you have a meteorite landing site in your pants, you should have the privilege of being able to fight women because nobody should have to try that hard in order to be accepted as one. Coming out of surgery looking like a Thanksgiving turkey? You know, some people get wounded by an arrow to the knee. Some people get brain damage from being too fast and too furious. But some poor fucker ends up taking a meteorite to the dick. If you had a rocket launching pad in your pants, no organization should be able to tell you that no you can't. In fact, women should be lining up to get beaten up by you because women should support other women, especially a woman with a rocket launching pad in her pants. I mean, this is a national security threat. Somebody give this woman some applause. I'm gonna go ahead and get really real though. The real reason why trannies are an issue isn't because they have an unfair advantage, they're actually at a disadvantage. They have to support a male body while having low testosterone. If you've ever trained while having low testosterone, you would get it. You literally feel like death and have suicidal thoughts constantly. You have insomnia, constant fatigue, and you never recover properly. So it's unfair for Joe to say that they have an advantage with the male frame. However, sports is simulated warfare and someone is always bound to cheat. And if a tranny decides to cheat, whether they get caught or not, someone could very well end up getting killed in the ring. So Joe isn't really all wrong, it's just the specific point he made is unfair. No one with any foresight would allow this, because sports is simulated warfare and jocks are assholes. They're trained to be. Joe could do to bring someone on his podcast who has low tests, because he doesn't get it. Just because you have a male frame doesn't mean you can do much with it while having low test. And training with it is like a death sentence. You know, another thing that Joe Rogan has talked quite a bit about is artificial intelligence bots beating people at chess. And about how soon, they'll beat players at Go and every other game as well. And I think he's totally wrong. 
I can beat the best AI chess player. You see, this is how you beat technology. Just because Go players can't think outside the box doesn't mean everyone is retarded. They think they're so smart. But bitch, I'll slip a magnet inside your AI before the match begins. Mauricio Shogun Rura is basically an improved version of Vandy. More refined, as it were. Shogun actually has a background as a male model. And I don't know why he quit. Because in my opinion, no homo, real men actually get prettier with battle scars. Especially Vanderlei, with all those cuts he kept getting above his eyebrows before he had it surgically fixed. I bet all his little facial expressive muscles above his eyes are damaged now. Now, so he couldn't do the soy boy face if he wanted to. Did you know that studies show that a serious face will get you more pussy than a smile? A serious face means that a man isn't content with his current situation and thus is more ambitious, while a smiling man is content and thus won't progress much in life. So you should smile more because the majority of girls out there are either fat or ugly and that way they'll stay away. So back to Shogun, when he finally had to make the move from the pride ring to the UFC cage, he became like a whole different fighter. I mean, he was dominated by Forrest Griffin. The thing about Shogun is his style was originally geared towards Valley Tudo, and many of his fans would argue that a Valley Tudo style doesn't work well when you're in a cage. I think it mostly boils down to how wrestlers can take advantage of the cage and how Shogun is deprived of kicking and stomping grounded opponents in the head. Which, if you think about it, is a rule that also favors wrestlers because they have less to worry about when they shoot in for a takedown. And actually, a couple guys, notably John Jones, have tried to take advantage of this rule by monkey crawling towards their opponent. Here we go! That was close. John Boner Jones, formerly known as Sexual Chocolate, became the UFC light heavyweight champ at age 23. And by his late 20s, he was already getting into DUIs, hit and runs, and allegedly sandblasting prostitutes. Doing steroids or snorting cocaine or sandblasting prostitutes. What's this guy gonna do to mess this up this time? Prostitutes? I beat you after a weekend of cocaine. He's the kind of guy who rejects a fight after his opponent gets replaced last minute by Chael Sonnen. He didn't want to fight Chael until he had the chance to do a full training camp for the guy. The result being that that event, which all those other fighters trained for months to be in, was cancelled. You know, the UFC keeps trying to put those wild Chuck Liddell type days behind them, but at least Chuck would have fought anybody after a fortnight of cocaine. Seriously, the UFC's trying so hard to clean up and commercialize their image. They're like we football now and they give all the fighters uniforms. I just don't think Anderson Aldo would approve. Jones tried to be the good guy though, at least on the surface, acting all bright eyed and humble, but it was it was just so fake it was cringeworthy. He finally started acting like himself during his whole rivalry with Daniel Cormier. Hey pussy, are you still there? <laughs> Daniel, the black fedor, the sexual peanut butter cup, has long had trouble with weight cuts, which led to him getting kidney damage during a weight cut to wrestle in the Olympics. So when DC got into the UFC, he went into light heavyweights because he wanted to avoid fighting a teammate at heavyweights. It must be nice to have a friend who likes you more than cupcakes. And while he was just getting settled there, he was supposed to fight Rashad Evans, but Rashad got injured. By the way, it's kind of sad, but Rashad is best known these days for that face he made when he got knocked out by Lyoto Machida. You know, it became a pretty popular image on the internet. One guy actually had the balls to go up to Rashad and ask him to sign it. Truth is though, if you're caught at your worst, it may be best to put your name on it first. So the UFC went out and found this formerly homeless guy working at Starbucks, Patrick Cummins, to fight DC. Cummins immediately breaks the wrestling bro code, saying that he used to reduce DC to tears in wrestling training behind closed doors. You know, not every barista gets their own little Rocky story, and you gotta go and act petty like that. Well, DC really has an appetite. It takes a can of beans to feed a homeless man, but it takes the man to feed DC, who will give him a home on his highlight reel. But yeah, about the rivalry, Jones beats DC once, and then he hits a pregnant lady with his car, runs away on foot, comes back to get his weed out of his car, and then runs away again. He has to spend a little time away from the UFC for that one. Meanwhile, DC's getting old, he's like 40. So DC grabs the interim title, Jones comes back, and they're about to have the rematch. But before the fight could begin, Jones tested positive for hormone modulating substances. Supposedly, he took a Cialis, but at any rate, the fight was cancelled. And when they finally had the rematch for real, Daniel gets knocked out. And then Joe Rogan swoops in with his questions. I don't know, man, I guess. If you win both fights, there is no rivalry, so... You know, I think a big factor here is that Jones unintentionally pulled a little psychological warfare on the guy. If you make your opponent impatient, they'll be overeager, and then you can capitalize on their mistakes. And as for there being no more rivalry, do you think that's what John Jones says every time he fights the law? Let me tell you, son, it's not about how hard you can hit. It's about how hard you can get in shit and keep moving forward. So the way that John Jones fights is unsurprisingly designed to take advantage of his reach and height. But he's not just Anderson Silva 2.0. He doesn't want his opponents to rush in. Instead, he uses moves like the controversial knee stomp or chasse bas to keep his opponents at a distance. And because of his reach advantage, he can keep landing shots the whole time. 
There's an answer to this though. You see, the problem with most fighters in the UFC today is that they're much more athletes than martial artists, and they simply don't have the skill to beat someone who's both athletic and tall. So what I'd like to see is a matchup such as John Jones versus Anthony Rumble Johnson, who is also a particularly tall and athletic fighter, because most shorter fighters don't have the finesse to avoid eating endless knee stomps. By the way, there's another distance creating move that Jones is known for. I do poke people in the eyes, and it's very illegal, uh, but I do it. <laughs> You know, eye pokes are pretty street approved and all, but they're one of those things that wouldn't happen as much if you just got rid of the gloves. People would use more traditional stances rather than this so called MMA stance, which only exists because people get so many chances to shoot for a double A because they can just blast jabs with the gloves. Now, if somebody tried using finger jabs on somebody using a more traditional martial arts stance, they would soon have their fingers broken when that second somebody blocks with their elbows. You know, an eye for an eye will leave the whole world blind, but two eyes for an eye will just blind the guy who started it. You know who strikes me as the opposite of John Jones? Quentin Rampage Jackson. John Jones has been known to use cocaine. He acted like a big dick to the police when they caught him with a Trojan Magnum. He didn't take responsibility when he hit a pregnant woman with his car and his brother got into university by playing football. And that's just a short list. He's even been charged with battery of a strip club waitress. I bet he didn't even tip. Contrast that with Jackson, who became a weeaboo and absorbed Japanese culture while fighting in pride. In fact, he married a Japanese woman as a second wife. Compared to Jones, Jackson, who dry humps reporters and Inoki slaps his fans, is a very responsible guy. And he paid for his sister's college because family is important to him. His worst offense would have to be that time he lost to Forrest Griffin and then drank so many energy drinks that he reached a state of delirium. Then he got in his truck because in his delusional mind, he thought he had to save his friend from dying when he falls asleep. He was riding over the curb and smashing into parked cars until the police finally stopped him. It's kind of hard not to take responsibility when you're painted on the side of your truck. I think he liked Japan better because he got to be the black samurai, unlike America where he's just a black guy like John Jones. Well, you know what? Honestly, <laughs> I can't say that I don't cry. I'm not, I'm not yeah. saying that. The last time I was in Japan for this 18 tour, I, I got interviewed up this guy and he said he was a fan from um, Pride. And he gave me an interview that brought me in tears. I had yeah. to stop the interview. Cause, and that was right before the Machida fight. And, and he like basically told me like, hey, in Japan, you used to fight different. You know, we used to, you know, we used to call you like the uh, samurai. Yeah. You had samurai spirit. But now in, in UFC, you don't seem like you have that spirit anymore. Mm. And, and it brought back so many memories. And I used to call myself Kokujin Samurai Des. You know yeah, what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. Like Black Summer. I know you understand yeah, that, but yeah. you know, for the, and I remember that. I remember I used to act like a samurai. I used to, I, I, I had videos of, I had a little samurai wig. Yeah, <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. I was like, when I learned in about the summer, yeah. <laughs> when I learned about the summer, I was intrigued with them yeah. and I learned more about and, and I remember that I had that different spirit and it, and it brought tears to my eyes. And I was thinking, like, whoa, what type of fighter am I now? You know? Yeah. It gave him a beating before he lost a very Look. tough match. Look what Quentin does. He's giving a yellow card to the referee. <laughs> glad you won that fight, Matt, but uh, I'm not impressed by your performance, and I look forward to, to fight you in the near future. I'm not impressed by your performance. George St. Pierre says he grew up experiencing bullying, which is what got him into martial arts, beginning with Kyoko Shin Karate. And that path eventually led to him bullying the UFC's welterweight division by doing massive water weight cuts to always have that size advantage. He says he does bodybuilding for looks. Well, then maybe he should focus more on those lat rows, because most of what we see of him is his back. You see, GSP is from Quebec, and he learned his special technique called lay and pray from Islamified Montreal, where they lay those easy Montreal girls while praying at Muslim mosques. You know, I honestly don't think that Islam is the worst thing in the world. But it's narcissistic to think that anything in this world is perfect. Like, how come they can fuck our women, but we can't fuck theirs? GSP uses his wrestling, along with strikes that back up his wrestling, such as his Superman punch, to get on top of his opponents and land little pot shots and fail to submit them. It's either going to be a, a stand-up fight, and someone's getting knocked out, or we're going to see 25 minutes of spooning. But I think that mad scientist Josh Koscheck, who will do anything to win and eats imaginary illegal knees for breakfast, said it best. Next time, why you still hold me on the mat? You didn't hurt me at all. Hey, it's a win. It's a little it's a win. It's a win. You know what they don't want to see in the UFC? Somebody just lays and rolls around on the ground. You're real excited by it. It's a win. I'm not done with you yet, Josh. Yeah. I'm not done with you yet. 
Real talk though, people with endurance builds like GSP aren't that useful in a real fight. I mean, if you think about it, with how chaotic a street fight actually is, it's much better to be able to put somebody away quickly. But still though, GSP has a strong mind to accept the fact that it's just not easy for him to finish, and develop a strategy and techniques that play towards the strengths that he does have. There was a time before he really fought like this though, and it led to Matt Serra making him tap to strikes. I was going, to, I was finished, I lost my equilibrium. It's not like he's never done anything to grease up his chances though, like when he fought BJ Penn for the first time. BJ, the prodigy Penn, is an natural lightweight who had the talent to reign over that division for a good decade or so. But that just wouldn't do. He had to fight guys who would present a good challenge. Like that time he fought Lyoto Machida, being at a clear size and weight disadvantage. A welterweight who's supposed to be a lightweight, fighting a middleweight who's supposed to be a light heavyweight. And what's more, the Japanese judges gave it to Machida, but I actually think BJ won that match. Anyway, so Baby J's biggest threat to George was his high-level BJJ bottom game. I mean, the guy achieved a legit black belt in just three years. His guard is not a safe place to be hanging out. So between rounds, GSP's corner goes and slathers Vaseline onto his upper back, which kept BJ from being able to climb the high guard where he could be more dangerous. Who would have thought taking greasy jujitsu so literally would work out so well? Let's talk some more about Montreal. This city has a major housing crisis and a job shortage. Now despite this housing crisis, housing prices aren't just skyrocketing in price like you would expect with normal supply and demand logic. Whereas in Toronto, where there are jobs, housing prices are so high that even working full time you'd have a hard time breaking even. So it would seem that the biggest factor in determining the pricing of housing is not the amount of people buying up housing and not the population density of the region, but access to jobs. Because you know, it's nice not to raise your kids in a fucking wasteland where they have to eat ass to maintain their crack habit. I don't want to lick any butt. I'm, I'm looking at the clock. Time skip. The clock advanced like a four hour. There's a time zone skip. that I don't remember what happened. My time oh, skip is unbeaten. That's why I hope. That's why I hope. Skip. I drove my car in a normal day. Then I look two hour past like this. I'm surprised you're not wearing a tin foil hat today. It's time for me to make the donuts. I feel like I didn't fall at I didn't fall asleep. My time skip is I'm unbeaten. not impressed. Maybe I'm crazy and it's the normal thing that everybody does. Yeah, my time I'm skip my own is time. So for me to say it's alien or say it. Mm. My time skip. But I don't know. I can't, I can't tell you right now. Unbeatable. You know, those Frenchies must have really pissed somebody off because there's a lot of economic warfare being used against them. For example, there's a lot of fake drug addicts in the city. They wear fresh clothes, have clean skin, and they don't actually inject. They use fake needles. These guys are agents used to scare off newcomers and keep the economy dying a slow death. Which reminds me, you know, a drug dealer is actually more ruthless than a straight up killer. They watch as their clients fall apart in a drawn out and torturous death. You know, I've been to Montreal. In the middle of winter, out in the freezing cold, I saw this underage blonde girl wearing see-through yoga pants. And then later I met her again. She was at the gym with her black boyfriend, who smiled at me when they thought I was checking out the girl. You know, some MMA fighters state porn stars, that's one thing. But dating a streetwalker, man. And I know she was a hooker, because it was so cold for her to be out there wearing those pants. Like I've been out there on a similar winter day wearing shorts, and I could hear the moisture in my foreskin freezing up. And the burning sensation. And the numbness. I don't know about you, but when mine goes numb, my body goes into red alert. And everybody's sensation that does get through feels like pure lightning. Everything feels like razor blades with a chance of needles, even just a crease on the inside of your pants. You'll understand why in Dante's Inferno, the middle of hell is froze solid, because ice is the true fire. So I can only imagine what standing out there in the frozen meat section would do to a vagina. And I know that she was underage, because let's face it, white girls don't age that well. You'd have a hard time finding a 20 year old that looks 14. And this has me thinking that maybe the real secret to stopping shul scootings is to convince white guys to lower their standards and date fem cells, female incels. That way, you can take out your frustrations on her pussy instead of the general public. Either way though, with the rate at which black guys are scooping up hot white girls, it's like I don't need suicide fuel. My tank is already full. Chuck Liddell, Chuck Liddell, Chuck Liddell. Chuck the Snowman Liddell is one of the few white guys known for their powder power in MMA. With a karate background and enough wrestling to keep the fight on the feet, he developed into an excellent counterpuncher. He would use counter straight rights, overhands, and even uppercuts. Truly a guy willing to go all or nothing. You know, if I'm going to be real though, Chuck was my first glimpse of MMA and it originally turned me off. I couldn't really appreciate the technique, so he had me thinking this was just some carny skinhead shit. But yeah, Chuck was a wild man. He liked the party, to the detriment of his career and his health. How'd you get started in this? I was 12. Yeah? I was a comfy theater and then, uh... And devils in between the in between the clips. Right. And I really got interested in the clips and started teaching them. Okay, I'm gonna knock him out. You can see what that lifestyle did to him when he came out of retirement not that long ago to fight Tito Ortiz, and he looked stiffer than a Viagra commercial, jitterbugging the whole time with his no chin left pulsey. 
but to be fair, he went in there with a neck injury, and I don't actually think that he did it because he was desperate for money. Apparently, Chuck owns a couple bars. The Iceman just didn't know when to let it go, so Chuck and Randy Couture were opposing coaches in the first season of The Ultimate Fighter, which consisted of tournament-style elimination matches for prospective fighters, the rest of the show being filled with the type of reality television that I call Beer Factor. <laughs> I, I do. You know, hope can be dangerous, because when the future starts looking bright, you can start dreaming too much and drop your guard. I mean it's addictive, and you can get stuck in a mental loop with it, just like with self-pity. So it's better to be able to fight, even in the darkness, without hope, because in a way, hope doesn't really even matter. It could work out or it could not, but being consistent in your efforts is the most impact you can have. Hope is a green light, indicating that you might be headed in a viable direction. It's not a fucking parade to give you the runaround. So this first season was hosted by the singer Willa Ford, who Chuck dated for a while. Okay, you guys have all had a chance to train with both Randy and Chuck at 24 hours. So? It's about do you want to be a fighter? I want to be there. Make that look so good. I've got things on my mind. I never thought I would. Take care of your underwears. I'm gonna f*** you, man. I used to f*** guys cool. like you in high school. The finale of that first season of The Ultimate Fighter, between Forrest Griffin and Stefan Bonner, was a thing of beauty. Both fighters showed a ton of heart and not a lot of technique. It made me and a lot of people watching realize what there is to love about fighting, the human spirit. And it reminds me that a big problem with modern MMA is the encroaching sense of nihilism. Human character and spirit are being treated with less and less reverence now, even though they're the true essence of combat sports. You know, they're trying to turn this into basketball, baseball, football. It's like numbers on a jersey. They're trying to turn these fighters who put everything on the line into blank faces, until the only face you can see is Dana White. You know, fighters deserve better than to have their sacrifices commodified. And it's not like I can't understand why they would want to make it more about the company than the individual fighters. It's like communism, where the guys putting in the real work get treated the same as the replaceable cookie cutters. But they mustn't forget that it's the human fighting spirit that makes fighting charismatic in the first place. Out of all animals on this planet, we're at the top because of how we fight constantly for survival, always adapting and always striving to gain a new edge throughout our history. Therefore, to dehumanize the sport makes it less attractive to people. So like like I said, it feels like nihilism, because when you take away the human aspect, it starts feeling like none of it has any meaning. Yoshihiro Akiyama, known to the ladies as Sexyama, has a background in Judo, which he actually uses defensively in order to keep the fight standing and apply his striking. But apparently that's not always enough. When he fought Sakuraba, it was claimed that the gi he walked in with was very slippery, and that whatever this substance was, it got onto his body and made it hard for Sakuraba to apply his takedowns. As people pressed him on the issue, Akiyama started to admit that he may have used a little lotion to deal with his dry skin or to treat his gi, but then it turned out that the pre-fight footage had caught him applying six entire bottles of Olay lotion to himself. Being glow-in-the-dark sexy is a full-time job. By the way, I know quite a few of you guys are familiar with the Asian Identity subreddit. It is quite an interesting place, because it's actually full of Indians and Blacks LARPing as East Asians. And one thing they like to do there is encourage East Asians and other POC to get involved in the film industry. You see, as things currently stand, the film industry is slowly drying up. And they want those Asians to get in there to keep it alive. You see, the film industry is really largely just an avenue for laundering drug money. And a lot of those minority crime groups that sell drugs are really being led by whites. You may have noticed that many of these films being made are actually pandering to these particular minorities. Like, blacks get a lot of positive representation in films. Films which exist partially because of them destroying their own communities with drugs. Because you see, you can't just sell drugs in mass like that without a huge amount of influence. They need it to not get locked up. But also, the soft power that blacks gain from this, they use to get pussy. Which is what this is really all about. So, if Asians keep the film industry from drying up, as the white population, still the largest consumer of drugs and prostitutes, continues to go down, blacks and Indians will end up pushing East Asians aside in the industry to become the new sex symbols. I mean, with the white population down, where's all this crime money gonna be generated? So, for East Asians, having a couple movie stars to gain a little bit of soft power really ain't worth the trouble, cause it'll be short-lived. Another thing that they complain about a lot in that subreddit is white guys who go to third world countries to get women. But I fail to see what the problem is, and since the issue at hand is pussy, I would suggest that they too pick up a National Geographic calendar and find themselves a wife. Just think about it man, it's win-win. A poor third world cutie getting with a man from a wealthy country. And if it's white girls you want, there's Russia, Ukraine, you know, they have their own population issues. Anyways, the reason why there's so much focus on blacks compared to Indians currently is simply because of population. They just can't earn the same. And black men on Twitter were not having it. Uh... The excerpt post says, 
This is why I propose that black women and Asian men join forces in love, marriage, and procreation. Educated black women, what better intellectual match for you than an Asian man? I'm not talking about Filipinos. They're like the blacks of Asians. I'm talking Chinese, Vietnamese, <laughs> Japanese, etc. Oh. Actually, I would narrow it down a little bit further to Koreans, Mongolians, and Samoans because they have big square heads. Also, Native Americans can be thrown in there too. You see, blacks have a lot of power, but weak chins, judging by street fight videos. They often get knocked out by Asians, who are a sedentary people due to their culture. And obviously, with their big heavy heads, Koreans and such can absorb a lot of damage. Well, he hit me from behind. <gasps> he cheap shot at you? Yeah, and then he kicked me in the face 50 times while I was down. So it's the perfect match. Square-headed, <laughs> destroying machine, Incredible. fast twitch muscle oh, fiber and angst, and finally in his life he's become special after years of neglect. And yeah, many of my subscribers are from Asian Identity because that's why I advertise my Hapa video as a joke. But I'll tell all y'all Indians and Blacks, LARPing as Asians a secret. There is simply no point in turning East Asians against Europeans. Because they already know that the whole reason white countries manage to accomplish anything at all is due to drug money and white collar crime money. And since they know that this sort of thing is never meant to last, it will be over sooner or later and all they have to do is wait. I know you want to use them to take down Europeans, so you can be top dog getting all that easy puss puss, but it ain't happening. Before you YouTube censored everything, a lot of people in East Asian countries were interviewed, and they all believe that crime is a necessary evil. You see, crime consolidates the wealth necessary for technical jobs. And since East Asia is full of nerds, they love the idea of having social mobility due to crime. This is the reason why a lot of people in China wanted Donald Trump to win, since he can say things that people in China can't. And by actually giving the CCP a hard time, everyone gets a laugh that the CCP is having such a hard time against a bunch of drug addicted countries. Racism is not actually a problem for them, because of how crime works, someone always has to be sacrificed. That means that the talent pool in the US will sink, but at the same time they cannot draw talent from China anymore due to the negative image that was created by Trump. However, Chinese companies have talent scouts hiring people all across the world. I know this because once when I was injured, I went to China to get an MRI, which cost me 150 bucks. And I noticed that they hired talent all across the world, including the USA. And think about it, they don't even need to utilize this talent properly to do damage. They just need to hold on to it, thereby forcing criminals in the States to launder money outside of the USA, leaving it as an empty husk. They also know that the place will end up becoming unlivable, as the sheer amount of crime being produced without technical jobs being being created would be insane due to the amount of guns in the USA. The Chinese know that a lack of different technical jobs causes huge spikes in crime. A lot of Chinese people in China go to the medical field as a way to escape poverty, but it doesn't work well for them because there's already too many doctors in China. And this has led to a huge spike in horrible crimes all across China, creating a huge distrust in the medical community. The Western media actually protects the image of the CCP by blaming organ harvesting on the government and Falun Gong, distancing the public from the real issue. The real problem being the lack of social mobility due to the lack of quality jobs being created. Since the wait time for seeing a surgeon in Canada is two years, I went with my friend all the way to China. A lot of doctors over there team up with gangsters. They are mostly hidden within small villages, far away from the cities. I went and visited his family within the village, and the locals told my friend to avoid the motorcycle taxis at night, since they would rush you up into the mountains at night where they would harvest your organs. They can drive those motorcycles in pitch black. You see, the reason why people actually prefer the darkness over there is because the darkness prevents you from getting raped by goblins. Whereas in the West, people think that a well-lit place prevents you from getting raped by by goblins. Only the villagers know how to navigate the place with no light, so you basically have an idea who these doctors have teamed up with. However, when it comes to organ harvesting, it is simply impossible to sell these organs without the help of white collar criminals. At the time, I had suffered some kind of lung injury in China, which had caused an air pocket to be trapped in there. The doctor that I saw told me that I would need surgery for it, otherwise my lung would collapse. My friend though told me not to do it, but I raged out at him, telling him that he's not a doctor and he don't know shit. Funnily enough though, I looked it up online, and the percentage of people with this sort of injury that actually needed a surgery was well below what I was told. This woke me up to what can happen. So when it was time for me to see a surgeon in a Chinese hospital, they had all European doctors because the wealthy people who owned that hospital thought that hiring foreigners would somehow earn the trust of the Chinese people, which clearly did not work because the hospital was completely empty in a country with such a large population. This was nine years ago and that hospital probably went bankrupt. I do believe that the wealthy over there probably has some kind of special pollution induced autism. This Australian doctor told me that I need surgery, otherwise I would suffer from permanent spine damage. This was a lie. My injuries simply never healed due to low testosterone. The muscle tissue was chronically tight because it was trying to protect a tendon that won't heal due to a lack of blood and low testosterone. When I fixed up my diet, my injuries all healed over time. The doctor even gave me a three-year deadline on when I'll need surgery, so he told me I might as well just do it now. I ignored his advice. 
Now, I noticed how you guys shit on Hong Kong, but suck the dick of mainland Chinese. Let me tell you, you're actually shooting yourself in the foot. You think that Hong Kong women would reject you because they have had bad experiences with blacks and Indians from North America, while mainland Chinese women know nothing about blacks and Indians. However, that's simply not the case. A lot of Filipino maids in Hong Kong actually teach Hong Kong women while they are young and impressionable to date black and Indian men just for the sake of trolling them because they actually think that black and Indian men are poor. Whereas the mainland Chinese women actually don't like black and Indians depending on where they're from. You see the mainland Chinese within the villages are actually very familiar with people taking advantage of them. They have no internet or TV but stereotype Indians as rapists because Indians have actually went to those villages to rape. They also have become familiar with white men taking their women for decades. There's a lot of mainstream and alternative media saying that they have found 30 million missing Chinese girls in villages. However, that is complete bullshit. That might have been true 20 years ago, but the last time I went, it was just all old people. It's a complete sausage fest over there, from the city to the villages. Whereas the Chinese in the city have more experiences with violent black people. See, blacks actually have more street smarts, since they won't actually go into these villages which are dangerous. Chinese cities have almost no cops, but the villages have none whatsoever. I actually know this white guy who found himself a girl in a Chinese village. He actually went to her Chinese fiance and told the dude that he can take care of her, but he can't take care of her whole family. Of course, he was implying that he would be the one to take care of her whole family. And he works in the oil industry. He could easily afford to, but he was bullshitting. White people just don't do that shit. It's not white culture, and no one in the West would think any less of him for not doing so. In fact, to give you a taste of the mentality, it's a joke among white people that you shouldn't marry a Filipino because you'll get scammed into support supporting your whole family. But anyways, just give up on the whole racism crusade because everybody is racist. Blacks are xenophobic towards Brazilians because they attack people but when a Brazilian dude walks in, you cower in fear. Filipinos are racist because they think that blacks and Indians are poor. Indians are racist because they're scared of Mexicans. I know this because a lot of Indians use Mexico as a platform to migrate into Canada. But tell me that they are scared that Mexicans are going to take over the USA. And then they tell me that they, meaning the Mexicans, are going to kill me. And by the way, you want to know something a little funny about censorship? Asian identity wants censorship since it's actually more racist than people just saying racist words. Because now white people can commit horrendous violence on minorities without repercussions. Since now these companies are no longer affected by the bad image. Ronda Rousey gave up her teen years to punishing traditional style training in Judo to reach the highest levels. During this time she cried a lot and then felt embarrassed about crying in front of her teammates and cried some more. She really does come across as being a little too easy to move off center. Unless you're throwing punches at her that is, in which case just send them right down the middle. But hey girl, it's not about the waterworks, it's about the fireworks and not being a do-nothing bitch. Ronda was trained by Judo Dean LaBelle and when she made the transition to MMA, she started getting a lot of early finishes. She'd just throw those girls down and lock on an Olympic level armbar. But Dean neglected to warn Ronda about Judo's major weakness. Judo is the gentle way. It works best when your opponent is charging in and doesn't work when somebody passively picks you apart. And since pretty much everyone in MMA is passive now, her winning streak wasn't gonna last. High level striker Holly Holm saw to that. But you know what? When that fight was coming up, I gotta thank the US UFC promoters and Joe for all the hype they gave Ronda because I won $10,000 betting on it. I almost only won five because the betting limit on Bodog was only $1,000. But then their system glitched out when the fight day was changed and I was able to make a second thousand dollar bet. Ollie was just too high level and turned her into a raging bull. That's not the gentle way. Ronda's hype was like collective hypnosis at that point. Few seemed to take notice of her shadow boxing for the promo and the way it ended. She got kicked in the head, but really she got kicked in the neck. It was a real phone call from hell and Ronda was devastated, but before she left the sport for good to focus on pro wrestling, she had a crack at Amanda Nunes, who knocked out Holly Holm, Holly Holm style. By the way, you know those oblique kicks that John Jones uses? They only really work when you're the taller fighter. Amanda Nunes is called a lioness, I think because she likes to hunt in the bush. Now get this, she's engaged to Nina Ansarov, who fights in the UFC strawweight division. And in 2018, she fought Raquel Pennington, who's engaged to UFC strawweight Ticia Torres. Amanda has credited her success to her relationship, so they got a kind of band of thieves thing going on. With that said though, you know all those love songs you hear on the radio, sung by females? Whenever I hear women sing about love, I keep thinking that they must have homosexual ghostwriters because women don't know the Webster's definition of love. But then, I don't know how strong hypergamy instincts are when it comes to lesbians. I also tend to think that most lesbians are just normal girls who fail to get the attention of a man alpha enough to do it for them. I say if a woman can only have power through a man, then let it be with the most powerful man she can find. Anyways, the way Amanda beat Rhonda exposed her second major flaw. She's got no head movement and she flinches every time she gets hit. I mean, these girls made her stand-up game look so bad, she should put stand-up comedy in her resume. Here's a few more facts about Rhonda. She's very ticklish, a big fan of the Pokemon games, and- Vegeta, Vegeta's where is at. He was my cartoon crush. Love him. You had a cartoon crush? Oh yeah, man, I would've gone cartoon for him. Yeah. <laughs> Don't you see the universe matters more than your meaningless squabble? <laughs> 
Meaningless, huh? huh? What do you know of meaningless? Ah! Ah! Spend most of your life ruled by another. Watch your race dwindle to a handful. Money! Money! And then, tell me what has more meaning than your own strength! You know, I think there will be a Fifth Reich, and this time they'll use BBC to lead the way. As foretold by Charlie Manson, this time, there really will be a Thousand Year Reich. I know they say third time's the charm, but Germans are a little autistic. You should've ruled this planet. You were stronger. Smarter. But then they came. Those inferior dullards. It is time to take back what is mine. I will not live my life as your second. <sighs> that time is over. Every breath you take is an assault to my honor. Look at that. Vegeta is so alpha that he even attracts big beautiful black women. Fedor, the last emperor Emelianenko, came into MMA with high level judo and top level sambo. And his striking resembles that of Igor Vovchanchins, including the use of the Russian hook. Part of an overall style of punching, allegedly developed by Russian sports scientists to be more efficient. And I really have no good argument otherwise. Fedor is a living legend because of the incredible run that he had in pride. And it's not just that he kept winning, but how. I mean, he was like a soul eating demon. Only top tiers like Nogera could take a loss from him and not be broken as a fighter. And I mean, he's a fighter with very few flaws. Psst, take his back if you can. Seriously, Fedor's opponents have often been able to catch his back. It's probably related to his body type. And partly because he tries to shoulder toss people and sneak out the back while he's already mounted. But yeah, there were moments when you thought it was over, but he just comes back and takes it. Like when he got rocked by Kazuyuki Fujita. Supposedly, him waving his hands like that was a distraction technique to buy time. Or that time he got suplexed by Kevin the Monster Randleman. A lot of people held their breath, thinking this would be the first high profile death in MMA. But somehow, his skull survived impact, and he just cracked two ribs, and then he won the fight. And then there was that time, he looked like he was being overpowered by Andrei Arlovsky's striking, when really, he was in control the whole time, dodging and parrying by a narrow margin, and he goes on to knock Arlovsky out from the corner. Now here's a little fun fact about Fedor, he's been legally punched in the balls, because in combat sambo, groin shots are allowed, the only real defense is to pull your hips back, so maybe he felt a little justified in having the biggest smirk on his face I've ever seen, when Mirko Kokop Filipovic was rolling on the floor in pain with his left nut stuck inside of him after a totally unintentional knee to the groin by Alistair Overeem. A lot of people think that Alistair does these nut shots intentionally sometimes, but at least he's no Czech Congo, the Nor Nutcracker. And also, Czech is to giving nut shots what Krokop is to receiving them. When it comes to nut shots, they often change the entire course of the fight because the damage isn't just physical, it's physiological. Those are two internal organs behind a thin layer of skin. I mean, look what happens when someone takes a liver shot. So the unfortunate reality is, if you land a nut shot intentionally, yeah, you may lose a point or whatever, but in the end of the day, you may have already won the fight. The way that Mirko fought, he stalked his opponents, walking them down, which was aided by his great takedown defense. In fact, one of his nicknames is the Wrestler Assassin. And once he has them where he wants them, it's... Hi, but you were saying bullshit about, about me, and that's something I don't like. Okay, something no, I, I apologize, but I... No, you, you don't have to apologize now. Well, now I'm... it's too late. What? 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 Because I didn't, okay. didn't like. Right. You understand? Oh, I do understand. The reason he's called Krokop, by the way, is because he was a commando in the Croatian anti-terrorist unit Alpha. He says he chose that line of work because he was a fan of ninjas as a kid, but he's also a fan of Van Damme, so maybe he was just trying to be that guy from Bloodsport. Krokop's high kicks are special because he learned to extend his leg at the last possible moment, which avoids most blocks. And it's with his devastating left high kick that Krokop took out Fedor's brother Alexander, which set the tone for the super fight that everybody knew was only a matter of time. Fedor went in there very focused on not taking a direct hit from that kick. In fact, he ate a couple hair crosses because they were simply of lesser priority. Eventually though, he managed to all but seal off Krokop's kicks with a well-timed leg kick. And then he took down Krokop multiple times, winning on the scorecard using ground and pound, but never really cracked his man open. It wasn't easy for him. After the fight, he said he never wanted to fight Krokop again, and never did despite Krokop asking for him for his retirement fight. Krokop would go on to fight in the UFC, where he didn't fare as well as he did in the pride ring. He even got Krokop by Gabriel Gonzaga. As to the reason why, well of course there's the elephant in the room. His knees weren't getting their monthly HDH injections. But really though, I think it comes down to the difference between the ring and the cage. A guy like him who stalks his prey benefits from the smaller ring and four corners. The way that Krokop would use the ring, 
reminds me of this one body shots boxing match I had. My opponent, whose backyard ring we were fighting in, was like 350 pounds. He had the head of a gorilla, the body of a hippo, the arms of a T-Rex, and the legs of an elephant. I mean, this was a strange guy. He would invite kids over that were way smaller than him to be used for training. The ground was literally stained with children's blood, and it was so compacted from him always walking around it that falling was like hitting concrete. But yeah, this guy used to hang out at the comic store all day. Then all of a sudden, he decided to drop out of high school and just train every single day. And not just in boxing. He was in judo and cracked my friend's skull by belly flopping on him. Seriously, judo could do to have a little consideration for weight classes when it comes to training. This guy was also a big time gym rat, and I'm talking marathon workouts. He'd be there for hours every day, and he was super insecure. He forced his friends to touch his thighs, because that was the only part of him that had any visible semblance of strength. And to show that he's not just some fat guy, he boxed people in the Canadian military. It got to where some of those military guys refused to box him. Military men might not be tough, but he proved his point because they are in shape. Anyways, this ring, which was undersized by the way, was made out of metal poles and iron wires. It literally could have killed me. So as the lighter and more mobile guy, I keep jumping in and out, landing jabs to his guts. But it was getting dark out. I didn't even realize how little room I had to work with, and he quickly cornered me. He hadn't even thrown a single punch up till then. He knew what he was doing, and it was time. He drilled me into the ropes, but not fast. He's not a fast twitch fiber guy. Before this match, I had showed off that I had a half-decent six-pack, and he said that because of that, I qualified for the match, which made no sense, cause it's not like I had extra thick muscle, I just had low body fat. With that rubber stamp qualification, I was now a dangerous opponent, made of solid iron. So it was perfectly understandable that just when I thought he would finally retract his fist from my guts, he had another inch to go. After taking just two of those, my guts were heaving violently, and my strength was gone. I was already trying to fall down and get reset before the third one hit, and then my legs were really gone. After a couple seconds on the floor, I still had a little more in me though, so we reset, and I rushed in with a flurry of jabs, and jumped back. I didn't think that I was getting anywhere and I didn't have the guts to go in for a real power shot so I started getting walked down again. Too bad though because my friend would later tell me that those jabs were actually working. He had a pained expression on his face. So I get drilled into the ropes again. This time I get punched clean through and crumple into the fetal position. There was a little bit of blood in my urine the next day so I'm not that unhappy with myself for calling it quits there. And as for that backyard ring, the police would eventually show up to shut it down. The last match that guy and his crew had for a long time was in a tunnel underneath some baseball bleachers. I was there getting the shit beat out of me. My opponent was throwing non-stop hooks and I didn't know how to break his rhythm. Still won though, cause one of my early successes had broken his hearing aid. Yeah, up till that caught up to him, the guy was smoking cigarettes between rounds. Anyways, so after Pride, Fedor went and had a little quickie with Tim Sylvia at the short-lived Affliction promotion. And people wonder why there's no Sasquatch sightings in Russia. Then he went to Strike Force, where Brett Rogers gave him a bit of a tough go until he got his head knocked off. And then there was his fight with Fabricio Verdun. You know, when Fedor was walking out for that fight, my first thought was Kate Winslow was a fucking psychopath. The way she let Cyborg just keep mauling Jan Finney, it's like she was the lookout. And then I thought, does Fedor have diverticulitis now or something? He looks kinda sickly. Still Still though, he's Fedor. He does well enough on the feet, knocking Verdum down, and then he goes and jumps directly into the guy's black belt guard and gets triangled. Sure, he knew how to crack a guy open in his guard, with ground and pound alone, but there was no need to be rushing like that. If he hadn't, Verdum would have stayed sitting and butt scooted towards Fedor, like jump in, the water's fine. And Fedor would be like, where I'm from, they kick fools like you in the head, no questions asked. And then the ref would stand him up and rinse and repeat. There was just no need. So after his first real loss, Fedor was matched up against Antonio Bigfoot Silva. He gets Brazilian Donkey Kong for the entire second round and loses by doctor stoppage. He briefly considered retirement, but as long as their bodies can still do it, they almost always come back. And in recent years, he's given us a couple fights in Bellator against former UFC guys. Here's your chance, Randy Couture. It's time to leave humanity behind, you old dinosaur. Become a TRT Ranosaurus. Alexander Emelianenko was arguably born with just as much talent as Fedor. I mean, he's got some skills for all kinds of odd jobs, because he can cut a man up just by throwing a hat. Like his brother, he's also won many high-level sambo and judo competitions before getting into MMA. The reason why Alexander didn't get to be number one Batman is probably just a combination of dumb luck, the fact that he's more striking focused instead of well balanced like his brother, and the fact that he can't seem to contain his wild blood to the ring. Fedor and Alexander have given differing accounts on just how much time Alex spent incarcerated in his younger years. Alexander being the one to always minimize or straight up say that he didn't do nothing. But his jailhouse tattoos tell their own story. Alex has also reportedly claimed that he was regularly beating Fedor in practice. To which Fedor basically responded that his brother was getting drunk on fame, without needing to mention that not even prison could teach him any kind of bro code. When Krokop head kicked Alex, I couldn't tell if Fedor was more angry at Krokop or disappointed in his brother. As if Krokop was on the job as a commando and threw a special left high kick that sent Alex straight to jail for some unknown crime. When the pride days were over, Alex failed his blood test to fight an affliction like his brother. They didn't announce the reason to the public, but the rumor was that he tested positive for hepatitis B, which of course Alex denied. 
You know, he really reminds me of a heavyweight boxer from the Mike Tyson era named Tommy Morrison. Tommy came from a line of boxers and was born with Chad Tier genetics, beating full-grown adults in the ring at just 13 years old. As the great white hope of his era, he spent a good part of his career chasing a Tyson fight, but then Mike goes and gets knocked out by Buster Douglas, and the matchup just never happens. Nevertheless, Tommy did take the World Boxing Organization title a few times, and the whole way through, Tommy liked to party. He'd be out drinking and getting with the ladies almost every night. Those Chad jeans, eh? But here's where it gets greasy. In 1996, the Nevada Athletic Commission announced that Tommy had tested positive for HIV, and in the fallout of that, it was revealed that he had been hiding his condition, or at least his suspicion of his condition, for years. Presumably, and also very selfishly, so that he could keep fighting and not scare the pussy away. Tommy died at age 44, after a new wife of his had convinced him that he didn't need his AIDS meds, and replaced them with a meth addiction. He must have already been in rough shape when they met, because apparently she saw more use in him dead than alive. Some women are like xenomorphs, their reproductive drive tells them they must eat through a man. He must have had a weak mind to let her talk him into all that shit, it's not like he had a magic Johnson. So yeah, I see some parallels here with Alexander, and also also, Alex was charged with sexually assaulting his housekeeper, reportedly holding on to her passport and expecting her to work in order to return home to Moldova. He originally denied this, then backpedaled saying it was consensual, but ended up going to prison for a while, where we got this awesome photo of him looking like a diabetic grandmother. But he got out, hit the gym, took some supplements, and he's back to fighting again, this time under the nickname of the Grim Reaper. I think that was a typo actually, there's one too many E's. And ever since that undisclosed test result at Affliction, he only fights in Russia and surrounding areas. All that said, Alex is once again popular with the ladies. In fact, in May 2019, he got into a drunk driving slash fleeing police incident, when all he was trying to do was deliver his golden chariot to Cinderella. In 2017, Fedor called Alexander a Judas in an open letter, saying he burns all those who try to be there for him. Do you know the way that Judas betrayed Jesus? He gave him the kiss of death identifying him to the Roman soldiers who were looking to send him back to daddy. And did you know that Jesus is a better boxer than Jake Paul? He knows how to turn the other cheek. And did you also know that Jesus did have a dad? His name was Tiberius Julius Abdus Pantera. So forget about Joseph, because his daddy wasn't his daddy. While his real dad, a Roman soldier, probably of Germanic origin, gave him those degenerate genes. So I wouldn't even listen to Jesus if I were you. Two people who aren't going to save you. Herb Dean and Jesus Christ. If there's one version in this whole situation, it's Joseph. He died inside for the sins of gullible beta males everywhere. Tito Ortiz is a ground and pound fighter from the Chuck Liddell era. In fact, he had a bit of a rivalry with Chuck. He even went with the 90s flame shorts as an answer to Chuck's icy balls. But it only seemed to matter in their final fight when Chuck was pushing 50. That fight was honestly hard to watch. But for Tito, it sparked a sudden resurgence in popularity. It's not so much that people want to watch Tito fight some more. They want him to open his mouth. I was listening to Kristen Walken, uh, little skit he did and he talked about a lion king of the jungle this huge lion with a big giant mane in this hot smothering weather in Africa and the little small lions come up kind of poke at him bite on his ear bite on his neck the lioness comes over and buzz, bugs him then you got the jackals and the rest of the wilderness looking and seeing this lions on that mountaintop and they come over and bother him the jackals laugh at him the hyenas laugh at him nip at his toes, they eat all of his food, and they sit back, and they got jackals like this, who think it's a comedy, until one day he gets sick of it, and he attacks, and he shows to these people who are the fucking king of the jungle is. It's not the biting that hurts her, it's the male's penis. I take care of myself now, now it's about my kids, you know, I want to live. I want to outlive my children, of course, 100%. That's the most boomer thing I heard all year. You know, Tito's mother actually died in childbirth. Well, either that or he's got that HDH head. But yeah, I do got a big head. You want to I got a big head? Because I got a lot of brains, baby. You know, steroids can do some crazy things to a person. I've even heard a legend that they can thin out an adolescent man's hips. So maybe one day, if they finally come around on this steroid issue, no man will have to come off the line with low-class, childbearing hips. Until then, there's the black pants and light-colored shirt combination, because black is a slimming color. And by the way, people think that estrogen in our food and drink is a modern issue, but white people have been doing the whole estrogen thing for a long time. Before the Catholic Church rolled into the North, they had a mead culture, meaning they drank fermented honey. The church forced them to instead drink beer, filled with the world's strongest plant estrogen. 
and I mean they really pushed the beer. Medieval peasants would often drink beer to stay hydrated because it was more available than safe water. You know what Tito's big head reminds me of? That time he got into a back alley brawl that involved a bunch of other fighters. Chuck Liddell and Pat Militage were holding their own, and Tito, who at the time was light heavyweight champ, faced off against Lee Murray. He threw a punch at Lee, who's probably a natural middleweight, and missed. Lee then countered with a combination that dropped Tito and proceeded to put the boots to him on the floor. This story is based on secondhand accounts, so, and they're not all in agreement about the finer points. But here's what Tito had to say about it. Lee Murray is part of Mafia, so I'll leave it at that. I won't answer. Lee's quite a guy though. As a teen, him and his crew, the Buttmarsh Boys, took over territory from Nigerian drug dealers after a violent turf war. He even had a reputation for punking policemen on the streets. Although keep in mind, this is the UK I'm talking about, not locked and loaded USA. He's also been stabbed pretty badly, and they had to give him non-stop blood bags for him to survive the stitch-up operation. And aside from all his crimes, the lasting damage that had on his body really put a damper on his MMA career. What he's best known for now is being the alleged mastermind of the Securitas Depot robbery. Him and his crew managed to rob the Bank of England of 90 $92 million. It involved everything from kidnapping to impersonating police officers. It was no simple plan. And now he's sorry that he couldn't be perfect because he's stuck in prison. Still though, other people who were involved got sentenced to life, while Lee almost managed to get his sentence of 25 years reduced to 10. Frankly, I think bank robbery should be a slap on the wrist. For all we know, he was just trying to take the back door to a small business loan and got carried away. Rules matter quite a bit in MMA. One little tweak can force a fighter to change up their whole strategy. For example, stomps, kicks, and knees to the head of a grounded opponent were allowed in Valley Tudo, Pride, and the early UFC. But under the unified rules of MMA, which the modern UFC falls under, of all those things, you're only allowed to kick to the body. While in Japanese organizations, that have tried to follow in Pride's footsteps, there's been a lot of freedom to kick and stomp. And you know, the thing about Japan, a lot of those Japanese fighters from the Pride days seem to have gotten a pretty raw deal. They've taken so much abuse, and what I hear is they didn't even make that much, especially the smaller guys. And I might just be talking over my ass here, but if we consider the fact that a lot of these guys also come from the Puro Resu world, I think a lot of these guys were being used by the Yakuza in a similar fashion to prostitutes, forced into having their cherry pop by some steroid-headed westerner. Anyways, in the 1FC, they're kind of in between, because they do allow stomps to the body. And when the ref determines that the grounded fighter is still conscious, he'll give the all clear to the standing fighter, which allows him to start kicking his opponent in the head. Now I think, as long as we've got some refs that'll do their job, these kinds of moves should be allowed. Unless that person on the ground is completely out of it, they're not defenseless. For example, they can wait for the standing person to go for a stomp, and then stomp them right in the kneecap. For that matter, you shouldn't even be a sitting target. It's common sense in a fight, even if you're on the ground, that you gotta keep moving. Of course, my main gripe about this rule in the first place though is that it lays out a red carpet for wrestlers in their takedowns. Unless you're super preemptive like Jorge Masvidal and throw a flying knee at the very twinkle in your opponent's eye of a takedown attempt, you can't even threaten them with a knee when they're on their way in, cause they know you'll get Dairy Queened. That's if you knock them out with it. Otherwise, you'll just lose points with the judges and hope that you still did enough damage to make the rest of this fight easy. One move that's always been a bit contentious is the grape choke. And the rule with this one is, basically, you're not allowed to use your thumb to crush their trachea, which obviously takes away a lot of grip strength, so you'd have to be like some Bob Sapp type guy to still apply the choke. Even then, your thumb would still run across their trachea anyways, there's just nowhere else to put it, so essentially it is banned. Now, pile drivers are another whole can of worms. Also known as spiking, this is where you drive your opponent's head straight down into the mat. They were allowed in Pride, just ask Noguera. One doesn't allow them, just ask Christian Lee. In fact, the throw that Lee used against Edward Kelly that got him DQ'd wasn't even a true pile drive. Instead of spiking him into the ground like a nail, it was an arcing suplex, but apparently one doesn't allow suplexes of any kind. This is quite different from the unified rules, which allow suplexes and have quite a strict definition of an illegal spike. It basically comes down to two requirements. Number one being that you're controlling and manipulating your opponent's body to force them into the spike. So say they've got you in an arm bar and you're standing, you can pull up your arm and drill them onto their head. That's legal, because they had the choice to let go. The other requirement is that they had to be thrown straight down, 90 degrees, and not in an arc to be considered a spike. So even if you trap somebody's arms and drill them head first into the mat, as long as you threw them over your shoulder getting there, you're good. With all these requirements, it's very hard for a ref to call somebody out for a spike in the middle of the action. So in practice, this rule is generally not actually enforced. Now, elbows tend to be a concern because of their effectiveness at causing cuts. Now, no MMA organization that I've seen seems too concerned about the volume of blood lost by fighters, but one little cut above the eye can lead to obstructed vision, bringing a disappointing end to an otherwise competitive fight due to doctor stoppage. So in the interest of good action, elbows weren't allowed in Pride, or its successors, up until Ryzen, which only allows them in certain fights. In 1FC, elbows are allowed, period, and in the unified rule, they have one silly stipulation, no 12 to 6 elbows. Basically, if you just imagine a clock in front, or maybe below you, depending on where you're looking, you can't bring your elbows from 12 to 6 on your opponent. It's not as if these elbows are particularly dangerous, it's just that sometimes people need to make rules just to justify their jobs. A lot of the best of the unified rules actually come straight from ref Big John McCarthy. For example, it was his idea that a ref should be able to stop the action if they determined that a fighter can no longer intelligently defend themselves. Before then, he saw how corners could not be depended on to throw in the towel and protect their fighters when things get ugly. Like 
Even the fighter who won gets mad at the ref sometimes for not stopping it sooner, and even sometimes at their opponent for choosing to snap out instead of tap out. Another rule he created was that fighters could no longer stick their fingers into the orifices of their opponents, and this includes open cuts because fighters were trying to tear them open more. Now as for groin shots, there's not many combat sports in general that allow them, but the ones that do include combat sambo, valley tudo, pride never allowed them. I mean sure, half the fighters balls aren't producing natural test anyways, but it's just bad for action, and they're illegal in one and the unified rules. In the UFC, from the very beginning, they were illegal, but for a little while, they actually made the active choice to allow them. You know, they were going for a certain image back then, they didn't want anybody calling them soft-boiled. You know, supposedly there's a kung fu technique, known as iron egg, that'll let you suck your balls up into your pelvis for combat. You castle your family jewels, but you leave your wiener without cushioning, it might end up looking like a roadkill snake. By the way, in women's MMA, they don't allow groin or titty shots. You're also not allowed to punch to the back of the head. There's a bit of contention about the exact area at which you're not allowed to strike. But the main point is, that's where the medulla oblongata, which controls vital functions, resides. And by the way, damage to the prefrontal cortex can cause narcissism. Damage to the prefrontal cortex and hippocampus can cause anxiety and depression. Damage to the cortex, or thinking part of the brain, also causes bad regulation of anger, resulting in behaviors, such as the Chris Benoit case, that a lot of people like to blame on roid rage. I mean, steroids will turn a douchebag into a more confident douchebag with a little more potential for violence, but brain damage will set you loose. Pro wrestling, and football for that matter, are very brain damaging professions. And I'm not gonna lie, there's signs of former MMA fighters getting a screw knock loose as well. I just don't like how they put it on steroids like that. The fact is, that any sport where there's any kind of money to be made, there's performance enhancing drugs being used. Fighting though, actually is a special case, because it's not just about acquiring resources, fame, and glory. It's about not taking a shit ton of damage from some guy rooted to the gills just because you think you're better than that. Jacked up on steroids beyond belief. So back in like the 90s, everyone was pretty much freewheeling on about as much enhancement as they were willing to take. CG didn't, you know, I, rem I remember uh, for my first UFC fights, they had faxed over my blood work. I forgot to bring it and they had faxed it over. And I remember sitting across the table from the doctor and the doctor looking at my liver enzymes and going, do you realize that this is like eight times the normal amount you're supposed to have? And I'm like, yeah. And he goes, I just want you to be aware of that. And I'm like, okay, I'm aware of it. And that was it. You know, and you just go on and, you know, they allow you to fight. What are you talking about? Ken Shamrock uh, also tested um, positive for steroids recently. Do you think that there's um, a lot of pressure on fighters as they get older to try and sort of keep their bodies going? Man, Ken Shamrock, man, come on. Look at him from the beginning. <laughs> <laughs> the California Athletic Commission. I never entered into the ring while using steroids. I was never in the ring and fought with steroids, ever. Just to get that clear, but I have used steroids. It wasn't until the early 2000s that we really started seeing some testing, and even then it was like the equivalent of a pregnancy pee strip. Usually, right before the fight. Now pro tip here, anyone who wants to try and pass a piss test using a fake dick at a pouch of urine. Glove warmers are your friend, cause pissing cold can be as bad as pissing hot. You gotta give the testers a little credit, you know? One time, Thiago Silva got caught for producing a sample that was inconsistent with human urine. Did you ask him about steroids? Um, no, I, listen, in, in this day and age, with everything that's going on in sports, if you're taking steroids, you're a moron. Everybody's on steroids. Everybody's on steroids. Because his teammates have been caught. Because the whole roster's on steroids. All you motherfuckers are on steroids. All you motherfuckers, all you're on steroids. Um, uh, growth hormone, I think, is illegal. And I think that floats around a lot. Uh, steroids are obviously illegal. And I, I, I know there's, there's people, I know firsthand people do it. And I know I've heard down the road through the grapevine that people do it. A steroid epidemic. So jumping ahead to modern times, the United States Anti-Doping Commission, or USADA, wants fighters to report the locations at all times so that they can be subject to random testing. Sounds good in theory, but there's always ways to beat the test. It's not 100% sure, but let's say I want to have an injection of a product that will last in my body for two days or one day. Mm -hmm. So I know that particular day I cannot be tested because if I am, I'm screwed. So I put in my whereabout that I'm traveling to the Antarctica or anywhere like somewhere that is believable and then I come back in two days after. That substance will stay in my body for a certain period of time but it will the effect of it will last maybe a month. One method that has worked for a long time is diuretic masking agents. A diuretic is basically something that makes you want to pee more. Caffeine is a good example but there's much stronger stuff out there. 
much of which is already banned by USADA. The way the diuretics mask steroid use is by decreasing the concentration of it in your pee by increasing the release of water. And as an added bonus, they make weight cuts a lot easier, but of course it's dangerous to be massively dehydrated. Case in point, 21-year-old 1FC fighter Yan Jin Bing died as a result of his weight cut. This prompted one to bring in the hydration tests, so now fighters can't mummify themselves to fight shorties. As for USADA, they did things in a roundabout kind of way. They banned the use of IVs of a certain amount to rehydrate between the weigh-ins and the fight, because it's actually not that easy to rehydrate quickly. The only effective means for them to get halfway healthy in the time they've got is to put it directly into their system. Because what is happening is the people who are making the most money are the people that can obviously spend money to cheat, to get around the testing. So as a result of them banning IVs, a lot of UFC fighters look pretty deflated now. The reason being that steroids are the only way that you can do a massive water weight cut and not lose all your gains. So while I doubt they actually thought it through that much, it's actually kind of effective. Not that there's not still plenty of options left to fighters, especially those making good money. Steroids with a short half-life but a long-lasting effect are one example. And then there's designer steroids. All you do is take a more typical anabolic steroid that they would most definitely test for and then you change the molecule here and there. As long as it's a fairly new formulation, it'll slip past the current testing. Keyword current. Because you see, they hold on to old samples to possibly be retested later using newer methods. If they actually did this large scale though, it would be chaos. They'd have to rewrite the history such that divisions go without champions for years on end. Now, as I mentioned with Vitor Bell, for it. For a while there, they were allowing TRT exemptions. Now that's a loophole for dummies. You know how easy it is to get diagnosed with low testosterone? Pretty much everything in the West has that effect. Back when I was like 16, I was doing a bodybuilding competition with a buddy. I started doing this Lee Priest routine, but without the Holy Sacrament, you know? Basically, I was doing six days a week in the gym, two hours a day, heavy compounds and supersets and all that. By the end of the third week, my testosterone was so low that I started crying while doing overhead presses. It's not like this was a low point in my life. I even had a couple girls at school admiring my gains. I just had a sad. So literally just overtrain and then run into the doctors like, help, I can't stop crying. I need 20 cc's of not give a fuck. And really, any kind of abuse to your overall body will lower your tests, like sleep deprivation or dehydration. Okay, now, if I tell you, hey buddy, I'm gonna test you on June 18th, just before the fight, we're all gonna have a test. Don't you think people that are making a lot of money would find a way around it? Now there's another way that fighters can still take stuff and get around the modern testing, called microdosing. In other words, taking a small amount of a fast-acting substance, which will only have a half-life of a few hours. They could take this substance in the morning on their way out the door, then take the long way to the gym, maybe sit in a parking lot for a while watching your opponent's fight footage. And when you do get to the gym, your support staff will run a full blood and urine test to make sure that you come out clean. By doing frequent tests like that, you can dial in exactly what you can get away with, and just make sure that you can't really be tested at those times that you would turn up for a banned substance. So instead of just day by day, you could think about hour by hour. And if that somehow falls through, you can have your eagle-eyed support staff alert you to when the testing people show up. It only takes a couple seconds to scramble under your gym ring into your back cave full of Clomid. You know, one thing certain fighters have been accused of doing is retiring for a little while to get out of the testing pool and then run a few cycles of the hard stuff before coming back. Stuff that's so hard hitting that it has the potential to cause a permanent change on an epigenetic level. Another possible option is to be prepared to claim tainted supplements. I mean, I know for a fact that there's stuff that's on the market from time to time that'll make you piss hot. Companies do this without actually listing it on the bottle, presumably to have an edge over the competition. So if you know ahead of time that a certain supplement is yet to be revealed for the nasty little character that it actually is, well you've got plausible deniability in taking it. Or you could just say screw it, take a Cialis and hope for the best. Another option, which I haven't yet heard of when it comes to MMA, is tattoos. It's possible to have a tattoo that functions much like a transdermal patch, very slowly releasing testosterone or some other steroid into your system. It's one way to try and fly under the radar basically. We've been doing this for what, a hundred years? Where people have been using some sort of substance for athletics? And yet every single year we find a new way to get around it. This is, this is medical science that's getting better every year and you're always able to cheat on it. Now, just to show you how prevalent steroids and other PEDs are in MMA, we'll go through a list of fighters who've been caught using them. And this is really just the tip of the iceberg. The point is, it's kind of pointless to not take them at this point because of the amount of brain damage that you'll take if you don't, being at a disadvantage. You know, there's two types of fighters out there, those on steroids and those who need a new coach. Of course, it could also be said that there's two types of coaches out there, those that can teach you how to fight and those that can teach you how to avoid a drug test. But reality is what it is. At best, drug tests can get rid of most of the really blatantly obvious stuff. But it's really about public image. And you know, I think those organizations that claim to want sterility should put their money where their mouth is and pay for their own anti-drug programs, while the government should go fund something else. The commission should really just stop testing fighters because it's pointless. The only result will be that fighters who choose not to take steroids end up taking a ton of extra 
extra damage. Instead, those test people should put their skills and equipment to use, testing people in the government and police forces, since their jobs aren't reliant on PED use, but they are easily subverted by criminals, making any drug showing up in their systems a huge red flag. If you watch the news, you would think steroids is the drug problem in America. I've been all across this great country buying drugs and shit. I have never... <laughs> I have never ran into a steroid salesman. Have one of you niggas ever ran into You know, I once asked this drug dealer why he doesn't sell steroids. He laughed and said that it's because it doesn't make as much money. You see, in the long run, destructive drugs earn more money because they're used for subversion. Now, if you look at the statistics for steroid users, on average, they're quite well off. A good portion of them have university education. So this market does certainly have money to spend, but it's not just about money. It's about influence. Like for real, the media is so hard on steroids, but if you read the actual statistics on deaths caused by steroids, it's a joke. Like there's no way that they could play with these numbers to make steroids look all that threatening. Instead, they conflate steroids with stories having a dubious link to them to get that emotional response. Like, first off, what's with the anecdotal evidence? And more importantly, it would be a lot easier sell for me if it was like a baseball player and not football or pro wrestler cause brain damage. Now I'm not saying that there's no risk at all, but it's pretty manageable for somebody who goes about using them with discipline and intelligence. So yeah, these well-to-do steroid users might offer a lucrative niche market, but power is more important. The drug game is about subverting people, usually children, who might grow up to be influential one day, so that they might do your bidding. The dumb boomer joke of child sacrifices refers to exactly this. In fact, a lot of online conspiracies are just old boomer jokes referring to very real crimes. Now to state the obvious, the reason why they almost always target children is because you're gonna have a hard time convincing a grown-ass adult to do drugs. The only real exception I can think of is when somebody gets injured and their doctor gets them hooked on opioids. Now, in recent times, there's been some pretty high-profile cases of major banks being caught laundering drug money. But don't kid yourself, money laundering is everywhere, especially in big companies. Some don't even try hard enough to maintain an appearance of being a profitable company. You know, on YouTube, there's this show called Drug Slap, and it doesn't show it near the description like most government-funded shows do, but this show is funded by the Dutch government. In the show, they get these young people to try different drugs and to describe their experience. Showing drug use to kids like this is an obvious violation of YouTube's vague policies. Dutch companies make a lot of drugs, which they've exported, going back at least as far as the Dutch East India Company. And for example, in 2017, a study found that Netherlands produced the largest amount of ecstasy per year. Back in the 1910s, the Netherlands was the world's largest producer of cocaine, and that infrastructure has stuck around as far as the 1960s when it was criminalized. Nowadays, of course, cocaine is usually produced in the same third world countries where the plant is grown and then exported. But that doesn't mean that European interests don't get a sizable cut. Netherlands is known as a transit country for both cocaine and heroin. Most of the hate comes from Afghanistan through the Balkans. But as recently as 2017, there was a big bust of heroin producers inside the country. And if you take the dark web markets as an indication, a good amount of drug sellers report operating out of the Netherlands. Frankly, I think all this attention put on cannabis and coffee shops in the country is just a distraction from what's really going on. You know, as dirty as fighting sports might look, truth is, corruption is everywhere. But you know what? To that point, I've got an idea that could start things moving in a better direction. Listen carefully. There is a way to end corruption in government and companies, which makes our lives so much harder than they need to be, by using the death penalty. What I'm talking about is a grassroots anti-corruption campaign. People involved in this grassroots movement will get money for each person that's caught that is corrupt. I'm talking about 33% of the money seized from white-collar criminals is to be dispersed among the people involved. The rest goes into the bank accounts of the rest of the population. Another crucial point to this is that the death penalty takes place in public for millions to see and the public gets to inspect the body, which is obviously important in this day and age because most white collar criminals are international criminals. They can easily escape if it's not the case. Now, whoever thinks that they are skilled enough to do the job can and should join, such as law professors or even retired military men or people in finance, accountants, private detectives. And also, there is no need to worry about foreign countries interfering if, we simply teach children advanced covert warfare at a young age for multiple years. This will make them immune to foreign interference. I mean, teaching young children about covert warfare is just better than having a bunch of excess rules. Since it comes to a point where you're impeding your own success and being manipulated by your enemy, if every time someone makes a threat and that threat dictates your actions, you're gonna live a miserable life. It's easier to just prepare for war. Anyways, I'll talk more about covert warfare to give you a better picture of how it works once I'm done fleshing out this plan. So I actually got the idea for this from watching a Chinese Communist Party member being sentenced to death. I mean, my first thought was that they're doing it wrong because it's not a public death. I also got the idea from Klaus Schwab and his Great Reset. I think this idea can be considered a hybrid, where communism mates with meritocracy. I mean, the only way for communism to work is if it rides on the back of meritocracy. And to have meritocracy, you've got to get rid of white-collar criminals in government, and their extended family members who own big corporations that absorb crime money. 
Once their safety net, aka corruption, is banished, superior people can finally shape the world for the better. And I'm sure that these people who dictate our lives feel the same way because they think their decisions are better than the majority's, so they don't need the safety net. If they really believe in their own hype, they can compete just fine without corruption, instead of just crippling everyone else with financial warfare. But yeah, the death penalty will start with white collar criminals and government first, because those people can always force normal people to do crime using financial warfare. But then, after them and their crime network is gone, we can start handing out that shit like candy to everyone who deserves it. Therefore, only people who are strong can survive. And as a joke that Mr. Claus will understand, we will call it the Fifth Reich instead of Industrial Revolution, because that's code word for economic warfare. So again, the ones who bust corruption get 33%, and the rest goes into the bank accounts of the general population. So this is communism, alright, it's like Robin Hood. It will end up creating a trillion dollar industry. Another aspect here is that the police force should get paid a higher salary. Military soldiers also, but they will have to do community work to form a deep connection with the people. This is because the government likes to use gangsters to harass the public, especially allowing gangsters to enter the police force. This will help people stop the loose cannons within the police force that are secretly gangsters. This Great Reset Fifth Reich will be like that Orwell book. It's up backwards. Instead of Big Brother breathing down your neck, it's reversed. This will end poverty. You'll be happy even if you own nothing like they say. Because a million can randomly enter your bank account if someone gets caught. Another perk here is that people have been talking about 3D printing organs, but that's not for another like 200 years. With this death penalty, you can have a steady supply of organs. You know, there's a lot of companies out there, especially in New York and California, especially tech companies, that actually have razor thin profit margins, and without taking in drug money, they wouldn't be shit. Take a look at the government's actions in those two places, and consider this. For massive crime to exist, you've got to have people in the government protecting the criminals. Now it should be obvious that time is a factor here. This needs to be rushed, like they rushed the industrial revolution, because as long as soldiers are still human this is possible. Once soldiers get replaced by robots though, it is no longer possible. Guys, at the end of the day, soldiers are just poorly paid people who get mistreated by the so-called elites. But at the same time, they are the reason why the powerful are powerful. Once soldiers side with the people of the country, rather than these megalomaniacs, we can finally have world peace. Now, let's talk about the current precedent for the death penalty. In the US, 25 states have the death penalty, so there's a strong legal framework in place right now for this grassroots movement to build upon. It's fair to say that people outside of government need to have greater influence on laws that are made, as a lot of laws are made to protect criminals. I mean, to give you an example of how little control the majority actually has, let's look at federal judges. These judges can only be removed through an act of the United States Congress, which has only ever happened a few times. They're essentially immune to being fired on the spot for misconduct. Conduct. You know, while doing research, I came across a concept called open source government, which is a lot like what I'm talking about here. But you still need the death penalty for this to work. If nobody dies, they can just play around and move money around using the law, such as whistleblowers being used for money laundering. I've looked at many cases of scandals at drug companies, and the whistleblowers involved, sometimes highly placed executives, get suspiciously huge payouts from the court. Now I'm not saying that I'm sure that's what they're doing, although it was my first thought, but it's certainly what they can do. But people aren't going to play along with this kind of thing if someone has to die in the process. Maybe they can get a poor person to take a hit once in a while, so that their family gets a lot of money, but in the long run it's just not going to work anymore. Now in many parts of the world, people are sentenced to death for rape, usually cases of aggravated rape, but still, these days a lot of immature women like to throw around the word rape for fun. A girl could regret her actions last night, or intentionally fall on her face and claim rape, and a man dies. The point is, the death penalty can actually be pretty flimsy. It certainly wouldn't be the worst thing in the world if the majority had more say in how these laws are structured. And by the way, COVID made it obvious that the US success is obviously linked to crime. Because when COVID hit, the crime capitals of New York and California got exposed. Women have actually known what's up for a long time. I've known a lot of Canadian girls who were trying to get their nerdy boyfriends to move with them to New York or California with a plan to cheat on them with a white collar criminal. I also know this Chinese guy who got cucked in New York. His wife wanted to get in on that crime money. She was parading around this obviously half a child with murky green eyes. Like this guy's older daughter is obviously full Chinese, but his younger son is Hapa. With diarrhea green murky eyes and brown hair. I think that white collar criminals cuck a lot of people, like to the point that those two places should have mandatory paternity tests. And also think about it, Canadian girls with nerdy boyfriends technically already have a rich boyfriend because they can get a good career, right? So they know what's going on over there because the only people who earn more money are criminals or celebrities or maybe company owners. They obviously go to those two places to monkey branch for criminal dick. I mean, who really wants to live there? It's full of crime. Truth be told, most nerds probably aren't even raising their own kids. And by the way, I'm not trying to make Chinese men look bad. That's just a relevant story that I happen to know. Obviously, it's white guys and black guys who are more likely to be cucked by Chad Thunderstorm, since the child would look completely white or completely black, unless you insist on living dangerously. And seriously, New York people are weird as fuck. I know this one guy who worked at his dad's convenience store, and he had a habit of saying nigger in broad daylight. 
Like this is New York. There's black people everywhere, so it's abnormal. But it started to make sense when his family talked about him. You see, blacks would often rob that convenience store his father owned, and they would shoot first and ask questions later. So literally, all day, he has to be ready to duck bullets that come flying in. And one day, he asks his father if he can buy a gun, right? And his dad tells him that it's better to be killed than to kill someone. His father literally valued the lives of random black criminals over his own flesh and blood. Unsurprisingly, he no longer lives with his father, and they're no longer close. Literally, everyone I know from New York is a mess. You know what's funny, actually? People always talk about how bad censorship is in China. But because of Chinese culture, it doesn't even really work over there. There's over 50 million Chinese people overseas, all over the world. Because of Chinese collectivism, they know that a lot of European countries are addicted to drugs and aren't really much of a threat. When it comes to Chinese people, one person can know 40,000, and so can their family members. Even just face-to-face -face word of mouth spreads incredibly fast. So censorship doesn't do anything for their government besides high crime. In an individualistic country though, censorship is very dangerous. You know, the internet is actually not a great source for knowledge, because knowledge is profitable and people aren't just going to put that out for free. Even if they charge, it'll end up being pirated, and they'll lose whatever strategic advantage that knowledge provided. I mean, they still haven't figured out a way to provide easy access to quality knowledge yet, and I don't think they're trying. Instead, the internet internet primarily is, or was, a source of justice. A place for whistleblowers to spread the word about injustice. And now, that we live in a hyper-individualistic culture, and that the internet is censored, we can't defend ourselves from criminals. So why am I talking about grassroots? Well first let's define it so we're on the same page. Grassroots movements are based around actions at a local level. The idea is good and attractive if I do say so myself. So I don't think the risks of trying to start some big centralized organization are worth it. It's better just to spread this message as far and wide as possible. There is certainly energy to make this happen. We just need to get educated people involved who can work out the kinks in the legal system which was created to be flawed in the first place, and so use their own system against the corrupt. Where it is not already, the government needs to make the death penalty legal in the first place, as we are working within the legal framework. This is not unprecedented, by the way. It's somewhat similar to the French Revolution, where they tried to do things within a newly established legal framework. And by the way, you probably already know this, but fines don't work to root out corruption. It's a joke. It's considered a cost of doing business. So the main thing is just to spread this idea so that it gains popular support and people start taking action on a grassroots level. So I think that stories are a good tool, such as cases of injustice where people just walked away after being proven to be massively corrupt and just how much people have been deprived and made to suffer as a result. In fact, eliciting a sense of relative deprivation is a commonly used tool to get people riled up. It's all about how you package it. Living in this individualistic society obviously makes things a little bit of a pain in the ass though. But there's plenty of individual incentive, so it's just a matter of communicating effectively. Hashtag everybody can get some. So as for covert warfare, I want to talk about feminism, because there's more to it than you might think. You see, the people in power are threatened by women, since the amount of power women can gain in a short amount of time is pretty insane. Women have the support of both women and men which means their influence and power far exceeds that of men. Men cannot get the true support of women. What is considered support is really just investment, since women despise weak men. So the concept of feminism is simply used to trick women into suppressing their sexuality without forcing them to therefore decrease the amount of power and influence they have. Since in truth, for a woman, to gain a lot of power is relatively easy. Women are genetically wired to be social. It's rare to come across an autistic female. Simply by seducing competent men, they can easily gain power through them. And by social networking with other beautiful women who are capable of seducing competent men, they can accumulate enough power to even take down the government. The quote by Rush Limbaugh, that feminism was established so as to allow unattractive women access to the mainstream of society, is actually wrong, as attractive women who manage to gain power will support unattractive women. It's simply in their nature. As long as enough women rally together to get their voices heard, they will get the support of women who control competent men. So you see, female privilege has always existed. Most women just have terrible fathers who didn't teach them how to use it correctly. The reason why even established power cannot compete with attractive women is because in society, beautiful women tend to get with competent, attractive men naturally. Because unattractive men make guard unattractive looking women from these men. Unattractive males don't want competition and know that attractive men can do better whereas the unattractive men cannot gain access to top tier women. This causes the unity to be common, so it really takes no effort for women to gain power, they just need the motivation to do so. You can understand this by looking at reddit posts made by femcells. By constantly telling women that they are being oppressed by men, they are being misdirected from the fact that they are far more powerful than men. The only countries where women are weaker than men in terms of power are countries where they actively suppress female sexuality. Countries that force women to wear curtains, towels, and have breast and genital mutilation. For men to gain the same amount of power as women, they need to be born with multiple different talents, being brought up in the right environment, going through tremendous amounts of hardship, and would need to spend decades gaining the respect of men so that they will lower their ego before allowing themselves to be led by said man. 
Women, on the other hand, can lower a man's ego simply through seduction. Anyone who has paid attention to egotistical men will notice that once they get a girlfriend, they become more cooperative and less competitive. They can even get men to cooperate together as a team within their female network. Feminism is simply covert warfare against women. With rhetoric like telling women they don't need men, or telling men to stop seeing women as objects, this is just established power being scared. When women start acting toxic towards men in male-dominated spaces, these men will start going hard on women and put a lot of stress on them, forcing them to compete with men. However, this is simply impossible to do due to men's higher testosterone levels. A male's endurance is far greater. This will only cause women to become weak and sterile. It is well established that the brain uses more energy than any other human organ, accounting for up to 20% of the body's total energy usage. You know, there's a lot of misconception out there where people think that just because you work using your brain, that it does not do as much damage to the human body as hard labor. But if you work out at the gym for an hour and compare that to studying hard for an hour while eating refined carbohydrates doing both, you'll notice that you burn more energy studying hard for an hour. So women will end up trying to do the impossible and that's to beat men. They will simply waste away and become more sterile, while the future generations will become more disease prone. I know this because I used to breed feeder rats for my snakes, and at one point I had a lot of racing pigeon feed left over after selling my racing pigeons. I thought that it was a good idea to feed my leftover bird feed to my African soft fur rats and normal rats, since the rats were always trying to get on my bird feed outdoors by chewing through the concrete of my bird loft. In just three generations, the rats started dying off to random diseases. They had tumors and huge balls of pus all over their bodies. They also became sterile. I tried to save what I had left, since there were a lot of baby rats left over, by feeding them diverse food of the highest quality, but it did not work. The only way to save the rat population I had was to introduce healthy females into the population, since the female was the most important to reproduction. Humans are the same way. With women's long gestation period, they need a healthy body to support a child. And when that body is worn out, the child will be born with a lack of vitality. And if that child is a female, then it's very unlucky because unlike a man who only needs to produce sperm, a woman has to house a growing child for 9 months. So if people go through multiple generations of only having female children while eating a terrible diet due to the influence of multinational corporations and the drug culture making your body frail, this would obviously mean that the future of Europeans is coming to an end, since this has already been happening for quite some time. With all these compounding factors, anyone who promotes feminism is a threat to women, children, and humanity. Even the alternative news media who are against feminism only legitimize it by going against it. They never go hard on it to the point of shutting it down, they just milk it for views. I did a social experiment where I asked women who think certain topics need to be censored due to misogyny, whether they think that women can take on men in either overt or covert warfare. Every time I asked, they would end up speechless. We are clearly not equal, but we are human, and therefore we should have dialogue so that we can compromise and make up for each other's weaknesses. The thing is, sure, a lot of women don't believe men would wage overt warfare against them. However, white collar criminals want women to be defenseless so that they can use covert warfare to turn women into cash cows. What will women do without the protection of men? Or when they are no longer capable of rallying together online and getting their voices heard? White collar criminals already use women for money in ways that kill them. The prostitutes that they sex traffic are addicted to drugs so that they can take every dime that they make. Sex trafficking, like many crimes that are eye-catching, is impossible without white collar criminals. And with globalism, local women can easily be replaced by foreign women. So if they are going to censor videos to stop sex trafficking, they might want to take a look at themselves first. Anyways, the government might look powerful, but they won't fuck with men. The people across the world are too smart now. Most of the men in the military hate their own government. Just check Facebook and you can see a lot of men in the military who bash their own government. But women are a different story and will become defenseless the more they mess with men. DEATH PENALTY! Hold on, your honor! I'm innocent! I didn't kill anyone! Not guilty! Wait, your honor! I have solid proof right here! DEATH PENALTY! OBJECTION! Your honor! That's not real proof! Ah, uh, then not guilty! OBJECTION! Ah, uh, DEATH PENALTY! Your honor, give him the death penalty too! Then death penalty to the both of you! Man, fuck this! I'll show you death penalty! What is to be remembered by other people, by history? The Patriots are trying to protect their power, their own interests, by controlling the digital flow of information. I want my memory, my existence to remain. Unlike an intron of history, I will be remembered as an Exxon. That will be my legacy, my mark in history. But the Patriots will deny us even that. I will triumph over the Patriots and liberate us all. And we will become the Sons of Liberty! You know what? I want to declare a challenge. I challenge you, Joseph. 
Not for honor, not for glory, but because the YouTube algorithm is so fucked I can't get subscribers otherwise. Now, I know what you're thinking. Joe Rogan is the world champion of Taekwondo and a Flatlander Jiu-Jitsu black belt. And aside from that, I plan on going up against him using Wing Chun, both because I want to show respect for my elders and because I don't want to look like a sexual predator going all out in there. So then, how would I possibly win this? Well, I do have a plan. I'm going to use psychological warfare. The first thing I'm going to do is pay his dad to cheer for me during the fight, and also his other dad from the first movie. If I hung out with Joe Rogan and Joe Rogan's dad sold coke. I knew Joe Rogan's dad sold coke. Joe did Silly Joe. Of course he does. He's Italian. The next thing I've got to do, if I were to fight Joe Rogan, is turn his own people against him. I will call him out for being a huge supporter of homosexuals and blacks, and tell him that if he's really about that, he should convince the Italians of Italy to take in millions of homosexual and black refugees and get the government to put them in positions of power. And then, after he has done so, I will explain to Joe how genetics work by teaching him the history of the racing pigeon, how these pigeons were bred so carefully over decades, centuries even, to maximize desirable traits and weed out the undesirable. And also, in the past, the racing pigeon was mixed up with other breeds to shore up genetic weaknesses, such as the Smurly, which doesn't have as great endurance as some of the other constituent breeds like the Cumulate, but does bring an edge in speed. This mixing of about five breeds, the Smurly, the cumulates, the dragoons, the horsemen, and the homers took about 150 years. Now bear in mind that a pigeon can reproduce at about 8 months of age, so it took that many generations to stabilize the genetics of the modern racing pigeon, which has the highest recorded self-powered horizontal flying speed at 177 kilometers per hour, and the endurance to fly 1100 kilometers in a single day. The only thing that can outspeed these pigeons is certain dive bombing birds, such as penguin falcons. But even then, if one of these falcons was to try and hunt a racing pigeon, they can see and dodge their attacks fairly reliably. Racing pigeons have also been shown to have photographic memory and strong homing instincts that have been improved upon throughout the course of their history. A fine-tuned machine, and let me tell you, it's not easy to develop the exact set of traits that you want. Even when you're just dealing with a single breed, all members of this breed might have a given trait, but to varying degrees. I mean, it goes without saying that all racing pigeons can race, but some are better than others. There could be a mutation that puts a damper on or gives a boost to a certain trait, or there could be conflicting traits. For a better example of that, let's look at roller pigeons. The Birmingham Roller was developed in the mid-1800s, and it's not clearly known which exact breeds went into creating it, but it probably includes the Dutch Tumbler, the Old English Tumbler, the West of England Tumbler, and the Oriental Roller. In the 1970s, people started to develop dual-purpose rollers, bred for both performance, rolling in the skies, and as showbirds, you know, aesthetics. Now the thing about this rolling trait is that if it becomes too strong, they'll literally crash into the ground until death. The Parlor Tumbler, however, gets around that issue by not even flying for most of its life. Breeders have also developed diving pigeons, most notably the Dewlap variety, which is closely related to several Syrian breeds, and can nosedive at speeds in excess of 130 miles per hour. They also have the ability to pull their air brakes and stop suddenly just two meters away from the roof of their loft. Now, tipplers are bred for endurance. They're put into contests that aren't about distance, but simply about whose birds can stay in the air the longest. The current world record being 22 hours and 5 minutes. Tipplers were bred in England using high and long flying breeds from countries like India and Pakistan. But also, the English roller, the European mainland tumbler, the cumulate, and possibly homing pigeons. And this whole process started about 200 years ago. Now, you may be wondering why there's rollers mixed into this breed. Well, as it happens, certain traits contributing to long-term flying have largely cancelled out tumbling in this breed. This took a long time, and there were certainly many failures that wasted too much energy tumbling in the sky. Now, high-flying skycutter pigeons, also known as Orlix, were developed in Ukraine. These birds, considered a type of tippler, can go as high as 1,500 meters, and they were developed over centuries in the Crimean Peninsula. They are a combination of many breeds, like the Nikolajevsky Bokazi and the Nikolajevsky Tarzavi. Now, there's many, many traits to consider when breeding, like size, temperament, and wing shape. Different wing shapes lend to different attributes. For example, the wings of a short distance speed pigeon will have a dip in the middle. And then there's things like chest and waddle size, which will affect cardiovascular ability. Everything matters. Some are even of the opinion that a pigeon's eye sign has the correlation to its abilities. So anyways, it took 150 years for breeders to develop the modern racing pigeon. For humans, that many generations would take about 3,000 years. That's 3,000 years of selective breeding to stabilize and get some benefit out of the mixing of different breeds. So after Joe has convinced the Italians to take in millions of homosexual and black refugees and to put them into power. I will explain to him the history of the modern racing pigeon, and that if they were to crossbreed it with another breed today, it would destroy talent, which took generations of breeders, many decades to develop, and that if the same thing were to happen to a breed of humans, it would take way longer than that. So long, in fact, that other, more pure breeds would end up dominating and wiping your genes off the face of the earth. Your phenotype would never be seen again. I will then point out how Italians have the second largest brains in the world, second only to East Asians. This will instill a sense of loss in Joe's mind. It will turn him into a nihilistic cuck who will therefore lose the will to fight. A warrior prides himself on the ability to survive, to enjoy the struggles of life and to laugh at hardship. Telling a warrior that his genes won't make the cut is the ultimate insult. Without pride, 
there is no warrior, so I will win this fight before it even begins. Like with pigeons, the differences in traits between human breeds are also quite extreme. Let's look at sports for example. Endurance sports are dominated by whites and East Africans, with cycling being almost entirely white, while blacks, especially those with West African blood, dominate in power sports, such as the 100 meter sprint. East Asians, as long as they're incentivized enough, they'll dominate in anything requiring a great degree of skill. Another thing I noticed about whites is that they're not strong enough to do drugs casually and not get fucked up by them, while blacks seem much more functional, even as full-blown addicts. Now when it comes to intelligence, there's also a great degree of variance. Now I don't put all that much stock in IQ tests. A large portion of those things are just standardized testing, which will naturally favor people who are more used to standardized testing. It's basically one of those circle jerk education things. So instead, let's look at innovations. And based on that, East Asians take it. Now, as I mentioned before, humans aren't subject to selective breeding, and instead it's the selective pressures of our environments that shape us. And to stick with the last example, what this means is that if everyone was to have the same wealth, nutrition, and so on, we would see an even more extreme difference in intelligence. My grandfather always talked about the racism that he encountered when he came over from Italy to America, and they didn't think of Italians as yeah. white people. I hear you, Joe. That's not very nice. The Italians deserve their own identity, but they need to stop being black first and create one. So there's this anime called Terraformers, where these scientifically enhanced space people do battle with mutated cockroaches. Nigga, 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 and the number one strongest among these space warriors is the blonde-haired, blue-eyed Ubermensch named Joseph. He is the product of his clan's careful selective breeding program. And just like the president of the European Commission, Ursula von der Leyen, his family doesn't care about race, only about creating the strongest human, which coincidentally looks like Super Sage Northcutt. They even bred him to have a stupid look on his face to be more disarmed. <laughs> I've heard rumors that his family has, in a way, engineered itself to perfection, supposedly for centuries. Members have picked spouses not for their wealth, connections, race, or nationality. They've based their selection on three factors alone. Looks, talent, and resistance to disease. It's taken 600 years. Behold the pinnacle of humanity. A human being created in the perfect image of God. I would say she comes from a typical globalist family. These people are very well connected, they only marry within the established upper class, within the elite. They have actually a lot of very smart, very intelligent, very productive people in their ranks. And nationality, of course, doesn't play a role in their marriage policy. You can imagine these families like the houses of old, the Wittelsbacher, the Habsburger and the House of Hohenzollern, for example. Her family is Lutheran Protestant and you find, for example, successful and rich industrialists, high-ranking public officers, as well as clergy and nobility in her family. One arc of her family goes as far as Charleston, South Carolina, for example. Let's just say one of her ancestors owned a plantation there. <laughs> You've got no idea how ready I am to fight Joe Rogan. If I get the chance, I'll utilize all the strategies stated thus far in this video. The art of war has taught me that I must know myself and I must know my enemy, and thereby not fear the result of a hundred battles. And this advice happens to be easily utilized in MMA. Knowing every detail about Joe Rogan is important, including even the smallest, seemingly insignificant details. So a while back, Joe Rogan's podcast convinced me to commit to a keto diet, and this decision nearly ended up killing me. But it did also give me great insight into Joe's mind and behaviors, as well as the health status of his body. Back when I started the keto diet, there wasn't much information available on the topic. I basically had to rely on internet forms. So one hot summer day, I woke up having bad heart palpitations, and I ended up calling an ambulance because it felt like my heart was going to explode. And what's more, it turned out that a lot of people on these forums that I was frequenting were having similar experiences on the keto diet. But at the time, I actually just thought that I was doing the diet wrong somehow, so I kept at it, but also started doing some experiments. I would go on and off the diet and keep track of my weight. And surprise, surprise, every time I would go on the keto diet, I would lose 10 pounds of water weight within 7 days. This has something to do with water being bonded to glycogens, which is a stored form of carbohydrates. So this water gets released when you stop eating carbs, which explains the early significant weight loss that people experience on the keto diet. But that's not really important here. What is important is how it was killing me. You see, the chances of someone dying from the keto diet is really high if you live in a hot climate, or even a cold climate where people typically use an indoor heater, as both conditions cause dehydration. 
There's multiple reasons why that's a serious issue on keto, but let's just use diarrhea as an example. Out of all macronutrients, fat is the hardest to digest, and whatever isn't digested will just irritate your digestive system. This causes diarrhea, and if you are already dehydrated in the first place, you are going to end up dead. I got to a point where I was stuck on the ground, and with every attempt to move, it felt like my heart would explode. Another thing to consider is that the microbiome is a very delicate system. And if you just drown your digestive system in fat, you will impede the growth of beneficial gut bacteria as well as its diversity. And sure, there are bacteria that can use fats as an energy source, but bacteria grow much faster when there's carbohydrates available. This is the reason why people with a compromised digestive system feel good during their first week of keto. Their new diet causes a lower population of gut bacteria, and as a result, there's less bacteria competing for B vitamins. This good feeling doesn't last for long, however, because fungi will end up inoculating your gut, as fungi can efficiently use fat as an energy source. So what happens when there isn't enough gut bacteria to slow down the transit of food in your guts? Is that your body doesn't have enough time to absorb nutrients, and you just shit yourself, in other words diarrhea, which will kill you, since you're already dehydrated due to keto. Recently, people have figured out that the keto diet causes liver disease. I had to find out the hard way. You see, I had all the symptoms of liver disease according to my doctor. The issue was that the clinic he sent me to wasn't very professional. Basically, I got an ultrasound done on my liver, but the machine was actually broken. Basically, the nurse lied to me and told me everything was okay, but when she was done, she went and asked one of the doctors what she should do about the machine. But the doctor just ignored her. In some alien world, she believed that a two-inch thick door is apparently soundproof. And of course, I didn't even bother to tell my doctor this, since it was so ridiculous he would never even believe it. And if I went again, he would just send me to get another blood test, which I had done blood work at least six times already that year. I was so dehydrated that the nurse was having trouble drawing out just half a vial of blood. I think I would have died if I had another blood test done. Even though social health care has its advantages, it also has its disadvantages. So I had to take matters into my own hands and revamp my diet towards healing my liver. A high fat diet places a lot of stress on the liver for numerous reasons because there's no free lunch when it comes to our biology. Eating excess amounts of fat causes the liver to produce excess bile, which stresses out the liver, and causes diarrhea because the excess bile irritates the digestive system, which will kill you since you're already dehydrated. The whole liver damage thing was a wonderful experience. You would vomit when you eat fat, so the whole keto thing is simply impossible. Refined carbohydrates would also cause me to vomit. And once my liver finally healed, I still had a compromised digestive system. I had the same symptoms as irritable bowel syndrome. And I mean, having already had liver disease from the keto diet, I knew this issue was coming from my liver. What I had to do was figure out which nutrient which is stored in the liver is important for a digestive function. Because it was pretty reasonable to suspect, after what I had been through, that my liver was pretty depleted. I narrowed it down to B vitamins. However, it was tricky because all B vitamins support the metabolism. What made it even more complicated is that B vitamin complexes did not work, and certain capsule types hindered the absorption of these vitamins. But I was lucky enough to come across a YouTube channel which explained that vitamin B1 assists in the production of stomach acid, which helped a lot with my IBS symptoms. But it didn't really solve the problem until I came across a Harvard research paper on how bacteria in our gut competes with the human body for B vitamins. So I know that because I'm not digesting food properly due to a lack of stomach acid, all that undigested food ends up causing an overpopulation of bacteria that were soaking up vitamins that were necessary for a digestive function. But just knowing this wasn't really that important because I didn't have a solution to the problem. So out of desperation, I decided to hang out at this popular new supplement store that was connected to a grocery. And every time I saw some roided up guy buying vitamin B1, I would offer to pay for his supplements so that I might befriend him. And then once I made a few friends like this, I paid close attention to what they eat and how they eat and why. Now, a lot of athletes end up with IBS symptoms due to excess consumption of refined carbohydrates. Now, eating refined carbohydrates before any athletic endeavor is obviously a game changer, as you process those carbs quickly and have a burst of energy. However, it does come at a cost at some point, which is why a lot of athletes have digestive disorders. So, these guys use the so-called carnivore diet to stay full while consuming copious amounts of vitamin B1. Joe Rogan has also tried the carnivore diet, but I doubt he really knew what he was doing. The carnivore diet is useful, unlike the keto diet, but it's not really a diet because it's not sustainable. You can also die from dehydration eating like this, but it works because it lowers the population of gut bacteria and fungi for long periods of time, giving you the opportunity to to absorb vitamin B1. Now, of course, I'm no longer friends with these guys anymore because once they caught me copying them, they started to get annoyed. In an athlete's mind, like most meatheads, they view things in terms of warfare. You become competition because they are so used to simulated warfare through sports. Most people think that vitamin B12 is the superstar among B vitamins, but in reality, a lot of people are only deficient because they have a 
digestive dysfunction due to lack of B1. Many people don't know this because they only follow the mainstream media and repeat whatever is mainstream. The meatheads actually know a lot, but refuse to share real information because every advantage they have is an advantage the competition doesn't have. If people actually knew this, B1 injections would be just as common as B12 injections, and therefore people can avoid dangerous diets like the carnivore diet. And this is what's fascinating about athletes. They are willing to go the extra mile and endure this kind of suffering. Instead of just giving the whole world a similar advantage by making B1 injections easy access, you will also notice that professional athletes who use steroids would also be the first to oppose the legalization in the sale of steroids for recreational purposes. So after restoring my digestive system, I had to spend months putting in this work restoring nutrients that I wasn't absorbing, such as iron. So Joe's influence did quite a number on me. But I forgive him because Jesus is my homie and I worship the big fat Jew in the sky. Joe Rogan has a skin condition known as vitiligo, where he's slowly losing his skin's melanin content. You see, Italians might have the second largest brain out of every other breed of human on earth, but they can never utilize it correctly because they have too much melanin. Because you see, there's no such thing as a biological free lunch. So when you produce more melanin, your body is using up more resources. And this is not Dragon Ball Z. I'm not going to give him multiple episodes to transform into his final form. If he manages to transform into the Ubermensch, if Joe becomes a 12th level intellect by losing all that melanin and freeing up those resources, he will team up with other Italians to conspire against me. Personally, I don't believe Italians should even be allowed to live near each other. Now before you start raging out at me, I want to say that you cannot be racist towards Italians because they have too much institutional power. The current Pope is Italian, tons of Italians are in the US government, even the president of Brazil is Italian, and he's ruling over a country where the majority isn't even Italian. If Joe thinks this is racist, he needs to give up on his white privilege. That means he should not be able to benefit from globalism and will have to live near pollution and trash. And everything he buys needs to be super expensive, and there should be a white privilege tax placed on him. To be quite honest, only people who have institutional power can be racist. Since they can hinder your survival, the definition of racism is just too vague. And Italians are so privileged, they created a weapon called the Spear of Destiny that is equal in power to Excalibur and stabbed Jesus in the side with it and got away with it. He stabbed the Son of God and got away with it. Devoted followers of Jesus can still hear Jesus screaming, My side! Ah, dirty! Walk! I wasn't even trying to be subversive! Timing is also important, because under every full moon, Italians can transform into this thing called the Guido. I have to avoid the full moon at all costs during this fight, and I will have to bathe in a bath that is infused with colloidal silver, holy water, and coconut oil to neutralize this black magic and Brazilian jiu-jitsu. If we pay close attention to Joe Rogan's past videos, he actually does not know how to train for a fight. Neither do most MMA fighters. This is why athletic people like Brock Lesnar dominate the fight scene in a short period of time. I've watched Joe's podcast for years, and he has something against lighter fighters. He believes that people of a lighter weight cannot generate much power, and that makes sense since he does not know how to train with steroids. He's admitted to injuring his knee, going all out on a kicking machine testing how much power he can generate. The thing is, Joe trains in volume rather than tendon strength. It is never a good idea to go all out in terms of power while training for muscle hypertrophy while on steroids. The muscle ends up growing a lot faster than the tendon since it gets more blood flow. Therefore, it will end up generating more power than the tendon can handle. The tendon is the limiter in how much power you can actually generate. If it's weak, the muscle overpowers the tendon and you end up with a tear. A lot of bodybuilders tear their pec tendons doing max lifts because of this. It's a novice move. It's just never worth it to do max lifts as a bodybuilder. That type of thing is only for power lifters. I remember a while back, Joe Rogan said that Gene LaBelle could kill Bruce Lee in a fight. Well, I have traveled to Hong Kong and mainland China before, and most people who own their own martial arts clubs believe that Bruce Lee is just average at fighting. However, there is no way Gene LaBelle would stand a chance against Bruce Lee. I I have been to so many different martial arts clubs across North America, many of them from different countries, and I know that most martial artists don't know how to train. Let me give you some examples. The majority of them force you to do static stretching as a warm-up, which is against modern sports science. This damages the integrity of your tendon before you train, so you are more injury prone. Another example is doing intense cardio before training, which burns up all your glycogen stores, therefore increasing the likelihood of tearing muscle tissue during training. Because of this, I was forced to pound down tons of refined carbohydrates to even keep up with the people in the class, which did a number on my digestive system. Most martial arts clubs don't even follow traditional training methods or modern sports science, leading them to a lot of permanent injuries over time, and therefore most martial artists actually have no power. There is a very high probability that the same can be said when it comes to Jean LaBelle. I have been in judo before, so I know how much 
much damage it does to your tendons over time. If you watch the MMA fighters, they use judo as their main discipline. Like Ronda Rousey, for example, they usually move like a zombie from all the damage they have accumulated over time. And again, I have to thank Joe Rogan for promoting Ronda as this invincible juggernaut. And also Bodog for glitching out and letting me bet twice, because I made a ton of money. I knew Ronda would lose miserably, since the tendon is the limiter in how much power you can generate. Combined with her terrible footwork, there was nothing she could have done to Holly Holm. This would mirror a fight between Bruce Lee and Gene LaBelle. Bruce Lee has incredible footwork due to the fact that he was a dancer and an advocate of boxing. He also trains in the traditional way, but let's give Gene LaBelle some credit. I mean, I've never been to Gene LaBelle's judo club, so I cannot say that he does not train in the traditional method. However, he's a stuntman. The whole purpose of being a stuntman is to be a meat shield for the privileged. His body is bound to be damaged. And how can somebody who moves like a zombie ever beat somebody who is agile in a fight to the death? In a fight to the death, every strike you land is to maim. Imagine someone just jamming their finger at your eye full force multiple times, then dancing around you and feeding you shin kicks in the nuts non-stop. Even if Gene the Bell ended up grabbing Bruce Lee and tried to throw him, he would cancel it out by grabbing his nuts. And the moment Gene throws Bruce, he would end up killing himself because he would have torn off his own nuts with the throw. Judo was never designed for unarmed combat. It's it's only effective if you have a weapon on you. I know this because I have been thrown wrong many times in judo, and it's a lot more dangerous being thrown wrong than right. Even if Gene wasn't the same height as Bruce Lee, say he's 6'5 and Bruce is the same height as originally, Bruce would still kill Gene the Bell. Joe Rogan has this weird obsession with height. He even believes that there needs to be height divisions in MMA. The thing is, punching downwards or throwing eye jabs downwards is very hard, but reaching and ripping the testicles is very easy for the shorter fighter because it's almost at head height. What people do not understand is that in a fight to the death, where there are no height or weight divisions. The best height for fighting is actually 5 foot 11 to 6 foot 1. When you move past 6 foot 1, you become less agile. And if you're below 5 foot 11, your lack of reach is a disadvantage. But even if you are one of these two heights, you still need a certain body type to take full advantage of it. Being 5 11, you need wide hips and a broad rib cage like Mike Tyson. And being 6 foot 1, you need to be slender. A great example here is to watch the fight between Lyoto Machida and John Jones. John Jones was getting dominated until Lyoto's chin failed him. But a fighter's durability is a whole nother can of worms. This was when John Jones Jones was in his prime. And although John Jones won, him and a lot of fighters who are too tall for the division end up getting busted for steroids. They tend to run away and wear down their opponents due to their advantage. And I'm not saying that other fighters are not taking something, but that small edge would disappear fast if they got rid of the gloves. Now if we look at heavyweights division, the two most prolific heavyweights of all time are Fedor and Daniel Cormier, who are both only 5'11". A lot of people put a lot of emphasis on height, but don't realize that the best fighting height is again 5'11 to 6'1. I was surrounded by bars growing up, so I know who were the most dominant fighters and all of them are around that range. But let's say Gene LaBelle was around these two height ranges. He would still lose. The whole point of having a 5'11 build is to use rhythm to blast your opponents with non-stop combinations. Whereas, if you're 6'1 and built slender, you're supposed to move in and out of striking range. Since Gene's body is broken, he couldn't even take advantage of his height. You know, Susan Wojcicki's mother, Esther Wojcicki, has claimed that she only supports the underdog. And because of this, I'll allow Joe Rogan to stay on TRT while I fight him natural because I'm not a sexual predator. I don't want to just fight some old dude who knows nothing about diet or training. Training. So I will put myself at an even greater disadvantage by fighting him and his Doberman at the same time. The Doberman was bred by Nazi scientists in Nazi Germany. It is banned in all 50 states of America and Israel, and Germany. Look at that dog's blonde hair and blue eyes. Hitler would be proud. The Italians and Germans are very close. The Italians even lent the Spear of Destiny to Hitler when he came all over Europe like some kind of rapist. This fight will be a reenactment of Gladiator. I'll be Russell Crowe, and Joe would be the guinea, who stabs me in the side with the Spear of Destiny. I would bleed out during the fight, and the judges would be paid to ignore it, but at least I get to die with honor, unlike some people. Honor is not in Joe's vocabulary. And I would fight, you know, Logan Paul, KSI, and Jake Paul to gain clout, but most YouTubers are not real men. A long time ago, lions used to roam across Europe, free and uncensored, but these once proud lions have all gone extinct. How can a man bring his woman to war and not defend her? Yeah. Come on, tell us all the things that you do to march your KJ. I would bend that Italian ass. <laughs> Chloe Bennett. What's up, babes? Why don't you introduce me to her? Let me show, show her a real man. A lion without his pride can no longer hold the title of King of Beasts. This is why, as a fellow European man, Joe Rogan must sacrifice himself for my benefit. Kind of like how aboriginals would send their old folks in the sea to save up resources. He needs to fight me so I can gain subscribers, because limp dick boomers like himself have hunted down all the lions and made them go extinct. Maybe in another dimension we could have been friends, listening to homoerotic country music under the night sky, and shooting deers with super soakers at the break of dawn. But sadly, this can't be the case.
Yo, my name is Giovanni Garibaldi. They used to call me Baldi, but these hair plugs are quality. I'm tight with Tammany Hall, and I represent Little Italy, where it's good to be small, because you'll have more when you have it all. Back home, the boys make a quick buck by relocating industrial muck with the truck. Just gotta ask the politicians whose land we can fuck. Not everybody roots for the hazmat suits, but not all heroes wear capes, okay? My people mark our territory by leaving trash on your front lawn. We love America. Living under Mussolini was anguish. Here, the Backstreet Boys are black and they speak our language. La marijuana. In America, the odds are stacked. Sometimes racehorses just piss on the track. Sometimes a lead pitcher has a dot on his back. Sometimes a duck goes quack. Other times, people fall into industrial smokestacks. I swear I'm as American as Big Apple Pie. There's enough here to feed five families, a flock of Jews, and even a couple black guys. Somebody touch my spaghetti! I'm a true renaissance man. I know a thing about clans. When me and the fams sit down with the other bands, I gotta play our rusty trombone to stand a chance. Us Italians may not always get along, but we're strong. As Mr. Stallone has clearly shown, if we touch a weight stack, we get jacked. Like a middle class home with a screen door in the back. You're playing home alone with Al Capone. X special force. The original government drone. Dog takes still on his baseball cap. He spins it around to get in the zone. Take it over the top with an extra Y chromosome. And it's not about how hard you can hit. It's about how hard you can get. Throw heavyweight punches in her catcher's mitt with just a dog bone and grit. My people are connected. My friends in the city give me permits non-stop. I park my yacht in the handicapped spot. And we get all the construction contracts. Sign on the dots. Either use us or your progress will slow to a blood clot. We child-proof schools by cutting every corner. The taps spew raw sewage, but it's cheaper to pay off the coroner. I didn't come to the United States to break my fucking back, Bill. When I give the evil eye to a man, no matter what's befallen him, even a lightning strike, heaven knows I called it in. And would you call it a sin when we launder our money through the flying spaghetti monster? It can't be any worse than treating Sunday school like last call at the bar, like Emperor Tiberius in a parked car. But I don't fuck with their thing. Ever hear of the castrati? They'll cut your balls off just to hear you sing. The church, with all their bling, have set Italians an example to chase. It's as simple as selling gaudy products, as an inquisition on good taste. Yo, Lish, nigga, I rock Gucci. I woke up in a new Bugatti. Gucci this, spend me that. Eat the papa. Ayy. Hey. Yo, I banged a broad named Melanie, and I dated 12 felonies, it just won't stick. The prosecution laid it on thick, but if I got off any lighter, they call it Bic. I got nothing to hide, I own five mom and pop pizza shops on the block. We sell crust non-stop, too lazy for props on top. Dick cheese for my enemies, Africanized killer bees for breaking knees. Everything but the kitchen sink. And fuck elephants, and Hannibal, I'm a spiritual cannibal. I'll suck your soul out with a needle like mosquitoes on the animal. I'll leave you dying in the streets like a roadkill animal. How warm is so polluted. I can't even have a fucking little baby with them. They say I walk on thin ice. I just drive a Zamboni. When the girls see this chain, they're gonna act like they know me. I keep a wharf rat on my chest, so I'll never be lonely. Spray tan guidos in the house, seven nights a week only. Then we get a power, then you get the woman. So I finally went to Starbucks. Like I said I would one day. There was a big TV screen. The special was Ariana Grande. Illuminati Lolita. Training girls to chase the blacks like the spots on a cheetah. But as Italians, we're already halfway to being black anyways. Do we really need coffee grounds in the bird feeder? Those poor Italians. Don't people know how reverse psychology works? Make fun of them for drinking coffee. They only end up drinking more. It's kind of like telling people that it's bad to fuck black guys. It just gets white girls more infatuated with the lore. That's fucking illegal. Beware the Italian plumber. He's on the job when you're away. He'll blow out your wife and leave her with leaky pipes, a golden spray for busting your back all day. You'll be wishing you were incel when insurance won't cover her incontinence. They don't believe that she fell. You goombas are so simple, you'll pop you like a pimple. Walking stones for the real walking penis symbol. King of the sewers, laying pipe out of control. This is my domain. That peachy Charlemagne can't give me any lip. She only gets the mushroom tip. He'll raise the flag, hop skip like a stag. This man should be spayed, but he's underground and can't be found when hubby blows like a powder keg. Enamored to the strange with dange. Bad neighborhoods are not a hassle. Your princess is in another castle. Bullet bills are just a hurdle. Made a fire breathing alligator snapping turtle. Wet the bed like a squirtle. Forgot his gender role like Birdo. Everything but the kitchen sink. Baby, this girl's a wop. Not a wet ass pussy. She's better than that. She only rides the fortified, reinforced, armor plated big black Cadillac. Cause daddy taught her better than that. You better put a ring on that big wop, otherwise daddy will turn your brain into spaghetti. She loves to be dominated by a yeti, ever wop kitty roaring like lions in the Serengeti. She only wants the dark prince Machiavelli. Her payment terminal only accepts American Centurion, something only a white collar criminal can afford. If that ain't you, you best hurry on. Bicycle, ride, bicycle. She's no vegan, but she will eat Caesar salad. And Mona Lisa 
is the only salad Caesar will toss. I mean, if you can get royalty to eat your ass, you must be really something special. A real bad bitch. Because Italian women is what all the bad boys want. Unholy matrimony is the only form of unity in Italy. She's expensive. Cost you an arm and a leg. Got you feeling quadriplegic. Most men gonna be allergic. Feels bad, man. Pontus Pilate. She's the reason why Jesus won't make a comeback. He's scared he's gonna get his ass cracked. Her spirit animal? Wild horse Ferrari. Once you come inside, you don't want to get off this ride. Till the wheels fall off like Bonnie and Clyde. She's the kiss of death. If she really likes you, she'll keep her herpes in check. Everything but the kitchen sink. To clean all this money, even Los Angeles gotta do their part. Sweet Bellas and little Leos can suck dick for a start. I'm not gonna suck your dick or I put that away. With all the money we stack, we still need more avenues to send it down and back. That's why you hear wet smacks in the back. Hey, high elves. Don't you know orc semen is an aphrodisiac? It will turn you into a sex maniac. Those high elves get stretched out where they're back to the rack when the orcs attack. We focus the lens like Galileo. She's wrapped in the Milky Way, studio lights for a halo. Too many asteroid impacts, she's gotta wear diapers like she's a day old. It was us who first told you blonde barbarians are dumb, and we proved it by making them roast in the sun. And give it up for the church, cause Jesus looks like Mel Gibson. Flip them over, I'm not done. ARE YOU NOT ENTERTAINED?! <laughs> Well, that's about all I got for you. Stay white.